This is Audible. Belinda presents this unabridged recording of The Immortality Curse, written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Surely God would not have created such a being as man, with an ability to grasp the infinite, to exist only for a day. No, no, man was made for immortality. Abraham Lincoln Chapter 1. Ragged Falls Park, Muskoka Region, Canada Look, Mommy. At the picnic table, the small boy held up one chubby arm, tiny finger extended towards the wall of pine trees. Lauren followed Jamie's gaze to where a solitary man staggered toward them. His suit looked woolen and heavy, and strangely old-fashioned for someone so young. He paused to sip from a small clay bottle, but found it empty, and dropped his arm that now seemed way too heavy. He waved to them, and began quickening his pace. Oh, shit. Lauren got to her feet. Jamie, come around here. She kept her eyes on the approaching figure. Phil? She half turned. Phil? Her husband was a federal officer and always knew what to do in these situations. Philip Jeffries was a large man with a broad face and an easy smile. He was throwing a sodden tennis ball to Rufus, their overweight Labrador. On hearing his wife's strained tone, Phil spun and stared. So too did Harry and Beth Freeman, their best friends, with whom they shared the picnic that day. The two families had been friends for years and had driven up together from their home in Vermont for a week's vacation. The park region was open, safe, and they nearly always had it to themselves. Harry and Beth reached Lauren first, and Beth lifted her phone to record the man's approach. He looked sick, or maybe drunk, Harry said, or just come from some sort of drunken fancy dress party. What is that, 1940s chic? Phil picked up Jamie, holding the kid on his hip. Either or. Best if we don't let him get too close. His hand went to the rear of his belt. Lauren knew he was feeling for his gun, but it was in the glove compartment. Her rule when they were out picnicking, and one she never regretted. Phil held up his hand flat at the man. Okay, buddy, slow it down right there. The man kept coming, but slowed to a stagger. He didn't seem overly powerful or menacing, but for some reason Lauren sensed danger and backed up a step. Phil, I think he's hurt, but... The man stopped and held up a hand. Please. His voice was little more than a dry croak. Beth continued to film him, squinting into the small screen. Hey, there's something on him. Lauren grimaced. Small lumps were beginning to form on the man's face and arms, but moving in waves as the skin rippled and shifted. It looked like there was liquid just beneath the dermal layer of flesh. He looked at each of them and then groaned. Please. I don't have much time. He looked quickly over his shoulder and then went to his knees. Tell her I found it. What? Lauren said. The wellspring. He roared in pain then and held his stomach for a moment before reaching out again. The skin on his hands rippled and slid. Lauren and Phil backed up, bumping into Beth 
who jiggled her camera phone. Jesus Christ, don't let him touch you. Beth's husband, Harry, tugged on her arm, but she shook him off. Leave it, Harry. This is important. Fox will want this for sure. She continued to film. Call a paramedic, Lauren whispered. Phil, get me some water. She went and knelt in front of the man. Who are you? Are you okay? He laughed softly. I was somebody once. He shook his head. Now I'm a dead man. Phil held out a water bottle to her. Lauren took it and offered it to him. How can we help you? He didn't take the water bottle, but instead reached out to grip her wrist. Hey! Phil lunged forward, but Lauren quickly held up her other hand to her husband. It's okay, it's okay. She turned back to the man. What is it? My beautiful Eleanor. Tell her... He reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a roll of ancient paper and held it out. Tell her I found it. Akebulan. I found it. His voice had become thin and reedy. Lauren pulled her hands away. Tell who? Eleanor who? Before her eyes, the man shriveled. His eyes sunk into their sockets, and the muscles in his arms and shoulders withered to sticks. It was like watching a speeded-up film of something blooming, now working in reverse. His head dropped, as if now too heavy to be held up by a scrawny neck. His sunken cheeks pulled his lips up at the corners. He tried to lift the parchment again, but couldn't this time. Lauren took the parchment and then went to reach out for him. Don't, Phil said, turning Jamie slightly away. The man seemed to be winding down like an old clock. My angel, my beautiful little angel, I used to call her that. His head came up. Eleanor Van Helling, tell her it's real. I found it. His head dropped again. And tell her I love her. Lauren unrolled the paper, running her eyes quickly down the page. It doesn't even look like writing. Just symbols. I can't read it. She frowned. But there is a map of sorts, I think. Beth held the phone over Lauren's head and tried to focus on the page. Stay still for a second. But Lauren's hand moved when she snapped it, and she only got the top half. Lauren glanced back at the old man. He remained kneeling before them, exhausted, and his oversized head lolling on his shoulder. What we need is emergency medical for this guy. He's not going to make it. Phil stared into the old man's face. Weird. He looks about a hundred now. He turned and moved to get out his phone, preparing to call an ambulance. Hey. Beth pointed to the forest line. Looks like he's got friends. Two men in black suits sprinted towards them. Both looked young, fit, and formidable. One held a carry-all bag. The old man slowly tilted his head to fix one eye on Lauren. Run! he croaked. About time! Phil waved to the pair as Rufus began a manic barking. One of the men pointed at the old man. Everyone stay back! They slowed as they approached, and the nearest immediately crouched beside the ancient figure. He smiled grimly. Hello, Clarence. Long time no see. The other remained standing and looked at each of them, his face devoid of expression, like he was examining bugs on a window pane. Who is he? Phil asked. He's no one. The first suited man stood. Did he say anything? His eyes bored into Phil's. Everyone is someone, 
and this guy has got something seriously wrong with him. Phil handed Jamie to Lauren, his jaw set in a challenge. The suit ignored him. Did anyone touch him, take anything from him? Lauren bobbed her head. Not really, but he asked about a woman. Eleanor Van Helling? And he gave me... Um... She suddenly didn't want to tell these people anything she didn't have to. She folded the scroll in under Jamie's rump. Did you say his name was Clarence? The men just stared. There was silence for several seconds that was only broken by Rufus perhaps sensing the rising tension and raising his level of barking to an aggressive warning level. Are you alone? The first suited man's eyes were unblinking. Yes, it's just... Lauren began. She lowered Jamie to the ground and pushed him behind her. No, we're with a larger group. They'll be back in a minute or two. Phil put his hands on his hips. I think it's time you guys showed me some ID. They're alone, the second man said. Phil's jaw jutted. Listen, mister, I'm a federal officer, and I am requesting you show identification right now. Beth lifted her phone. Smile, assholes. The man raised a hand to shield his face. Time to clean. In a smooth and practiced motion, small black guns appeared in each of the men's hands. The first bullet passed through Beth's phone and continued on through her orbital socket into her skull. Phil went for his gun that wasn't there again. The second two bullets were for Rufus, the dog's tiny yip of pain, the last noise it would make. Then the killing began in earnest. Bullets thwacked into Harry and Phil, and then Lauren felt the mule kick to her chest followed by a sensation like a hot vice tightening around her ribs. Her breathing sounded squashy, her lungs filling with her own blood. There was no pain, and she guessed the bullet had probably severed her spine. The suited pair didn't hesitate for a second when it came to Jamie's turn. The small boy stood confused and staring down at Phil as they casually shot him in the head. The small body crumpled as though just laying down for a nap. Lauren felt tears run from only one of her eyes, but couldn't move, speak, or even react. She could just watch as the last moments of her existence counted down. One of the men knelt to open his bag and pull free a long-bladed knife. He leaned forward to look into the old man's face. You see, Clarence? See all the trouble you've caused? He then set to sawing at the old man's scrawny neck. Even as the blood spurted, the skeletal old man didn't resist, and his face showed no expression. In seconds, the head came fully from the neck, only to be dropped back onto the corpse like a large discarded fruit. The first man paused, turning slowly. Clean everything. He looked at his partner. Everything. They stared at each other for a moment, before the second man grunted and nodded, and then he and his partner began to drag all the bodies into a pile around Clarence. He grabbed Lauren's arm, and the scroll rolled free. He picked it up to examine it. Father was right. His lips set in a line, and he shook his head. Those that take have everything taken from them, hmm, Clarence? He tucked the scroll into a breast pocket and continued dragging Lauren to the pile, while the other opened the carryall bag and removed two canisters of liquid. He began to empty one of them over the human pile. It stung one of Lauren's eyes, and immediately everything went blurry. The men scanned the area slowly, and then looked back to each other. They clasped hands. Farewell, Brother Koenig. Farewell, Brother Montague. 
From Lauren's one good eye, she saw both men step up onto the pile of bodies and sit down cross-legged. They carefully removed their coats and tore open their shirts. Underneath, their hugely muscled chests had the mark of two keys crossed over each other emblazoned there. But the images were not tattooed. Instead, the raised red and disfigured flesh told of some method that involved searing heat. The men then took turns pouring the liquid from the second canister over themselves and began to pray for a few seconds. Amen. They finished. They lifted their hands, palms toward each other, showing the flesh that was also raised red in the design of the crossed keys. The fumes were becoming unbearable, and Lauren strained to lift her head, just as she heard the strike of a matchstick. Her world turned a brilliant, agonizing red. Chapter 2 Mavericks, Pillar Point Harbor, Northern California Matt Kearns sat on his new surfboard, a six-foot, eight-inch Hayden shred sled, which Matt regarded as the best on the East Coast. He looked down at the powder-blue deck. It was a thing of beauty with soft, rounded rails, a deep, single concave through the front, blending into a double V out through the tail. It almost seemed a sin to ride it. At thirty-six, Matt was one of the oldest out the back of the island break that day. But with his long hair, youthful features, and smooth, tanned limbs, he could have passed for years younger. He was taking some vacation time from his duties as languages professor at Harvard. He needed it. He had been doing a lot of field work that lately had proven dangerous to the point of testing his sanity. He inhaled the warm salt air as he and his board lifted on the hump of a large swell. Though the break at Mavericks had a fearsome reputation for winter swells that could power up to eighty feet in monster sets, today it was relatively small, at around fifteen to eighteen, with the occasional twenty-footer rising out of the warm Pacific like a long blue hill. It was early, but already a dozen people fought it out at the break zone, with only three souls, including himself, waiting out the back for the next big one. Set! The yell snapped every head around. Those in at the break area began to paddle furiously to ensure they didn't get caught under the wall of water when it broke. Matt and the other two surfers out back started to stroke hard to get into position. In a set break, the waves usually came in three, with the final one, the third wave, being the biggest, baddest of them all. Matt led the charge, stroking hard. One of his fellow surfers turned to take the first wave. Rising up over the peak, Matt looked back and down the twenty-foot blue cliff. Wind whipped the spray into his face, and he smiled at the terrified looks of the surfers who paddled and kicked to either get up over the lip or try and burrow through it. Some gave up and tossed their boards aside and dived deep to hug the sea bottom. He turned away and dropped into the trough between the waves and saw the massive peak, and he looked down on a few scattering surfers, paddling like the devil himself was after them. Wind slammed into his face, and he began to gather speed, a hell of a lot of speed. When he was at forty-five degrees and beginning to fly, he pushed upright. Even though the wave was glass-smooth, the smaller board jumped and bucked against every tiny trough and ripple. He was flying across the face of the Blue Mountain, and as the wave deepened and kicked up as it hit shallower water, he found that the speed of the wave was beating his drop down its face. He'd be left at the peak when it started to fold and that meant a long fall to the bottom. He turned down its face, accelerating, his long hair whipping back behind him, arms outstretched and knees bent. A furious wind rushed into his face, 
and Matt gritted his teeth as the massive wave began to throw its lip over behind him. The sound was a near-deafening roar, like some sort of giant beast venting its anger at the puny human fleeing from its jaws. Matt reached the bottom of the wave and skidded out in front of it, way out front. Shit, he was too flat, and on level water the board immediately decelerated, a rookie mistake. As he slowed, the wave caught up with him and lifted him up its face. He was stuck as though in mud, and even though he changed angle to try and slide again, the wave had other ideas. He went up, stuck at the lip for several heart-stopping seconds before it then folded over him. He managed to draw in a single breath before he and the board parted company. He went over the falls, floating in what felt like zero gravity for a seeming eternity, before about a million gallons of high-force water came down on top of him. Matt went down, deep, the weight pummeling him and forcing him to the bottom. There was a sharp tug on his ankle, and his leg rope snapped. Matt rolled into a ball, covering his head, and conscious of the rocks he knew were underneath him, and was pummeled in nature's washing machine. The pressure came in on him from all sides, adding to his disorientation. Which way is up? his addled brain asked. One thought stayed with him. Get the hell out of here. He was in the churn zone, and that meant that the next wave might crash down on him just as he was bursting up for air. He needed to make it to clear water, now. Matt kept his eyes tightly closed as he felt the fine grit of swirling sand abrading his skin, and didn't need it filling his eyes. He unrolled and started to stroke under the water. Once, twice, his shoulder struck the bottom. He was heading the wrong way, and his breath was beginning to feel like a burning vacuum in his chest. He quickly unrolled, jammed his feet down on the hard surface, and speared away from it, praying he was heading up and not vertically away from an underwater outcrop. It was only a dozen feet to the surface and Matt breached like a whale, sucking in air and quickly spinning one way, then the other, to quickly get his bearings. Thankfully, he had been washed well in from the churn zone, and saw no new monster sets bearing down on him. That was the good news. The bad news was his board was nowhere to be seen. Matt inhaled in a deep breath and turned to start his swim. He'd stay in the white water if he could, as off the edge of the reef the water was dark and deep. He knew there'd been shark attacks at Mavericks. Another surfer was paddling out, pushing something in front of him as he came. Matt waved. Think of the memories, Matt repeated as he paddled. He was down here so he could avoid doing just that. The memories that Matt's mind kept packed away weren't the normal type of birthday parties, sunny days, or picnics in the park. Instead, they were the types that were too rank and horrible to keep front and center. Matt knew stuff that normal people didn't. He knew there were things that crawled from deep caverns below the earth, lurked in dark, impenetrable jungles, or hid in frozen continents at the bottom of the world waiting to consume flesh and sanity. Not anymore, he thought. From now on, he was going to stick to his lecturing work at Harvard, doing some research, tame consulting, and having the odd beer with his students. The money was okay, the work far less deadly. A half hour later, he waded up onto the shore and sat down on the sand facing the water. He watched the huge waves crash down out on the distant break. He could feel the warm sun on his shoulders and neck. He sighed, feeling good, but pissed off. He stood lifting the half-board and quickly looked up and down the shoreline. There was still no sign of the rear half of the eight-hundred-dollar board. Bummer. 
he could have at least salvaged the three detachable fins. He grabbed up his towel and rubbed it a few times over his hair and face, then slipped his feet into an old pair of deck shoes and picked up a plastic bag containing his keys and phone. There were still a few days of vacation left, and his head hadn't been caved in by the reef, so there was only one thing left for him to do, go shopping for a new board. Matt quickly checked his messages as he walked. There was only one, and it was from a number he didn't recognize. It was marked urgent. He opened it. It was regarding obtaining some consulting advice for a multiple homicide case. There was a name and a title. R. Bromelow, Special Investigator, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Hmm, the feds, huh? He pulled in a cheek. Why would they want to speak to him? He was a paleolingual condition. The rental was pricey, but it was a holiday treat, and this trip he planned to enjoy himself. As he pressed the button for the roof to lift and cover the cabin, he saw Brittany watching him from the main window. He smiled and waved. Paying for itself already, he thought. He left the remnants of the board in the trunk and used his towel to flick the sand from his ankles before heading into the large open foyer. Brittany gave him a blinding West Coast smile. She leaned elbows on the reception desktop, her crisp uniform straining. Hey, Matthew, you're back early. How was the surf? Broke my board on a twenty-five-footer, he smiled. But my spirit is still strong. She laughed. Well, people have died there, so I'm glad to see you're still in one piece. She turned and pulled a package from one of the pigeonholes behind her. Someone dropped something off for you at the desk. Didn't see who, but looks kind of important, I think. She handed him a large envelope, marked Urgent. Who even knows I'm here? He took it from her, turning it around to look at the logo in the right top corner. It was the circular shield crest of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Thanks. He turned away, frowning down at it. See you later, Matthew. Um, I'm here all day again. Huh? He turned and smiled back at her. Me too. All day and all night. I'll be the lonely guy eating by himself. Well, if you want to go somewhere else. She blushed as she cast a quick glance over her shoulder. I could take you somewhere. He leant forward. I'd love that. Great. Her eyes seemed to darken with promise. See you later, then. The look gave Matt a sudden tingling in his stomach, and he flashed her a smile before turning to jog up the steps. The lodge was only two floors, and his suite was at the front overlooking the water. He unlocked the door and pushed it open with an elbow still staring at the envelope, as if trying to draw meaning from the handwritten details on the front. Nice cursive writing, he thought. He tossed the envelope onto the bed and walked out onto the balcony to take in the ocean view. It was still early, only 10 a.m., and the water sparkled like diamonds on a soft blue blanket. Further out there was a little haze, which was probably water vapor, kicked up by the huge swells pounding down just around the headland. He closed his eyes and tilted his head. The sun on his face was a warm kiss, and his forehead felt tight from the dried salt. He was here for another few days, and tomorrow's weather promised to be just as good. Matt breathed in, inhaling the warmth. Life was good he thought. He stripped off and stepped into the shower. His stomach rumbled, and he picked up his pace, spinning the shower taps. Breakfast was served until eleven, 
and he planned on setting the record for bacon, eggs, and toast consumption. In no time, he was balancing trays of fruit, muesli, eggs, bacon, sausages, and two doorstop-thick slabs of toast, plus juice and coffee, as well as having the envelope and his MacBook tucked under his arm. The smell of the bacon was making his mouth water as he hummed and headed for an empty table in an alcove window. There were only a few people still having breakfast. An older couple, a family with two amazingly well-behaved children, and a young power couple in the far corner, incongruous in their formal attire at a beach community. The woman turned in his direction, and he smiled and nodded. But if she saw him, she gave no indication, as her implacable expression never changed. Sitting down, he unloaded all his plates and made room for the large envelope and laptop. He jammed a corner of toast in his mouth and tipped the envelope's contents onto the table. Out tumbled a police report, a stack of A4 photographs, and a tiny USB drive. He shoveled a spoon full of fruit and muesli into his mouth and chewed as he looked at the photographs. He stopped chewing. The pile of blackened bodies had obviously been out in the open for a while. Faces were charred, skeletal jaws open in silent screams, and some of the limbs lost from the elbows or knees. Jesus Christ! He stared, everything around him vanishing as his mind took him into the crime scene. He could smell the greasy, hot, decomposing flesh, hear the manic buzz of the blowflies, and feel their sticky feet as they tried to land on his face after dancing on the dead. He lifted a rasher of bacon to his mouth and bit off the end. Even though he had been ravenous, he couldn't swallow it. He lifted the next picture. It showed an obscured man dressed in black, shielding his face. He disregarded it and went on to the next shot. It was of the physical damage, some of the bullet wounds in the center of each forehead, even in the child-sized corpse. That single image made Matt feel more anger than revulsion. There was a bullet-riddled dog, and also a decapitation with a notification on the picture describing the dead person as extreme-aged. A grandparent, maybe, he thought. Thankfully, most were killed before the fire, but not all. One young woman had been burned alive. There was a summary report by a field agent R. Bromelow, with another few photographs clipped to it. He quickly read through it. The investigating officers thought that even though all personal valuables were gone, indicating robbery as a motive, the shot placement had been too clean and precise. It was more like an execution. A hit? Matt grimaced. Who hits an entire family, including a kid? He wondered. The next shots were marked, Forensically Retrieved from Damaged Cell Chip. The first showed a figure approaching the group, a youngish man. He looked to be around thirty, but somehow odd. Maybe it was his clothing. The old-style suit of heavy wool was square-cut, like out of an old movie. He plugged the drive into his MacBook and opened its directory. There were only a few files in there, one a video. He double-clicked, and it opened and started. There came a man's voice and a jerking camera. It was the same guy from the photographs. Matt leaned forward to listen. The man's voice was strong. He was well-spoken and articulate. He said a name several times. Eleanor Van Helling. He recognized it. She was the New York octogenarian and one of the richest women in North America. Tell her I found it, he said. The man's final words were, Tell her I love her. 
His grandmother? Matt stared now, transfixed. The film rolled on, and Matt felt the hairs on his neck rise. The man, the same guy in the old clothing, now seemed to shrink. His hair fell away, and his face creased and shriveled. In a few minutes, he was little more than a shrunken scarecrow. What the hell? He took another bite of toast. The man had held out a roll of paper or a scroll, and the next shot was of some of the writing on its yellowed surface. There was also a map, with the bottom half missing. Matt peered closely, taking a sip of coffee. His eyes widened as he recognized the writing. He spluttered, spitting and spilling the tepid liquid over his table. No way! Replacing his cup, Matt paused the film and enlarged the writing, and then laughed softly. You don't see that every day, he whispered. Matt noticed the female half of the power couple still staring at him, but now the hint of a small smile rested on her lips. What, I'm a spectator sport now? He sighed, dabbed his table with a napkin to mop up the spilled coffee, and turned back to the ancient script. The scientific part of his mind took over, cataloging, analyzing, and organizing the language. The writing on the scroll was Chaldaic, one of the most ancient languages on earth, supposedly the tongue of Noah and Adam and Eve. He knew Chaldaic was an early variant of the Phoenician alphabet, and only contained twenty-two letters. It was a language used by the first Hebrews, and was believed to have been spoken about four thousand to five thousand years ago, when they were little more than a wandering sect. There were only a handful of people who could recognize it, let alone understand it. Chaldaic was a very difficult language to translate, due to all the letters being consonants. It was almost like a code. He opened a fresh word document on his MacBook. Matt enlarged the image of the scroll and improved the resolution. He wished he had the real thing, as he would have loved to smell its surface. If it was as old as it looked, it should have been written on beaten or brushed animal hide, as paper wasn't even invented until 206 BCE in ancient China. Well then, let's just see what you have to say. The more he looked at the image, the more the scroll looked like a rolled-up page that had been ripped from a book, as one side was ragged. He typed each word or concept as he drew it forth, sometimes deleting one and substituting another that seemed a better fit. Those that drink from the ark's fountain, or maybe wellspring, will be absolved from death, for as long as... as long as they drink its life. There was a name at the bottom. Noach. It was the ancient biblical name for Noah. Matt allowed a grin to spread across his face. You gotta be shitting me. The Ark's wellspring, the fountain of youth, and all signed by Noah? He laughed and looked around, expecting to see one of his buddies hiding behind a palm, ready to spring out at him. All was quiet. He turned back to the image. Still, the thing about biblical stories was that they were all intertwined, like the branches of a great tree leading back to a single trunk. He pushed his laptop back a few inches and folded his arms as his mind worked. In his studies he'd come across quite a few stories of the Ark, its resting place, its strange cargo, and even the mysterious life-giving body of water that remained after the great flood seeped away. After all, the old boy was supposed to have been the very first to benefit from long life, and was said to have lived for nine hundred years. Noah even had a son when he was six hundred, so he must have been doing something right. 
Matt knew that time had a way of magnifying feats and events, but he also knew that there must have been something that generated the longevity tales. The branches always lead back to a single trunk, Matt thought. He looked again at the images of the guy that had started out looking young, but by the end of the video looked a hundred years older and haunted imaginations forever. He lifted his coffee cup and sipped as his mind began to sift through the decades of information stored in his mind. The search for the Ark had been going on for too many centuries to count. Nearly eight hundred years ago, Marco Polo wrote of a strange mountain where the Ark rested within. Curiously, the reference to within as opposed to upon had intrigued scholars for centuries. In the 5th century BCE, Herodotus mentioned a wellspring containing a special kind of water in the ancient land of the Macrobians, which gave them exceptional longevity. And even before that, in stories of Alexander the Great's life, it was said he and his servant crossed a land of darkness to find a restorative spring. The weird thing was, Alexander was purported to have found it, and after his death, his body was spirited away. Some say he only pretended to die, and in fact was taken to that secret place where he remains to this day. The early crusaders searched for both it and the Ark. The Jesuits were asked by the Pope to hunt for it in South America, and even Adolf Hitler dispatched numerous search parties into the deserts of the Middle East when he turned to mysticism at the end of World War II. Just like with the Ark of the Covenant, or splinters from the cross of Jesus Christ, or even beams of the Ark, sacred relics were all highly prized by true believers, collectors, or even those who would seek to destroy the faith. Some new speck of information, and the race was on all over again. But this was something new, an ancient language, contemporaneous with the actual time of Noah and his sons, and its reference to the obscure wellspring of Noah fascinated Matt. How's the bacon? An unfamiliar, confident, feminine voice broke his train of thought. Matt's head jerked up. It was the female half of the power couple. She pulled out a chair and sat down. The young man she was with also invited himself to the last spare chair. You mind? She smiled confidently. Sure, as you're already sitting. Matt eased back in his chair, wary. She stuck out her hand. Her eyes were sharp as she studied him. I'm Rachel. Matt. He took her hand. Rachel as in field agent Rachel Bromelow. The smile never wavered. One and the same. She nodded to her colleague. Agent Samuel Anderson. The man nodded. Though youthful, he looked as solid as a rock. Matt tapped the envelope. You sent me this, then? No, my superiors did. They thought you could shed some light. She craned her neck to look at his notes on the screen. And I see you're doing just that. Matt frowned. So, this isn't classified? Does the FBI usually send out this sort of information just to anyone? No. She remained relaxed. But you're not just anyone, are you, Professor Matthew Kearns? You've been vouched for as someone who knows how to keep a secret by people high up in the military. He groaned. Jack Hammerson, right? She shrugged and looked again at his notes. Her brows lifted. So, it is a language, then? Sure is. An ancient one. Matt put a hand on the photographs, fanning them slightly. I have a million questions. And we have a million more, so let's trade. 
She sat forward. You first. He shrugged. The scroll. Where did you, I mean he, get it? And where is it now? We don't know. She held his eyes. The images were taken at Ragged Falls Park in the Muskoka region of Canada. A couple of families were holidaying up there. They took these pictures on a personal cell phone. She tilted her head. Much of the footage was unrecoverable, and the physical document is now gone. We only have this image because we think that the killers thought the phone was either damaged beyond usefulness or couldn't find it. Obviously a mistake, Matt said. So who was this guy and who were the killers? He tapped the picture of the old man on his knees. She smiled and leaned her chin on one hand. My turn. She pointed at the picture of the scroll. How many people could read, write, or even understand that language, Chaldaic? So, you know what it is? Matt asked. Yes, but that's about it. Even our Hebrew scholars struggled with it. She angled her head. So, how many? In the USA and Canada, Matt thought about it. One, two, more in Israel. Looks more Sumerian, Samuel finally spoke. You know Sumerian? Matt's brows went up. The big man shook his head. I can recognize cuneiform, and have seen examples of Mesopotamian Sumerian. Better than most, Matt conceded, reevaluating the young man. And you're partially right. Chaldaic does use cuneiform. And the age is about the same. The Sumerians were using this type of writing style first developed in 3500 BCE, in the city of Uruk. He turned the screen a little more toward the pair. But this style might be even older than that. Biblical Hebrew is the archaic form of the Hebrew language, a Canaanite Semitic language spoken by the first Israelites. But this is what's termed Paleo-Hebrew, that even predates Biblical Hebrew. Matt looked down again at the old words. This language was probably first written down nearly 6,000 years ago. I can read it and I could probably write it, but I'd make mistakes, whereas this example on the scroll here is flawless. He pushed the hair back from his forehead. The strange thing is, the scroll looks like it was written quickly, confidently, and by someone who used this language a lot. He sat back. And there is no one I know of anywhere that does that, at least not for five thousand years, give or take a century. He grinned. And definitely not in Canada. Ah. She waggled a finger at him. But do you know how big Canada is, Professor? I'll tell you. Just under four million square miles. And only recently the Geological Survey of Canada estimated that Canada still contained nearly a million square miles of unexplored territory. She rested her hands on the table. You could hide a city up there if you wanted to. Matt snorted. Not with satellite scanning anymore. She leaned forward. Thousands of people go missing up there every year, Professor. I wouldn't put all my faith in something that obviously has a lot of blind spots. Matt lifted his coffee, sipping it, but not enjoying the now lukewarm liquid. What did it say, the translation? Rachel asked, still watching his face. It's a myth, a very old and persistent one. Matt looked back at the scroll. Go on, Rachel said. Read it to us. He sighed. It's one of the first references to the Fountain of Youth. Matt backed up to the image of the scroll. Some of the wording is a little difficult, and I'm going to make some guesstimates here and there, okay? 
Both agents sat waiting, so he began. Those that drink from the ark's wellspring will be absolved from death for as long as they drink its life. Matt waited, watching them. Both Rachel and Samuel didn't flinch, and that made Matt think that they knew more than they were letting on. He shrugged. It's like a hundred other myths and legends. This one just happens to refer to the wellspring of Noah, better known as the Fountain of Youth. He turned the picture around, pointing to some symbols on the scroll. It even has a real whisper of authenticity to it, by the inclusion of the old boy's signature, Noah, the ancient biblical name for Noah. Never heard that legend before, Samuel said, deadpan. What's Noah doing in the Fountain of Youth business? Matt laughed. It's not a well-known association, but one of the stories goes that the receding waters from the Great Flood were trapped in a pool. You drank from it, you lived forever. Bottom line, you find the ark, you find the wellspring, and vice versa. Once again, both agents didn't bat an eyelid. Matt scoffed. Come on, guys, it's just a myth. Rachel studied him. Eleanor Van Helling. Do you know who she is, Professor? Sure, she's some rich woman up in New York that's got to be about a hundred now, right? Rachel smiled. That about covers it. A rich, old, well-connected woman, whose husband, Clarence Van Helling, went looking for the Fountain of Youth around seventy years ago. He never came home. She opened a flat case she had by her side and withdrew her own folder. In it were several photographs, some black and white. She laid them down in front of Matt. They showed a young man in old-fashioned clothing, looking dashing and confident. That's him right there, Clarence Van Helling, taken in his New York apartment in 1940. She turned to the next picture. It showed the same young man, in color and taken more recently. She tapped the picture. That's him again, taken less than a week ago. His wife has already identified him. Matt looked from one picture to the other. The guy was identical. Maybe. The next two pictures were fastened together with a paper clip. He looked at the top one. It showed a cadaverous old man who was little more than a skeleton with dried skin pulled over protruding bones. He wore the exact same clothing of the young guy, except now it sagged on his sunken frame. And we also think that's him. Same guy, Professor. Her eyes bored into him. Matt pulled the paperclip free of the last picture and slid it around to the top. It showed a pile of scorched human bones the head removed. Shit. That's him again, decapitated prior to death. She folded her hands. Matt sat staring down at the table, his mind working. Why? he asked softly. Why indeed? Rachel sat back. Why behead Clarence? Why did he seem to be a young man then aged rapidly. Why kill two entire families? Why destroy the scroll that Clarence was desperate to give them? The scroll that you now tell us refers to the fountain of youth. So many strange questions with so few answers. Hmm, Professor? Matt shook his head. No way. She went on. And why do I get the feeling that there's something that someone is determined to keep secret? Something so fantastic that anyone and anything that got in the way had to be totally obliterated. Rachel studied Matt's face as he looked again at the images of Clarence Van Helling. 
His long, swept-back hair certainly suited his beach-bum image. But she also saw intelligence behind his eyes, and she knew his reputation as one of the world's leading specialists in ancient languages was well-earned. In addition, the closed military file on the man included reference to missions where he'd helped a branch of the special forces that were redacted from the reports. But what was in there was an acknowledgement that the man had seen things that would drive most people insane and survived, if only a little damaged. Bottom line, if you wanted someone to do weird, he was your guy. She leaned her elbows on the table. Clarence Van Helling was thirty when he set off on his adventure, leaving his beautiful young wife, Eleanor, at home. She shrugged. It was what you did when you were a young, moneyed gadabout just before we entered the war. I guess you had to do something to keep yourself amused before they invented selfies, Facebook, and Twitter, right? Matt gave her a lopsided grin. We don't use social media in the FBI. Rachel tilted her chin. Risk of compromise. Matt looked mock serious. Well, there goes your friend request. His eyes moved between images of young Clarence and old Clarence. Tell her I found it, Van Helling said. But found what exactly? The Ark? Wellspring? Matt looked up at Rachel, who just shrugged. He stared back at Clarence again. I've read every biblical text there is, and there is nothing, nowhere, no time, that gives a hint to where the wellspring is. Even the location of the ark is heavily disputed. Rachel saw that Matt was becoming hooked. Apparently a mystery worth killing for, Professor. Matt, please. She nodded. Rachel. Sam, the big man said. Matt looked down at the image of the bones. Very interesting. His wife spent years looking for him, but his trail went cold, and now... Rachel motioned to the image. Here was poor Clarence right back on our doorstep. She looked deep into Matt's eyes. We need to know how all this happened, and, importantly, who killed our citizens, men, women, and children, in cold blood. Matt nodded slowly, but then frowned. If it's possible proof of eternal life, then what I don't understand is what triggered its finality. Why did he suddenly start aging again? I wondered that myself. Rachel shuffled through some of her own pictures, until she came across another of Clarence approaching at a distance. There was something in his hand. She pulled out a magnifying glass and handed it to Matt. We enlarged this and cleaned it up. Looks like it could be a bottle of sorts. Too small for water. He might have been drinking something. Those that drink from the Ark's wellspring will be absolved from death for as long as they drink its life. Matt turned about, and then leaned his head back and laughed. The elixir of life, he clapped. I don't believe it. Who's putting you up to this? Is it that big oaf Sam Reed? Rachel folded her arms and waited for him to finish. Matt chortled for a moment more, until her implacable expression obviously told him there was no joke. He sighed and then peered at his coffee cup. And just for the record, I don't do foreign expeditions anymore. Samuel shrugged. That's fine. And that's not why we're here. Clarence's wife, Mrs. Van Helling, is an important woman, and has lost a man she loved deeply. And for what it's worth, she has been searching for her husband for nearly three quarters of a century. 
She needs closure. Closure? From me? He snorted. Hey, time heals all wounds, and not sure what I can do after seventy-something years. Probably nothing, Rachel said. But apparently she has more information and artifacts, and it has been suggested that an expert such as you might shed some light on their relevance. She knows of you, and in fact asked for you by name. Seems she won't show this collection or reveal her information to anyone else. Matt pulled in a cheek. In New York, huh? Samuel opened his arms wide. I hope that's not too foreign for you. Rachel smiled. And she'll pay all expenses and a generous consulting fee for your time. There is no downside here, Matt. And I suspect on top of all that, it'd be very interesting for someone like yourself. She leaned forward, seeing in his face she had him. And you are, aren't you, Matthew? Interested, I mean. Well, maybe a little. But I'll need to talk to my faculty at Harvard, yes, we know. But for your edification, Mrs. Van Helling donated ten million dollars to your university last year. I think the faculty might just find it in their hearts to cut you some slack if you said you were going to consult with her. In an ocean of myth there is always a drop of truth. Matt looked from Rachel to Samuel before exhaling slowly. Down the rabbit hole I go again. Good man, Samuel said. I'm sure Mrs. Van Helling will be pleased. Matt folded his arms. What additional material does she have? Rachel smiled. Well, I guess we'll all find out soon enough. We? Matt cocked an eyebrow. Sure. How could I resist not finding out as well? Rachel stood. So I wrangled an invite on your coattails. Chapter 3 Vatican City, Apostolic Palace, Borgia Tower Sub-Basement They failed. Lucius's words were barely above a murmur but in the heavy stone room they were clear. He rested his hands on the altar and stared up at the ancient wooden wood that was made up of a pair of crossed keys. Impossible. Drusus got to his feet from his prayers. Brothers Koenig and Montague would not have ascended in the fire unless they had completed their mission. We've never failed in a thousand years. Nevertheless, they failed. Lucius crossed himself at the altar, and then turned to look at his second-in-command and the sole occupant of the prayer room. The FBI recovered a phone and footage of Clarence Van Helling. Drusus bared his teeth for a moment, taking it in. It matters not. No one will believe what they saw is real. And even if it does get out, we can discredit it. Lucius shook his head. It's already out. The FBI have now brought in a language expert. He stared down at the cobbled floor. Like a small stone dropped into a pond, the ripples begin to flow outward. It only requires one person to believe it, and then... He let the words trail away and lifted his eyes, holding Drusus's gaze. We can't let that happen. Drusus bowed his head. What do you instruct? Assemble the Borgia. We need to be discreet, but thorough this time. This entire mess must be cleaned up. Chapter 4 Matt was picked up at the airport in a long black Chevrolet Suburban and saw that Rachel and Samuel were already seated in the back. For a field agent, she was dressed elegantly, 
and much more expensively attired than Matt was in his chinos and T-shirt with cord sports jacket over the top. Samuel just wore the standard-issue dark blue suit, his arms and chest straining against the material. Guess which one of us is not from New York, Matt grinned. Well, you are meeting one of the wealthiest women in North America, but I'm sure she'll find you charming. She smiled. Shabby, but charming. Driving from the airport to the city, Matt and the two agents chatted easily, and he couldn't help liking their relaxed manner. He was impressed with Rachel's depth of knowledge about everything from antiquities to old episodes of Seinfeld. Even the block-like Samuel displayed a sense of humor and level of banter that had him in stitches. They entered Manhattan, and Matt never failed to be amazed at the height and size of the buildings. Constructing the pyramids, the Great Wall, Rome's Colosseum, and this great city, mankind seemed to want to touch the sky. Like the Tower of Babel, Matt thought, and that didn't end so well. The other thing that struck Matt was the divide between the urban and the wild, or at least semi-wild, if you saw Central Park as if it were a forest. Their car was now slugging it out on 59th and traveling beside the park. On one side there were skyscrapers, and on the other a scene of country idyll with old sandstone, huge boughs of emerald green, and rich thick grass. It made him want to wind down the window and inhale deeply, but he knew he'd probably just get a face full of exhaust. Here we are, Rachel said. They pulled in, then stopped, and Matt looked up at the huge edifice looming up beside them. Been to the Ritz before? Samuel asked, smiling. Pfft, are you kidding? Matt grinned. It's like my home away from home. The Ritz-Carlton reminded Matt of the wealth that was packed tightly into just a few city blocks. On the street, the powder-blue runway carpet and brass luggage trolleys stood idle, waiting. On each side of the double doors, two affable-looking gentlemen wore long black coats and half-top hats. Okay, Professor, this is our stop. Rachel pushed on the car door. What about Samuel? Matt thumbed at the big agent. Not this time. Agent Anderson and I are working closely together on this one, but today only you and I will be going up to see Mrs. Van Helling. Rachel paused in the car with hand on handle. We're lucky, as she rarely sees anyone these days. Her minder told us that too many people crowd her. Matt nodded. Not surprising at her age, I guess. One of the top hat men came forward to open the door, and Rachel climbed out. She nodded to him, smiled, and then turned to Matt as he followed her out. Well, Matthew, tip the man. She winked and headed up the few steps. Matt felt around in his pocket. Shit, how much do you tip? he wondered. He pulled out some notes, found a ten, and held it out. Thank you, sir. He touched his hat, and the money disappeared without even a glance. The concierge then held the door open for him, beaming. Probably should have given him a five, Matt thought. Inside, the air-conditioned air smelled of polished wood, fresh flowers, and expensive perfume. If opulence was the first impression they were shooting for, it worked on Matt. There were ornate columns, huge urns overflowing with tropical flower arrangements that could have hidden a tiger within their miniature jungles, and circles of leather armchairs like small atolls in an ocean of marble flooring. I could grow to like this, Matt said, inhaling the scents again. Rachel avoided the main check-in desk, instead heading straight for an impeccably dressed man, almost lost in among the highly polished wood paneling, and standing at a single wooden lectern. He looked up as they approached, 
his expression imperious. She smiled confidently. Mrs. Van Helling's floor, we're expected. The Kearns party. He nodded and lifted a phone to his ear. He whispered a few words and then replaced the phone. His demeanor little improved. Very good, Ms. Bromelow, Professor Kearns. He took them to what looked like a single large panel of walnut, set in a huge column of concrete, and inserted a key. It was a door that shushed open. Inside was a gleaming white and chrome elevator with only a few numbers, the penthouse collection. Matt and Rachel entered and stood at the rear, and Matt noticed there were no buttons to press, but keyholes next to each number. The concierge leaned in and inserted another key into the slot at the very top. It lit up, and he stood back outside the elevator, examining them as he waited for the doors to close. Matt could make out a small bulge at his breast pocket and bet he had a gun tucked in there. The door closed smoothly. Matt and Rachel both felt extra weight settle over them as the elevator accelerated. Thanks, Lurch. Matt turned and grinned. Rachel snorted. Expensive. Matt looked at the inside of the small elevator. I can't imagine what all this cost. I bet I could work my entire life and not afford this place. You could work a hundred lifetimes and not afford this place, she half smiled. And this is only her New York residence. Rich and single, sweet. Matt jiggled his eyebrows. Rich and very influential. Rachel looked at Matt from the corner of her eye. Best behavior, okay? Why? Matt asked. She asked for me, remember? Let's hope she's on her best behavior. The elevator slowed, and then the doors rolled open. Oh, boy. Matt had expected a palace complete with ornate gold furniture, crystal chandeliers, and artworks by the masters. But instead they were presented with a room that was gothic dark and smelled of dust. Ten bucks says it's haunted, he said softly, as he panned left. The furniture was large and heavy, the wood of either mahogany or perhaps even ebony. A few fringed lamps glowed orange, and though there were paintings on the walls, they were hard to make out as they were lost in shadow. Matt bet they held dour-looking ancestors, giving himself and Rachel disapproving glares. Professor Kearns. A woman materialized from the gloom and strode toward them. She looked to be in her fifties, taller than Matt and quite possibly broader. She had a head of tight iron-gray curls, a strong jaw, and pale eyes that didn't blink as she bore down on them. Matt also noticed a pair of powerful-looking hands clasped before her, each with club-like fingers. Yes, hello, I'm Matthew Kearns. I'm here, we're here, to meet with Mrs. Van Helling. I know. I'm Greta Summers, Mrs. Van Helling's personal nurse. She smiled tightly. Is anyone else here? I mean, working up here with Mrs. Van Helling? Rachel asked. No one else is allowed on this level. Greta's smile tightened further. I'm also the cook, cleaner, and primary companion. Sounds like a full-time job, Rachel responded, looking away. Yes, full-time job. Greta's piercing eyes bored into Rachel for a moment. So, you guys like it dark, huh? Is Mrs. Van Helling with us now? Matt looked around and caught Rachel's warning look. Behave her expression said. She likes her privacy, Greta said. She also likes some of her rooms more than others, and I've set her up in the viewing room with some refreshments. 
Her eyes drilled Rachel again, and Matt wondered why she seemed to already harbor some sort of animosity toward her. Mrs. Van Helling is not well and is restricted in her movements. Also, please talk softly in her presence. She curled one muscular finger and turned. This way, please. Greta went through an arched doorway, moved along a short passage, and came out onto an enormous living room, with one wall fully glassed. The window glazing was tinted, so even with the natural light pouring into the room, it was still a soft twilight inside. But it was the view that had Matt catching his breath. Manhattan's Central Park was like a forest laid out before them. After the visual impressions washed over him, Matt's other senses kicked in, and these brought less pleasant sensations. The smell of medicine, antiseptic, and cloying perfume. There was also the faint hiss of a respirator. He turned his head, seeing a magnificent oval table inlaid with ivory, ebony, and other precious woods in a scrolling pattern that looked to be three hundred years old if it was a day. It was set for guests with bone china plates laden with small cakes, geometrically perfect sandwich squares, plus two sterling silver urns, one tall, the other squat. Tea and coffee, Matt guessed. On one side of the table, almost camouflaged, there was a wheelchair parked. Its wheels were tucked below the table edge, and a female figure, small and brittle, was seated within. Rachel strode forward, but Greta headed her off, moving extremely quickly for such a solid woman. Ma'am, I'd like to present our guests, Professor Matthew Kearns of Harvard and Agent Rachel Bromelow of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Greta turned to Matt. Mrs. Eleanor Van Helling. The little figure sat facing him with her back to the windows, which made her features indistinct, but Matt could feel the tiny eyes on him. For several seconds there was nothing but silence, and she never moved a muscle. Matt went to nod, but instead couldn't help delivering a deferential half-bow. Mrs. Van Helling, it's a pleasure to meet you. He waited, and there was nothing. He began to wonder whether she was awake, and turned to Rachel, who stared at the old woman with her brows knitted together. You're younger than I expected. The voice was reed-thin and dry with age, but there was sharp authority in every note. Matt knew it was the voice of someone who got what they wanted and was comfortable with power and wealth. Thank you, he tried. It wasn't a compliment, she responded. Okay. Matt turned to Rachel. Your turn. Rachel nodded. Thank you for inviting us, Mrs. Van Helling. On behalf of I invited Professor Kearns, you invited yourself. The old woman still hadn't moved. Matt heard Rachel exhale. He smiled and bet that the old woman was having the time of her life. You can call me Matthew or Matt if you like. He half turned. And Rach, the old woman finally moved, waving a hand to cut him off. And you can refer to me as Mrs. Van Helling. Do you know why you were invited here, Professor? I think so. Matt approached, and Greta immediately stepped in front of him. But this time the old woman reached out a bony claw to grip the nurse's forearm and tug her out of the way. Sit down. I don't like looking up to people. Her eyes momentarily went to Rachel, before sliding back to Matt. You closest, Professor. Thank you. He sat just near her. He used to call me his angel. 
She studied it for a moment before handing it to Matt. Do you recognize this young man, Professor? Matt looked at the picture. It was an old-style shot that had been colorized, making the cheeks overly pink, on a young, fit-looking man with dark eyes and darker hair, swept back in a 1940s razor-shave-style haircut. Matt recognized him as the man that stumbled from the forest in Canada, to be beheaded by unknown assailants. I know you do. I can see it in your face, Professor. She snatched the frame back, placing it upright on the table facing her, staring at it sadly for another few seconds. She stroked its surface. Clarence. Clarence Van Helling. My beloved husband. Maybe I do, Matt said cautiously. That's why we're here, Rachel said. But the man who appeared in Canada looking like that, it's just not possible. I know that, Mrs. Van Helling snapped back. He disappeared before the Second World War, and today that would make him 115 years old. I've seen the images, and I know you have too. That was him. I know it was. She stared, her eyes penetrating, as if reading every tiny nuance in his expression. Her eyes moved back to Rachel. Clarence was a driven man, the sole heir to a fortune, and the greatest love of my life. But he had a mystical side— and sought out things that didn't make sense to us common folk. A myth or legend was an open invitation to him. She turned her gaze back on Matt. As it is with you, I understand, Professor. Rachel straightened in her chair. Mrs. Van Helling, we were led to believe you have some additional evidence or insights you wish to share with us. The old woman slowly lifted her gaze to Greta. The tall woman received it as a signal and took hold of the wheelchair and pulled her back from the table. This way. Matt and Rachel followed as Greta and Mrs. Van Helling led them back into the depths of the huge top-floor apartment and came to a door that looked like it more belonged in a castle, complete with iron rivets and metal-banded fortifications. Wow, where's the drawbridge? Matt asked. Mrs. Van Helling laughed dryly. A little something Clarence picked up from Castelnau de Gers in France. She leaned to the side in her chair so she could half turn to them. He was a collector of the strange and unique, Professor. A man after my own heart. I wish I could have met— Matt clamped his mouth shut. I wish you could have met him as well. You would have been kindred spirits. She winked or blinked, Matt couldn't quite tell which, and then smiled for the first time. Greta went around the chair and unlocked the solid barrier and then pushed it open. It gave a satisfying creak. She took up her position behind the chair and pushed it and the old woman inside. Matt squinted in the gloomy room. It wasn't completely dark, as there were numerous small spotlights hovering over different objects. Some were on pedestals, some in frames on the wall, or in glass cases. The room was large and long, but it was hard to tell its exact size, as its far corners were lost in the shadows. Matt inhaled the ancient scents. The building had only started its life in 1930, when it was the Saint Moritz, but the artifacts in the room combined to give it a flavor far older, and more akin to something that had absorbed centuries, not decades. He stopped before one of the plinths that held a single object under a dome of glass. He peered in, his eyebrows up. Oh, wow. Rachel stopped beside him, and he lifted a finger to point. This can't be real. 
he stared at the crude weapon. It was a spear tip made from forged iron, and probably owned by a simple Roman soldier of low rank. Its tip still looked sharp enough to easily pierce flesh. Impossible, he breathed. I assure you everything is real here, Professor, Mrs. Van Helling said softly. Greta had wheeled the chair around to face him. But the Spear of Destiny, really? Adolf Hitler was supposed to have been the last person to have had this in his possession. He did, for a while, Eleanor said. Rachel frowned. Looks Roman. That's because it is. Matt turned to her. Have you not heard of the spear owned by the Roman centurion called Longinus? Rachel looked blank. If that was just a Roman spear, it'd be interesting and worth a few hundred bucks. But this, he touched the glass, this is the Heilige Lanze, the Holy Lance. Longinus used it to pierce the side of Jesus Christ. It can have no value because it's a holy relic and beyond value, not to mention supposedly having mystical qualities. He straightened. Whoever possesses it can rule the world. And yet I'm not ruling the world, Eleanor smirked. But you've got to want to, Matt said, and Hitler nearly did. He stared at the iron weapon. The last I heard, it was preserved beneath the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Italy. How did you get it? Like I said, Professor, Clarence was a collector, persuasive and very rich, and he never gave up. If he wanted something or wanted to find something badly enough, he did. Some things he bought legitimately, some he acquired on the black market, and some he sought out himself from the four corners of the world. Matt leaned in a little closer and felt something. He raised a hand and pressed his fingertip against the glass. He frowned and turned. Yes, it's warm. Eleanor tilted her head. The steel is always ninety-eight degrees. Body temperature, Rachel said softly. Eleanor nodded and smiled. No one knows why. It's fascinating, isn't it, Matthew? Matt stepped back from the glass dome. Fascinating doesn't begin to describe it. He looked down and along the darkened room. It felt more like a museum than a residence and he could only guess that it must have occupied one half of the entire penthouse. I could spend a week in here. He grabbed Rachel's hand. Come on. He was walking quickly now, trying to catch up to the wheelchair, and he pointed at different relics as he recognized them. Ha! Ah, the shield of Achilles! He used it in his fight with Hector. Magnificent! Matt then pulled up so quickly he felt Rachel bump into him. He stared at the object under the thickened glass dome in the center of the room. It was the one item that was secured by a cage rising from the floor that covered the glass and plinth. Eleanor Van Helling had Greta push her chair back toward them. That's right, Professor. It is what you think it is. Matt couldn't help his mouth dropping open into a wide smile. It was said to be the first test that mankind ever failed. But the game was rigged, right, Matthew? The old woman smiled knowingly. The item inside was a huge jar, two feet across, and made from some sort of unidentifiable stone. The top was sealed with another piece of stone jammed down hard, and there was rope binding it, with red wax completing the job. It looked as old as mankind itself. What is it? Rachel asked. 
That old thing? Matt grinned. That's Pandora's box. I see. Rachel's brows drew together. But it's not even a box. It's exactly as the Greek poet Hesiod described it, Matt breathed, walking around the cage. Zeus gave it to mankind as a gift. But the gift was that he had sealed away all the ills of the world. He instructed no one to open it. Let me guess, Pandora? Rachel grinned. Yes, Pandora. It was an act of revenge on us. According to Hesiod, when Prometheus stole fire from heaven to give to mankind, Zeus wanted his revenge. He knew of Pandora's curiosity, and also knew she'd never be able to avoid opening the box. So he did set her up to fail, Rachel said. Yes, Matt dropped his arms. No one said the gods were above treachery. Wasn't there something left behind? Rachel asked. Hope, Matt said. He turned to her and grinned. So let's hope it has leaked out a little over the millennia. You certainly know your stuff, Rachel checked her watch. It's part of my job. Matt heard Greta turning the wheelchair away. Please follow. I tire easily and don't have a lot of time before I need to rest. Mrs. Van Helling held up a hand, stopping Greta. Perhaps you can come back by yourself at a later date, Matthew. Matt felt a shot of excitement run through him. Yes, please, and thank you, Mrs. Van Helling. He beamed. Eleanor, she said, looking up at him briefly. Matt saw a single picture on a pedestal. It showed a youthful Clarence with a tall and beautiful young woman who looked like an old-time movie star, perhaps a little Greta Garbo in the hair and cheekbones. He walked toward it. You? Yes. I was a child bride, and more years ago than I want to admit. She pointed, and Greta wheeled her closer. And my dashing Clarence. She sighed. The years are thieves, Matthew, remember that. And remember to live life and take everything that's available to you when you're young. She smiled up at him. And we're only young once, hmm? She held Matt's eyes for a moment. Then she turned to catch Greta's attention, and the woman moved them off toward a dark alcove. I'm not seeking a day laborer here, young man. All I need is someone to fill an advisory role, with maybe a tiny bit of field work. She smiled. I know it's something that would be of interest to you. Greta stopped her at a small dais that had a brushed metal control panel on its surface. She pressed a few of the buttons, and the far wall illuminated. Clarence's prized possession and the last he ever sent back to me. It's also the thing that consumed him with the fire of curiosity that he couldn't extinguish. Matt walked slowly forward. There was a scrap of parchment, the words immediately recognizable. Chaldaic. He began to translate. Those that drink from the Ark's wellspring will be absolved from death for as long as they drink its life. Like the scroll. He craned his head closer. But there's more this time. He read. Then the curse of age will not afflict them as long as they remain with him. Matt straightened. For as long as they remain with him. What does that mean? He turned to Eleanor just like the Canadian scroll. Or maybe one of the earliest copies. Eleanor was wheeled a little closer. The provenance of this shard has been carbon dated to 1200 BCE. 
My Clarence obtained it from a man who called himself Priam. He said he was the last Trojan, and he had been living in a secret place, a hidden garden. Her eyes narrowed. Priam, Professor. Priam of Troy. Matt stared for a moment. Priam, Matt repeated. He felt a little light-headed. King Priam, father of Hector and Paris. She nodded slowly. Clarence said that he met the man in Crete, and in my beloved's own words, he grew hideously old right before his eyes. She dabbed at one moist eye. This is what sent my dear husband off on his final adventure. Matt rubbed his chin and turned away for a moment to let his mind work. He said Priam grew hideously old before his eyes. He turned back. Remember the words of the scroll. The curse of age will not afflict them as long as they remain with him. And Priam obviously wasn't with him, whoever that was, any more. So he began to age. He hiked his shoulders. And with him? Where exactly? The Fountain of Youth? Eleanor's eyes glittered. Rachel folded her arms. So Clarence speaks to a real-life Trojan king, and then took off for somewhere in Canada, and then the Middle East in search of Noah's mythical healing waters, the so-called Fountain of Youth? I wouldn't expect you to believe or even understand it, with your closed policing mind, Agent Brumelow. Eleanor's eyes went back to Matt. But you do, don't you? Rachel's jaw jutted momentarily. I'm just posing the question. That's my job. And by the way, why Canada? Eleanor tilted her head. There are far more questions than that. But that is a good place to start, my dear. In a note, Clarence said he had come across a clandestine group, or maybe even a person, that seemed charged with the protection of the secret of the wellspring. He thought they could be dangerous. She lurched forward, her eyes blazing. It seems he was right. Eleanor laid her head back, and Greta reached forward to place one huge palm on her forehead. The nurse smoothed Eleanor's hair. We're nearly finished for the day. Just a little longer, thank you, Greta. The old woman straightened herself in the chair and seemed to draw on the last of her energy reserves. Clarence also thought that this group was operating right here in America. He knew they were watching him, but couldn't ever spot them. He even employed a private investigator to do some background checking. He produced quite a detailed report. I want that report, Rachel said. What happened to him, the P.I., do you remember? I do remember. He vanished, of course. Either paid off, went into hiding, or more likely murdered. It seems some secrets are determined to stay just that. I want that report, then, Rachel lowered her brow. I just said, both the report and the investigator vanished. It was like the earth opened and swallowed them up. Eleanor then waved Rachel away and faced Matt. And even after this, Clarence still went, Matt asked. Oh, yes. The sun shall show the way, he kept saying. Eleanor had a dreamy look in her eyes. When he brought the scroll home, it was something he believed was a vital clue. It ate at him. The sun? Matt frowned. The son of God? That fits the biblical profile. 
He paused, lost in thought for a moment. Eleanor closed her eyes. She seemed to be fading. After that, Clarence became concerned for my safety. He fortified our homes and employed more security. But he still went. The danger just made him more determined. It convinced him that there really was something worth finding. Her eyes snapped open, and she turned to Rachel. Obviously, there was. Rachel tightened her folded arms. Well, it seems someone is going to a lot of trouble and taking a lot of risks to keep this quiet. Murdering two entire families just because you wanted to remove all traces of Clarence is an extreme step. If we hadn't been able to recover the chip from the destroyed phone, there'd be nothing but a robbery murder to investigate. You need to find them, Eleanor said. Yes. Matt rubbed at his chin. I guess at least now you finally know what happened to Clarence. That must give you some sort of closure. Mrs. Van Helling's eyes grew granite hard. Not by a million miles, Professor Kearns. Clarence was the love of my life, and to find out he had been so close, and to have him trying to get home to me, and then have him die so horribly, rips open old wounds and hurts more than you can know. She leaned toward him, making a small fist. Find them. Matt sighed. I think this is where Rachel, uh, Agent Bromelow comes in. Not sure I can help with that. There is certainly a job for the authorities to bring these people to justice. She struggled in her chair, and Greta helped her sit upright. But, Matthew, if Clarence was here right now, he would look you in the eye. You, a fellow explorer and seeker of truth. And he would say, find out what happened, and find out why it happened. Matt exhaled. Eleanor, sometimes the truth is, well, not as truthful or illuminating as we'd like it to be. He turned. I'm not going back to the Middle East. I'm done there. I know you are. She turned and nodded to Greta. The large woman pulled a paper folder from a sleeve in the back of her chair and handed it to Rachel. There is something in Canada. I would think a good place to start might be with the people who tried to conceal the phenomena. They are obviously involved and connected. Her eyes were suddenly ablaze as she leaned toward Rachel. Find them! and perhaps find more clues to how and why my husband arrived back here. Matt rubbed his chin. Though the idea intrigued him, the thought of embarking on another wild adventure, where there were people willing to shoot children, was not that attractive at any price. He turned and gave the old woman his best apologetic look. You see, I'm pretty busy right now. But Rachel here could— Eleanor pounded weakly on her armrest. It's a tangled web of ancient clues and false leads. I don't need another by-the-book investigation, Matthew. I need your analytical mind, and someone who believes in things others would not. She rose unsteadily to her feet, and Greta rushed to her side. The old woman pushed at the bigger woman but still used her as a support. She took a few halting steps toward Matt. She was tiny, no bigger than a child, and looked like she was about to fall. Matt rushed to catch her, and Eleanor Van Helling held onto Matt's forearms, her bony fingers surprisingly strong. Please, help me, Matthew. Help me to find out what happened so I can rest. He tried to guide her back to the wheelchair, but she clung to him. Eleanor, I really don't think, if you're worried about the danger, it's too late. 
They will probably already think you're helping me. You know what that means? She tilted her head. Oh, good grief. Matt's brows drew together. Her fingers dug in like cat's claws. Matthew, I need your help, please. Let me finally put my Clarence to rest. Just go to Canada and have a look for me. She turned to Rachel. The FBI will be with you every step of the way. You'll be safe. She turned back. And well rewarded for little more than a few days' holiday. Rachel nodded. Matt felt himself weakening. Money was always welcome, as even though he was a tenured professor, he was still working his way back up the ranks. Added to that, his insatiable curiosity would mean that if he refused to help, he'd never be able to rest, knowing that one of history's most knotted mysteries had been his to untangle. He steered Mrs. Van Helling back to her chair, but she refused to sit or let go. Okay, okay. I guess I can go with the FBI for a few days. He eased the smiling woman back into her chair. Eleanor's eyes went from Matt to Rachel. The last time we heard from the investigator, he was at Fort Severn in Canada. Rachel stared back flatly. I know it. Fort Severn, located up at Hudson Bay in Ontario. Jesus, that's right up there, Matt grimaced. Yep, but at least it's summer now, so it's not snowbound. Nothing but forest for hundreds of miles, and as remote as you can get. Rachel bobbed her head. If you wanted to hide someone or something, that'd be a good place to start. She turned to the old woman. Mrs. Van Helling, is there anything else you think we need to know? She had seated herself again, but looked slumped and shrunken. If I think of something else, I'll relay it to your superiors, she sniffed. That will be fine, Mrs. Van Helling, Rachel said, and Matt could see her teeth grind behind her cheeks. Matt bent lower toward her. We'll report in when we get back. He reached out his hand and laid it over her bony fingers. Thank you for showing us around. It's been wonderful. She smiled up at him, her eyes twinkling. My pleasure, Matthew. It's nice to have a handsome young man in the house again. Perhaps I'll even purchase you a new surfboard, a performance bonus. Thank you. Matt wondered how the hell she knew. One more thing. Your advice on something. She hung onto his hand when he went to withdraw it. She turned to her nurse. Greta, the scabbard. The tall woman disappeared into the shadows and came back in moments with a long wooden case. It reminded Matt of a hunting rifle case complete with brass clips. Greta laid it across Mrs. Van Helling's lap. The old woman fumbled with the clips for a moment before flicking them up and opening the case. She lifted the contents and held them out, her eyes on Matt's. It was a leather sword scabbard with a few rounded gemstones sewn into it. She handed it to him. Can you tell me the value of this? Excalibur's scabbard, I believe. Oh, my God. Matt felt like getting down on bended knee to accept it. He held out both hands. Matt knew he shouldn't take it, but his hands were acting with a will of their own, grasping it and taking it from her. Where's the sword? Rachel asked. Doesn't need a sword doesn't need anything. He ran his eyes over the tooled leather, and his mind whirled as he remembered the legend. It was said to have been thrown into a lake by the enchantress Morgana, King Arthur's sister, 
but then supposedly recovered and spirited away. Lost forever, and now found. He turned to her, his mouth hanging in an open-mouthed grin. Where? A monastery in Britain, buried beneath an altar stone, and sealed in a metal box that bore the seal of Arthur Pendragon himself. Matt squeezed the leather, still feeling its suppleness. He rubbed one of the stones, a sea-green emerald the size of his thumbnail. There were also sprays of polished garnet and some oval rubies. Priceless. Yes, she snorted with contempt. The jewels have a contemporary value, but what else? You're right. The jewels are not the treasure. He kept his eyes on it. It is said to have powers all of its own. In Arthurian legend, wounds received by one wearing the scabbard did not bleed at all and were instantly healed. He looked up. It made the wearer invulnerable. Eleanor smiled and nodded. Very good, Matthew. You see, Clarence was obsessed with anything that could restore health and life. He cocked his head. Was that a test? I like to know who and what I'm investing in, she smiled. He went to hand it back, but she held up a hand flat. No, it's yours. A gift. Her eyes became furtive. Besides, when I die, it'll just go to a museum. Better it's owned by someone who can enjoy it. Matt ran a hand up the scabbard again. I can't accept it. He held it out to Eleanor slowly, but his fingertips refused to release it. Rachel tapped her foot. Are we about done here? Eleanor held up a single hand pushing it back toward him. Humor me, Matthew. If it is just a relic, then it'll be a fine addition to your collection. And if it is more, then I'll know that you have something besides your good looks and wits keeping you safe. Matt grinned and then nodded. Well, all right. Just for you. He turned to Rachel, holding the scabbard to his breast. Now we're ready. Greta handed him the scabbard's case, and this time he led off toward the elevator. Professor! Matt turned, smiling, expecting a good luck or farewell from the billionaire. Eleanor's eyes were gun-steady. The evil that is in the world almost always comes of ignorance, she waited. And good intentions may do as much harm as malevolence if they lack understanding, Matt responded. Albert Camus. She nodded and continued to watch him as the doors silently closed. What was that about? Rachel asked. Matt shrugged. Not sure. Camus was a French philosopher, and the quote is about the importance of knowledge in defeating the danger of ignorance. Sounds like she wants you to be on the front line in that battle, Rachel half smiled. Maybe. But that whole meeting was pretty intense. He turned to her. Rachel looked in his eyes. Sure was, but enough about fossilized billionaires. It certainly seems you made an impression getting gifts on your first date. Matt held up the scabbard. Oh, this old thing? He tilted his head. We're just friends, really. He grinned. Well, if she was a hundred years younger, I'd say she was flirting with you. Anyway, Romeo, what do you think about her story? Rachel watched him. It's weird, but I've always found that a myth that manages to bulldog its way into today's world usually proves to have a kernel of truth. 
and whether Noah's wellspring exists or not. What intrigues me is that someone was sure prepared to kill to cover up the evidence that it might. And then there's Clarence. Rachel turned back to the doors. Yes, intriguing. Matt looked at the scabbard again. It was supposed to keep the wearer safe, and whether it was true or not, Eleanor Van Helling had wanted him to have it. He undid his belt, unlooped one side, and then slid the scabbard onto the loops. He redid his belt up. There, how's it look? Rachel shook her head. Like a kid about to head off to a pirate party, but who lost his sword. Matt tried to see himself in the silver strips at the corners of the elevator. He turned one way, then the other. You know, Indiana Jones had a whip and a hat. This might be my thing. The lift glided to a halt, and the doors slid open. The tall urbane guard was there once again, and he nodded to each of them as they passed by. On the way to the door, Matt noticed people watching them, especially one tall, well-dressed man who made no effort to turn away when Matt saw him looking. Perhaps this was the extra security Eleanor talked about, he thought. It now seemed highly appropriate, given what the old woman kept up in her penthouse. At the door, Samuel waved from the back of the car and got out to hold its door open. He caught sight of Matt's scabbard. Where did you get that? Matt shrugged. People just give me stuff. Rachel was looking at her phone. It was a bribe. Sure was, and I took it. Matt patted the leather. And don't forget the new surfboard she might buy you. Rachel seemed to be scrolling through some data searches. It's nearly twelve hundred miles to Fort Severn. She bobbed her head from side to side. Flying time, not too bad. And this time of year, the airport's open, no problem. Fort Severn, Canada? Samuel's brows went up. All the way up on Hudson Bay? That Fort Severn? You got it, buddy. Rachel sighed. Samuel stood by the SUV door, his eyes still on the scabbard as Matt climbed in. Rachel's phone rang, and she briefly looked at the screen before turning away. Give me a minute. Samuel climbed in beside Matt and shut the door. The window was open, and a warm breeze blew in. Samuel leaned one large elbow out. So, what was she like, the Witch of the Mountain? Eleanor Van Helling. Matt turned to him. Old, but still as sharp as a tack. A little weird, but compared to her nurse, she was a lamb. Hey, did you know about all the antiquities she has up there? No, but I'm guessing a lot if she can afford to give something like that away. But then again, she's a huge donor to American education, art galleries, both major political parties, and a number of other charities. He looked out the window and up toward the Ritz penthouse. If we know what's up there, we might need to check whether it was all obtained legally. Hmm. So she's using her wealth to buy absolution? Matt said. Using it to buy invisibility, more like. Wealth buys power and influence, and also can cleanse the soul. Samuel raised an eyebrow. So, what now? Canada? I guess so. We head up to this Fort Severn and see if there really is someone or some cult hiding up there. A cult? Does Agent Bromelow think that was who was responsible for the murders? Sam's brows knitted. Matt thought about it. It's a possibility. He adjusted the scabbard at his waist and then undid his belt to slide it off. He angled himself to allow some light to play on its surface. Stones of green, red, fiery opaline, and deep burgundy decorated the leather. With a clean, it would be magnificent. 
But to someone who loved antiquity, its aged skin told a story of something that had traveled through the centuries, being handled by a hundred hands in its life, and at one time by King Arthur himself. You didn't think to get the sword, huh? Samuel gave him a half-smile. Nope. Matt turned to look through the rear window at Rachel, who was still talking on her phone. She had her back to them. Down the street from her and coming up fast was a tall figure, wearing a fedora hat pulled down, and who looked to be jogging, but instead of a tracksuit, he wore a black suit that clung to a powerful frame. Matt frowned. Something about the person seemed out of place. The man reached inside his jacket and pulled out something fist-sized. He worked at it and then increased his speed. Something's not right, Matt thought. Hey! The figure accelerated toward their SUV. His hand came up, and Matt caught a hint of something heavy-looking and painted a murky green. As the person came abreast of the window, he tossed the item inside, his palm briefly showing, and displaying some sort of tattoo or scar. The thing landed on the seat between Matt and Sam. Samuel looked down at the baseball-sized object, his eyes widening. Fucking grenade! There was yelling. Was it his voice or Sam's? Time slowed down, but Matt's mind seemed to work at normal speed. Sam's mouth worked, forming words, his eyes round, and from outside Matt thought he could see Rachel, head down and sprinting toward the car, but slowly, so slowly. Frozen with indecision, Matt and Samuel sat staring at the lethal object, probably for only a second, but that second made all the difference. Samuel acted first. Maybe it was his training that kicked in. He snatched up the fist-sized explosive and went to toss it back out of the window, but Rachel appeared there, her face contorted, her teeth bared. Samuel turned to look at Matt, and at that moment they both knew his decision. Down, he yelled, and wrapped both arms around the grenade, turning away and hunching over it. Matt just had time to throw himself back to the far side of the vehicle before the grenade detonated. The figure in the black suit accelerated away, but from across the street another man sprinted hard toward them. Car alarms screamed all around him, and close bystanders were sprawled on the ground either unconscious or groggy. The SUV itself was peeled open like a giant metallic flower, and he quickly crossed to the still-burning remains and threw himself inside. He frowned at the obliterated mess that was once the FBI agent, and pulled the professor roughly toward him, briefly checking his pulse. He smiled, relieved. He heard sirens approaching. He needed to hurry now. He ignored the flames and dipped a hand in his pocket and withdrew a small stoppered test tube that had a clear capsule inside. Within that, there looked to be something like a long, coiled, glassine hair. It wriggled inside. Matt groaned, and the man dragged his head closer. The young professor was a mess of burned flesh, broken bones, and gaping wounds. He'd probably be fully or partially deafened as well. The man gripped Matt's bottom jaw and pulled it down. He upended the tube, allowing the capsule to drop into his mouth, and then, using two fingers, he jammed it as far down his esophagus as he could reach to get past the tongue, where the swallow reflex would take over. The man held Matt's chin for a second or two longer. Welcome, Brother Matthew. He smiled and withdrew from the ruined SUV. In another second, he too had vanished around the corner. Matt felt he was rising from the bottom of a molasses thick ocean to hear a high pitched screaming in his ears. Then the pain came, and every atom of his body howled in furious agony. Suddenly there was something cutting off his airway, and he gagged momentarily. 
But as quickly as it came, it was gone, and in its place an explosion of color. Matt suddenly experienced the bright flash of a waking dream. There was a long pool of brilliant blue water. It was so inviting and cool, and promised to bathe his wounds to calm the hot, screaming pain that surrounded him. Then, rising from the water, was a woman so intoxicatingly beautiful she could have been a goddess. She smiled at him. Then came a deep, calming voice. Welcome, Brother Matthew. His pain started to recede. He opened his eyes. Rachel had a hazy memory of being at a cookout and smelled delicious meat roasting. She shook her head to clear it. One second she was talking on the phone, and the next she was slammed up against the front wall of the Ritz-Carlton and peppered with shrapnel injuries. She sat there a moment more as she pulled all her senses together. Someone came to crouch beside her, one of the Ritz concierges. His top hat had been knocked off, but she recognized his uniform. She grabbed his arm and pulled herself to her feet. She identified the smell then, charred flesh. Oh, God, no. The SUV was blown open and smoke still billowed from inside. There was nothing but a carbonized splatter where the driver had been. In the back it was worse because she could see the damage. There was a single leg, still in a polished black shoe in the footwell, and red, ragged sheets of something. There came another cough and groan, and then some of the smoking debris was pushed aside. I'm stuck. It was Matt's voice. She pushed in further, ripping away shattered plastics and other molded materials. There were jagged teeth of armor plating angled every which way, and she carefully avoided these still red-hot daggers. Careful, try not to move, she said, as a hand reached toward her. She grabbed onto it, careful not to tug too hard, as the arm could have been severely damaged and only shock was keeping the pain and trauma at bay. Easy. She backed up. Matt came with her. She tripped and fell back onto the pavement with Matt on top of her. He rolled off her and onto his back. Rachel knelt up beside him. His clothing was ripped, burned, and smoking, and one of his shoes was missing. His long hair was singed, but looked sticky and when she examined him she saw that there was a mixture of soot, blood, and gore coating his face. He coughed and a puff of smoke rose from his throat. Rachel pulled a goblet of flesh from his cheek and shuddered at the thought that it was most likely a shred of Samuel. There were shards of steel sticking from him, but thankfully there was no bleeding. She went to pull a particularly brutal-looking piece from his forehead, but Matt sucked in a deep breath, shivered, and when he exhaled, he coughed, hacking loudly. He spat blood. It was a grenade. He held his head. Did you see the big guy? He threw it in at us. He went to sit up. I think I recognized— He groaned and winced. Don't move. Rachel tried to push him down, but he swiped her away. She was surprised at how strong he was. We need to get after him. Matt got unsteadily to his feet, looking like a shipwreck survivor. His hair was sticking up and matted, and his clothes were little more than smoking rags. One of his arms was red, with raw, blistering skin. She held on to him. I said I'm fine. He pushed her away. Well, you don't look fine, mister. She pulled him closer, and the piece of metal fell from his forehead. She frowned. She'd thought it had been embedded in the flesh and skull, but it must have only been stuck on there. The wound seemed insignificant now. Samuel? 
Matt turned one way, then the other. He stuck out an arm, and Rachel grabbed it, supporting him. He's gone. She held on tight and led him to the wall of the Ritz. Matt wailed and tried to tug away. He put a hand over his eyes and sunk back to the ground, leaning back on the wall. He saved me. He took the blast. Matt looked at one of his hands, flexing the fingers. I'm alive because of him. He stood back up. But how? She looked him over. You were in an enclosed place with some sort of explosive fragmentation device. You should be dead. Matt looked about, confused. Huh? He looked down at his ragged clothing. You don't think... His hand went down for the scabbard. The sword scabbard, could it... The ancient scabbard was torn in half and burned. Even the stones were shattered or missing. He gripped it, and his eyes lifted to Rachel. I was wearing this. Impossible. And for something that's supposed to be invulnerable, that didn't fare so well. She led him back to the wall. Now goddamn sit down until the ambulance gets here. That man who threw the grenade. I think I've seen him before. Matt turned to the sound of police sirens getting louder and closer. He looked up at her. You're hurt. Rachel wiped blood from her eyes that was running down her forehead. It stung like a bitch, and yet Matt was the one in the car, and now he seemed less injured than she was. Don't worry about me. Tell me about the guy. She looked into his eyes. Was it the same people who had murdered the families? Matt seemed to think. Maybe. I don't know. I just can't remember now. I'm sure I've seen... Maybe in the foyer of the building or somewhere else. You think the killers are following us? Unlikely. But Rachel flipped her coat back, exposing her gun. It was in easy reach as she laid a hand on Matt's shoulder and scanned the crowd. Just stay down. She looked at the faces of the gathering throng. Sometimes terrorists came back to perform a double tap, a second hit to ensure their target was completely destroyed, or to clean up people who came to help, and that'd be her. Matt held up his hands looking at them and making fists. I feel fine. He ran one hand through his hair. More than fine. He flicked shards of metal from his hand that had come from his hair. Rachel gripped his arm. The skin was dry now and not raw and weeping. Fine, huh? She pulled her hands away. Yeah. Matt swallowed noisily and smacked his lips. Odd taste in my mouth, but I'm fine. Hours later, Matt sat in a hotel room. He'd been checked over by a doctor and pronounced fit, but still disorientated. Since then, he'd showered and had put on fresh clothes. The ringing in his ears had gone, but the shakes started the moment he sat down on the couch and he cradled his face in his hands for a moment. He hadn't really known Samuel all that well, but he seemed like a nice guy, and his last act was one of selfless heroism by wrapping himself around the explosive just so Matt could live. He sat back, wiping his eyes. Given the way the car was peeled open, he should also have been dog meat. His eyes went to the destroyed scabbard. It was now junk. Was it you? He asked the burned leather. If it was, thank you. His phone rang, making him jump. He didn't want to speak to anyone, and he pulled it from his pocket, intending to switch it off, but saw Rachel's number. He stared for another few seconds and then guessed as she'd just lost a colleague, 
Maybe she needed contact more than he did. He answered. Hi. Matt, how are you? Physically. Okay, I guess. Just feel like crap, you know, about Samuel. He slumped a little lower in the chair and closed his eyes. Matt? His eyes flicked open a crack. I'm still here. I'm coming over. No, don't. He groaned as the phone went dead. He contemplated calling her back, but there was already a knock on the door. Of course, she was just down the hall, he remembered. He got slowly to his feet, opened the door, and stood to the side. Rachel came straight into the center of the room and stood looking around. How are you holding up? Matt asked, gesturing for the couch as he took a seat. Rachel shook her head and crossed her arms across her body. I knew Samuel for a long time. She looked down, her face shadowed. He was a good agent, a good man. She was quiet a moment and then cleared her throat. We're still combing CCTV images in the area, but the guys came out of nowhere. She paced, watching him. Guys? Matt's eyebrows shot up. I only saw one. Her eyes narrowed. Two, the bomb thrower, and another one that jumped into the car afterwards, while it was still on fire. Must have been burned or scared off by the NYPD. Then they both vanished. So they had help, Matt said. That's what we're thinking. Great. The circus comes to town, and just for us. He closed his eyes again and leaned his head back. He groaned and rubbed his temples. My head's throbbing like I've got a bad vodka hangover. Yeah, a grenade attack will do that to you. Rachel sat down at the opposite end of the couch and hugged a cushion to her chest. Matt, we need to find out what's going on. If these guys came from Fort Severn, then we need to go there. It's time we got on the front foot. He looked across at her. Yeah, well, no offense, but you need more backup. I think you might be a little short on firepower. Rachel threw the cushion on the floor. It's a balance, Matt. If I drop into a Canadian town with fifty FBI agents, just how open do you think the locals will be with me? And with that kind of footprint, you can't exactly tread softly. Any bad guys will be long gone. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'm not a great shot and can't fight. So please, don't rely on me. He gave her his best apologetic smile. She chewed her lip. The district is patrolled by the Nishnobe Aski Police Service, a tribal-based service. They'll be our backup. And don't worry, I can hit a bird's eye at fifty feet. I'll only rely on you for your brain. Her blue eyes twinkled. And maybe some of your luck. She hunched forward, resting her head on the back of the couch. Matt copied her, their faces only a handspan apart. Yeah, right. Luck, he said. He let his eyes travel from her forehead to her lips. He saw that the attractive features were bleached and drawn. He sighed. Rachel, I'm not your guy for this. She shushed him and leaned across and gently touched the side of his face, stretching the skin near his eyes. Immediately, his headache felt better. Amazing. She was so close he could smell a soft, slightly floral scent floating from her skin. She continued to stare into his face. Her hand lingered, her touch warm. You should buy yourself a lottery ticket, Professor. Maybe. He drew in a breath and put his hand on the couch between them. Rachel, I'm not sure it's a good idea me getting involved in this thing. I think... She took her hand from his face and placed it on top of his. 
I think we owe it to Samuel, don't you? She said softly. She looked up into his eyes and held his gaze. Sultry. The word jumped into his head as he stared into eyes so deep he could have fallen into them. Matt felt his heart beat faster. He nodded. Yes, we do. Her phone pinged, breaking the spell. Rachel withdrew her hand and stood up. She strode across the room to examine her phone. Matt swallowed hard and shook his head. Get some rest, she said. She headed for the door, grabbed the handle, and turned. Pick you up early. Good, fine, see you then. Matt nodded at the closing door. He looked down at his hand. And now I've just been guilted into going along. He closed his eyes. His headache was coming back with a vengeance. Chapter 5 Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, House of Saud Prince Najif al-Ibn Saud pulled in another wheezing breath and exhaled, feeling like his throat had narrowed to that of a drinking straw. He had fallen from a horse twice, survived a dozen assassination attempts, walked away from a high-speed car crash, as well as living through two heart attacks, and yet it was the small pleasure of smoking cigarettes that was hurrying him toward death. Najif was seventy-two years old, and tenth in line for the Saudi throne, a prince and a direct descendant of Ibn Saud himself, the modern founder of Saudi Arabia. His family numbered over fifteen thousand members, but the enormous wealth was held by only a few thousand of them each of them a multimillionaire or billionaire. Najif personally had a portfolio of mansions in Paris, New York, London, and Berlin, and also a palace in Saudi Arabia, where he now sat alone in his hunting den. The huge open room was decorated with the skins of lions, tigers, and leopards, with dozens of mounted heads of various horned creatures on walls, and in one corner stood his prized possession, a magnificent black rhino trophy, taken decades ago in Mozambique. The southern wall of the den held a flat-screen television the size of a garage door. It was this that transfixed him. He played again the grainy footage of the man in Canada holding out the roll of paper, and then the image jumped forward, to where he had collapsed into decrepit skin and bone. He backed up the film to where the man sipped from the small vessel. He paused it, enlarged it, and then re-ran it over and over. Najif stroked a long, iron-gray beard until the coughing took him again, forcing him to hold a silk handkerchief to his lips. He knew his life's clock was counting down. And when modern medicine had given up on him, he had at first turned to alternate treatments of vapor inhalations and concoctions of salt bush, kale, and a dozen other revolting herbs and plant extracts. But other than assaulting his taste buds, they proved less than useless. It was then that he had turned to magic. His researchers had explored every myth and legend of the healing hands ancient maps, magical cloaks, and potions made from impossible ingredients. But nothing worked, and his research always led him back to the legend of the mysterious hidden wellspring that was a fountain of youth. He was positive there was something there to be found. And suddenly Mr. Clarence Van Helling had turned up. The man was missing for seventy-five years, and then reappeared looking the same as when he had embarked on his search. It was obvious. The man had taken something or been somewhere that had stopped him from aging. Prince Najif had enormous wealth, but little time or patience now. He also had a ruthless streak that meant he would trample over anyone or anything to get what he wanted. 
and right now he wanted to know where Mr. Clarence Van Helling had been. The game was in play. He was aware the Harvard professor had been engaged by the Van Helling widow. It was too late to recruit the man himself, but he could certainly keep tabs on his movements. Najif sucked in a huge and painful breath and levered his bulk forward. There was a panel of buttons set into an ornate table, and he jammed a stubby finger onto one of them. Almost immediately, Najif smiled at his younger cousin. Khaled ibn al-Sudari had a weakness for the ladies, but he was probably the most honorable young man he knew. Khaled was distant in his lineage to the Saudi throne, but he was invaluable as a family warrior. He had been trained since youth to be a defender of their faith and family. Khaled went to one knee beside the stricken prince, and Najif raised himself slightly. He pointed at the television screen. They go to Canada. I want to know everything that Professor Kearns does there. Use every informant and source we have. The FBI are involved, Khaled said. Then use them. We have influence there, too. Use whatever pressure you need to bring to bear. Tell the FBI we'll assist in tracking the killers. I don't care who we pay or what we pay. Just make sure we know everything that they do. Should I go there? Khaled asked. No, Najif said quickly. It is but one thread in the tapestry of knowledge that is being woven. He laid his hands on his stomach. What news from Turkey? The expeditions are moving forward, but slowly, Khaled said. We have lost two of them to the local militias. One is being held for ransom, the other has already been tortured and killed. We also lost our translator. Najif sighed, the breath sounding like a long, slow whistle. Down to three. He nodded. Still acceptable. And where are they now? Approaching the mountain range, but there is a lot of territory and a lot of possible places to search. Unfortunately, the satellite images are not conclusive. There is confusion now. Najif nodded. They need someone who is not distracted by indecision. You. Go to Turkey and consolidate the remaining teams. Only you are qualified with your skills of antiquities. They are close, but need some strong leadership now. Najif gripped Khaled's hand. You must not let anything distract you, and you must hurry. Khaled straightened. It shall be so. He bowed and then strode quickly from the room. Chapter 6 Mount Kardu, Southern Turkey Khaled ibn al-Sudairi stood looking up at the peak. It rose nearly 7,000 feet above a fertile plain that had once been farmland. Hostilities between warring tribes dating back centuries had always made the place one of danger. But now, with the rise of the well-financed terror groups, the danger had become intolerable. Their guides would only deliver them so far, and had long since departed. That suited Khaled just fine, as for every loyal guide there was another who would sell you to the militias for a song. Let's do this. He and his six-strong team had narrowed their search down to this last peak. It was two hundred miles south of Ararat, but local stories related how it was also rumored to have been the final resting place of something special. The Ark, he hoped. He sighed, knowing that most of the tall mountains in the area carried the same legends. After all, the biblical references to the Ark were to the mountains of Ararat, and in Genesis that was only a general region, not a specific mountain. But Khaled had a feeling about this peak. It was the only one rumored to have had an ancient Christian monastery somewhere on the mountain. 
one that was supposed to have been destroyed by lightning in the year 776 A.D., and any trace of its remains long since disappeared. Khaled looked up. Why would you build a monastery in a place so remote? Because maybe you had something sacred you wished to protect, he guessed. The climb to the snow line took all day, and as the sun fell, they arrived at an overhang of stone that was their shelter for the evening. They passed a long, cold, dark night, huddled beneath a makeshift tent of nylon sheets, secured against the rock face. On the western slope of the mountain the sun rose slowly, but it lit up the plains behind them to the horizon. Abed Hamil, Khaled's closest friend, lifted his field glasses to his eyes, and he slowly scanned them for movement as the rest of the group packed their belongings and prepared to depart. A few feet in at the back of their shelter, Hisham rubbed a stubbled face hard, and Saib yawned loudly. Mountain number five, this is getting boring. Boring? Then perhaps you'd like to lead us up, Khaled said over his shoulder as he hefted his pack onto his back. He went outside and walked a few hundred feet along under the snow line, looking upwards. In the better light he could see there were several routes they could take. He chose one that had the least snow and ice. His men were ex-Special Forces Commandos, Airborne Brigade, and had basic climbing experience, but trying to ascend over ice sheets was another skill entirely. It was almost noon when the last of them crested the final jagged piece of cold stone and stood on the peak, a misty, flattened, cone-like surface the size of twenty football fields. A low cloud had moved in dropping visibility down to a dozen feet and obscuring the view. Abed grinned, and Khaled slapped his friend on the shoulder as they walked around the peak. His exhalations escaped as small ghosts, rushing to mix with the other frozen vapors on the flat mountaintop. He looked slowly around. Does anyone see something that resembles an ark? Saib grinned or even a few pairs of animal skeletons, giraffes, elephants, maybe. Khaled pivoted. Where to start, he wondered. The peak was not insurmountable, and so it had been explored before, probably many times over the centuries. Satellites had mapped the area, and his only hope was to find something conclusive, something the others had missed. Spread out, he called. His team moved out over the peak. In some areas it was flat, and in others huge sails of stone thrust upwards like icebergs from a foggy ocean. In the more level places there were deep drifts of snow packing down on ice, so anything buried was probably deep. Each of his team had brought extendable hiking poles, and now had them telescoped to prod and poke at the ground. Rocks were examined in case there were fragments, even minute ones, embedded in their geology. Khaled trusted his team and did the same as them, following a sweep pattern of his quadrant, examining everything in as much detail as he could give it. They moved slowly and methodically, trying to stay focused as the hours passed. Abed joined Khaled. Nothing. He pointed his pole out over the flat, misty mountaintop. The story goes that around thirteen hundred years ago, there used to be a... They spent another hour searching the mountaintop, and then more time investigating the slopes on all sides, to ensure that there was nothing embedded in the rock further down. Khaled would have been happy with some deep gouges in the stone, or anything to indicate that a ship over five hundred feet in size had once rested there. He checked the time and then called his team in. There were just a few more mountain peaks to check, but as these were quite minor, barely rising five thousand feet and not even snow-capped, he doubted there would be anything there of interest. 
His team stood in a semicircle around him, and when he looked to each of them, they returned a shake of the head or shrug. Nothing. As I thought. He looked around at the mist-covered mountaintop. The cloud had dropped completely now, and it was more like a London fog. He could smell the moisture that remained locked up in the cold mist. It was prickly cold against his skin, and its only advantage was that it was like a blanket shielding them from prying eyes. He sighed. Well, coffee, and then we go. They could chance a small fire, and it would warm their bellies before the long trek down the slope, and then back to the base camp to plan their next mission. Rizwan and Zahil began to dig into the frozen earth to sink a small pit to place a kerosene burner inside. Saib and Yasha then gathered scraped snow into an old jug for melting. Abed and Khaled walked to one of the peak's edges. Below them the plains and even the sheer slope was lost in fog. It could have been a drop of five feet or a thousand. Abed leaned one elbow on a spire of rock. Do you think there was ever an ark here? He looked out over the billowing fog. Or ever an ark at all? I don't know. Maybe there was, but given it was supposed to have existed over 4,500 years ago, then who knows what is fact and fiction now? True. Abed opened his thick jacket and pulled out a Saudi flag and shook it out straight. The deep green background with sword and Arabic inscription hung limply in his hands. Well, no use being shy about our presence now. He looked up and grinned. And why not piss our Turkish brothers off even more, huh? Abed walked to the center of the flat peak, fixed the flag to his hiking pole, and used a rock to begin pounding it into the ground. The stake shuddered at first as it tried to penetrate the combination of rock and frozen soil, but then suddenly sunk about three inches, and then stuck. Abed wiggled it, finding it a bit loose, began to pound again. This time the pole never budged, so he raised the rock an extra foot, steadied the pole, and then brought it down hard. The pole dropped away, but then, with gunshot-like cracking, so did the ground around him. Abed vanished. Khaled and his team rushed to where their compatriot had been seconds before. They skidded to a stop, and saw where there had been snow and rock, there was now black hole. Khaled threw himself down and peered into the void. There was silence for several seconds before there came the faint sound of an impact that echoed back up at them. Abed! Khaled waited. Brother! He and his men moved even closer to the edge, when caution held him in his place. Get back! It may all collapse under us! The men froze, arms out like tightrope walkers. Their gaze went from the dark hole to each other and then back to Khaled. They slowly backed up. Only Khaled remained on his belly, peering down. He slowly reached back for his belt and pulled out a long flashlight, which he angled downwards. There was nothing illuminated, meaning the entire mountaintop might be hollow. Abed! He waited for several seconds. To his relief, a moan wafted back up toward him. He's alive! He yelled over his shoulder, and then began to use his light to track the sound to its source. In a few seconds, he could just make out the crumpled form of his friend, lying among piles of debris, some sixty feet down and to the side. Can you hear me? A single hand was raised. My leg! Abed groaned again. Khaled lifted the beam to the edge of the rock he lay on. His side was perched on the top of a cliff wall that gave him support. 
But closer to his team there was a two-foot skin of rock and ice, exactly like where Abed had punched through. Strangely, the stone skin over the void looked quite uniform, almost like bricks. Rizwan! Khaled rose up slightly. Get the spare rope. We'll need to climb down. He pointed. Over there. Tie us off. Rizwan rushed to a ragged spar of stone and looped his rope around it, tying it securely. He threw the coil of rope to Saib, who carefully walked it back to Khaled. Khaled looked to his men. Hisham, Zahil, Yasha, you three with me. Rizwan and Saib stay on guard, and be ready to haul us out on my word. As they prepared to drop, a breadloaf-sized piece of stone dislodged and fell into the darkness. Khaled lunged forward to watch it drop. It struck the bottom not six feet from his friend, and then bounced heavily away into the gloom. He looked up, jaw set in a hard line. By all the prophets, everyone be careful. Khaled was first over the lip, and he dropped down quickly to the floor of the cavern. He unhooked himself and stepped away from the drop zone as his next man came down fast. It was dry, and even the sound of the rope zizzing through gloved hands echoed in the vast chamber. He lifted his light, scanning the cavern floor. Abed! Here! The reply was faint. Khaled quickly located his man and stepped carefully toward him. While he edged over the tumbled stones, Another melon-sized boulder fell from above, to impact against the rocks like a small bomb going off. Sharmuta, he cursed, as he shielded his face from the shrapnel. Zahil then came down fast, slipping and landing hard. Ouch! He unhitched himself, shook his head, and then held the rope to steady it, as Yasha and then Hisham rappelled down. Khaled found his friend and crouched beside him. Abed's face was covered in blood from multiple abrasions, and there was a small dent in his forehead. He gripped Khaled's forearm and painfully pulled himself to a near-sitting position. He groaned in pain. My leg! Khaled shone his flashlight along the man's body. One of his feet was lying sideways at an odd angle the ankle obviously broken. He reached for it, but paused. Steal yourself, brother. This is going to hurt. Abed grinned. It already hurts. The man gritted his teeth and nodded. I'm ready. Khaled pressed on the limb, feeling the bones in the lower leg, foot, and then the ankle. It felt unnaturally loose, but thankfully the skin hadn't broken. Khaled moved back up to the man, checking his head and then shining the light into his eyes. You might also have a concussion, also a broken ankle, so no dancing for a while. He patted his friend on the shoulder. The ankle was bad, but the dent in his head was the bigger worry. More than likely there would be pressure building in his skull and pushing on his brain. He was liable to drop into a coma at any moment. Yasha and Hisham knelt beside their fallen team member as Zahil continued to wave his beam slowly around the huge cavern. What is this place? Khaled rested his elbows on his knees as Yasha helped Abed sip some water. Like a bad tooth, the mountain seems to have a cavity and our friend managed to fall into it. Look, Zahil pointed. Khaled followed his light beam, and then stood squinting. He turned back to Yasha. Stay with him. He stepped across the broken stones, and after another few moments, the rubble disappeared, and he found himself standing on smooth, fitted stonework. This is a path. 
he walked slowly around what he thought was a large, misshapen boulder, until he saw what it was from another angle, a massive, rough-hewn stone figure crouching on a table-sized stone plinth. He shone his light up into its face. The thing was ugly, deformed, and was more gargoyle than anything else. He leaned in closer. Hisham joined him. Friend of yours? Ah! Khaled jumped, but then chuckled softly. Not even on a good day. Hey, look! Zahil was smiling, holding his light momentarily on himself, before lifting it away to point off into the dark. His beam was just strong enough to light up a small building, all of fitted said. Maybe it didn't mean consumed as in destroyed, but instead meant consumed as in swallowed by lightning, that it somehow fell into this cavern. He turned. It was swallowed up by this cave. Khaled lifted his light to the ceiling over a hundred feet above them. And fell all this way and remained intact? I think not. It's no ark, but it's something very interesting. Khaled turned and whistled, waving to Yasha. We need to check this out. Get Hisham, and then help Yasha with Abed. Whoomp! Behind them came a ground-shaking thump that reverberated through to the soles of their boots. The men crouched as shrapnel spattered over them. Another gift from above, Khaled said, as dust and snow rained down through the gap. We must be quick and then get out. This entire place could collapse on us. Two of his men bracketed Abed, who hopped sluggishly between them, with his head partially lolling on Yasha's shoulder. I think his back is damaged as well, Yasha said, easing his grip lower. Maybe not broken, but he'll be spending some time in traction when we get back. I'm fine, just a little dizzy, Abed responded. Khaled turned toward a pair of huge doors. They'd probably been oak once, but their monstrously thick beams were now rotted through, leaving empty shells and rust marks where iron bands and rivets had once been. Perhaps the freezing air had preserved them for many centuries, but time had still eaten away at their heart. Khaled pushed at the doors, and one fell inward, thumping to the ground. Inside it was as dark as Hades. The men slowly moved their beams of light over the interior. For a place of worship it seemed strangely empty, not a bench, an altar stone at the front statue or crucifix anywhere. There was but a single object placed in the center of the room, a stone coffin, a sarcophagus. Its formidable sides seemed to grow from the floor of the building, like it was a single piece of stonework. It was as if the church and the casket were one. Was the monastery here first, or the coffin? Yasha asked quietly. Good question, Khaled breathed. Who was important enough to have an entire church built around them? And then be hidden in a mountain, Zahil asked. Khaled went to his friend, wiping the hair back from his forehead and peering into his face. Okay, brother? Abed nodded, and his lips rose a little at the corners. Tired. Just set me down for a while to catch my breath. Good man. Khaled helped him to sit with his back against a stone column. His face was ashen, and when Khaled took his hand away, he saw there was blood on his fingers. They'd need to hurry their explorations. Sahil moved his flashlight over the room. This doesn't look like a place of worship, more a crypt. And you're right, this church cannot have fallen in here. It was built down here. Khaled stared at the sarcophagus. Maybe it's all a lie. 
The rocks overhead seemed to have been cut and laid in place like a stone roof. Maybe the lightning story was used as a smoke screen, and the reality was the monastery was always hidden. I thought this was supposed to be the final resting place of the Ark, Zahil shrugged. Final resting place of something. Let's get some more light. The old wood will work to make some torches and chase those shadows from the corners. Hurry, Khaled ordered. The men did as he requested, using some of the wood from the smashed door and wrapping handkerchiefs or strips of fabric around their ends. They used Yasha's cigarette lighter to ignite them and stuck them in nooks and crannies. Only Yasha continued to hold his aloft. That's better. Khaled slowly turned to examine the walls. The light showed the carvings in great detail. Images of massive waves, islands, or perhaps they were the peaks of mountains rising from great oceans. Pairs of animals of all kinds, and a small group of people standing before a central figure, tall and bearded, with his arms wide. Yasha shook his head. Maybe we are closer to our goal than we think. Perhaps. Khaled walked to the huge stone coffin. It was roughly nine feet long, four wide, and about six high, and had a simple stone slab as a lid. He placed his hands on the edge and raised himself up. He still gripped his flashlight in one hand and held it aloft. There was carved writing but the language was strange for a Christian monastery, and in fact looked a little like Hebrew, but a sort he had never encountered before. He could only make out a few words here and there. Akebulan. He dropped back down and turned to his team. I've heard of that before. I think it's Arabic, Yasha insisted. No. More some sort of root language, he pointed. This word, it's a name, something like Elysia, Erewhon, Xanadu, Utopia. They're all names for one place, the Garden of Eden. But the oldest name in existence is this one, Akebulan, in the kingdom of Bornu. He shook his head. I can't read the rest. And from what I can, it barely makes sense. We need an expert. He turned back to the coffin. Well then, let's see who's home. He waved his team closer. Everyone on this side, hands on the lid. And on the count of three. Three, two, one, and heave. Khaled and his team were all large men and strong but the stone slab didn't budge. Stop. He walked around the sarcophagus, running a finger along where the lid joined the actual casket. It met so perfectly, it could have all been carved from a single piece of stone. He had a sinking feeling that perhaps that's what it was. What he had taken to be a stone cap wasn't a lid at all, but instead the whole thing was a single piece and the join was just a carved line. He pulled out his short blade and dug it in, working the blade in as far as he could. He held the knife in place and looked around the floor. Yasha there, pass me that stone. His man snatched up the fist-sized rock and handed it to him. Khaled lined up the pommel of his blade and then pounded against it. There was a sharp crack, like the breaking of an ice sheet, as the blade sunk in about an inch. Get back, Khaled said, as a white gas escaped from where the lid seal had split. The four men backed away with arms up over their faces. A low moan lifted from somewhere behind them. Khaled turned, looking toward the door. The sound hadn't come from their wounded man but instead had seemed to come from outside. It came again, deep, mournful, followed by the sound of cracking, like splitting rock. 
What is that? Yasha asked softly. They waited, but there was silence again. Khaled shook his head. Just the wind over the mountaintop. Forget it. History. Time's running out. Again on three. Khaled positioned his hands on the hilt of the knife. Three, two, one, heave! This time the stone slab slid a few inches. He sucked in a huge breath, tensing his muscles. Harder. Three, two, one, heave! The stone slid and kept sliding. It pivoted, and the top half was now over the side of the casket. Khaled wiped his brow and stepped back, and then quickly looked around, finding a tumbled column of stone, which he rolled to the side of the coffin base to use as a step. It was wide enough for he and Zahil to step up. The pair looked into its interior. At first Khaled could see nothing but an eerie mist that filled the sarcophagus to the brim. But he waved his hand, dissipating it to reveal a single large figure. The man had long white hair and a beard, and was dressed in ornate robes of someone held in high esteem. He was so perfectly preserved that the old man could have been sleeping. That light, shine it here. Khaled reached in and felt the cheek and then neck. The skin was cold and dry, and there was no pulse, thankfully, he thought. He continued to feel the cheek. Preserved, I think, but not really mummified. Creepy, if you ask me. He looks like he might wake up. Zahil leaned in a little more. There's an inscription here. He rubbed at some symbols running around the inside rim of the stone base. Can you read them? Khaled also traced the symbols. Only this one. Shimu. Yasha frowned up at them. Is that a word? What does it mean? Khaled began to laugh softly. Not just a word, but a name. Shmu is the very first name for Shem, the first son of Noah. Yasha grinned. The son of the Noah? He waited, perhaps expecting some sort of joke to be revealed. Khaled leaned in closer to the corpse. Why not? Only minutes ago we wondered who was important enough to have an entire church built around them. I think we now know. Beside him, Zahil shone his light further into the casket. Hey, he's got something in his hands. I'm coming up. There was a grunt, and then, with difficulty, Yasha heaved himself up beside Khaled and Zahil, while still holding the burning torch. What's he got, treasure? Zahil leaned in. Looks like a skull. Whose? Adam's, Khaled said. He shone his light on the object that Shem had resting in his hands. It was indeed an age-browned skull, but without the jawbone. The cranium gleamed as if polished. In the biblical stories, the family of Noah were given the bones of Adam to keep safe. When the ark finally found its resting place, Noah distributed the sacred bones of Adam to each of them. Shem got the skull. He looked along the tall man's remains. More pieces of the puzzle. But not exactly coming together, if you ask me, Zahil jibed. The skull, lucky guy. Yasha grinned. He must have really liked it to want to be buried with it. A holy relic, Khaled said softly. But it's not supposed to be here. One of Noah's final commands was for the remains of Adam to be buried in the middle of the earth where Christ was crucified. That was to be at Karkafta, or as we know it, Golgotha. Why would he disobey his own father? Yasha asked. 
Who knows, but many of the relics are supposed to have miraculous properties. Remember, Eve was said to have been created from his rib. So maybe the skull also had some sort of power. Well, if you can make a woman from one little rib, then I think I'll just rub the skull for luck. Yasha held the torch up and then reached in. His fingers had only rested on the top of the polished skull when there was a ripple of movement. Yeesh! He pulled back. Did you see? What is it? Zahil leaned forward on his elbows. Don't touch it! Khaled stared. It must have been a trick of the dancing light, he thought. But while he watched, the face of the corpse, now bathed in the flashlight beams and Yasha's burning torch, began to ripple, and the hair and beard waved like in a soft breeze. The eyes flicked open. By all that is holy, he is alive! Zahil jerked backwards, but the pupils were jet black in milky orbs. Then what looked like a long hair or thread eased from one of the nostrils. It quested about for a moment, before easing back in. What was that? Yasha held the burning torch closer, the heat and flames only a foot or so from the face. The effect was immediate. The dark pupils in the eyes dissipated and spread away from the center of the eye, like milk poured into a swirling coffee cup. The cheek twitched, the lips moved, trembling and jumping, and every hair on his head and face took on a life of its own. The corpse of Shem began to swell. First the cheeks ballooned, and then the chest, arms, and stomach. And finally the old man simply exploded into a mass of squirming, thread-like worms. Zahil was a brave man, but with a yell he jumped backwards from the stone he was standing on. Stay there! Khaled yelled to Yasha, whose flame wobbled in his hand as they watched the horrifying sight of the man bursting into separate pieces. The magnificent clothing sunk in on itself, as there was nothing to hold its shape, as everything else in the casket writhed and squirmed as it fled from the heat. It's not a man at all, Yasha stammered. Maybe it once was, Khaled grimaced. But now something has infiltrated the body. Like a wave in a bathtub, the mess in the casket surged up the side toward them. Khaled reached out to snatch the burning torch from Yasha. He jammed it into the writhing horror, and the old clothing caught immediately. The prophets preserve me! Khaled ground his teeth. The sound was of a million tiny screaming mouths, and it grated on every nerve in his body and tore at his sanity. The worms were now boiling like liquid, pitching and frothing as they tried to escape the flames. The smell of the burning worms was the worst thing Khaled had ever encountered in his life, as the grease from it coated the lining of his nose and mouth. He threw a hand up over his face and stepped back, forgetting he was standing on a rock and fell to the ground. His flashlight bounced from his hand, but the flames from the open casket revealed the terrifying sight of millions of thread-like worms piling up and then spilling over the rim of the stone coffin. The abominations were fast, much faster than he had expected. Once on the ground, many of the glassine threads headed for the darkness or any crack or crevice they could find. But many more simply spread out like an ever-growing pool of viscous liquid. He scrambled to his feet. Let's get out of here. Khaled backed up, wishing he had a flamethrower. He wondered what horrors from hell had possessed this church and corrupted the body of the son of Noah himself. Was he cursed? Was this why the architects of this place had hidden the body away all these millennia? Khaled! Zahil yelled his name, breaking his trance. He held up a hand and nodded to his men. We're leaving. Help me with our bed and... He turned, and his words froze in his mouth. His friend was covered in a moving wave of the worms. They swarmed over him, 
seeming to investigate every inch of his body, probing, seeking, and exploring. For his part, the man just lay as if asleep, and didn't seem to notice. Outside, a stone pounded to the ground, shaking the church. There came another, and then another, almost like a titan's footsteps. Khaled sprinted for one of the other torches they had positioned around the stone room, and went to approach Abed's covered body. But Yasha held his arm. He's lost. We must go now. Khaled felt a surge of anger well up into his chest. And if it was you, would you want me to leave you to these abominations? Yasha stared for a moment, and then dropped his hand from Khaled's arm. Sorry, brother. Khaled swung back to Abed, his arm with the torch outstretched toward the stricken man to ward off the horrifying things. But they were already gone. Abed coughed, raising one hand to his face. Khaled, Hisham, Yasha, and Zahil raced to him. Take it easy. Khaled helped him to sit while his fellow team members cast worried glances around at the floor and walls. Abed looked up at him and nodded. He inhaled deeply, and then, to their surprise, he grinned. How are you feeling? Khaled saw that where there had been blood on his face and also matting his hair, there was now none. Did the worms consume it? he wondered. Abed got to his feet and held his arms out, looking at each as if checking them. I feel fine. What? Zahil's face was contorted. How? Abed looked down at his feet and lifted one leg after the other. I feel fine. My leg is good. It must have just been sprained. Hisham edged away. This is wrong. That was no sprain. Khaled kept his flashlight on the man's face. I felt the broken bones myself. More stones fell, and this time a portion of the roof collapsed inward, as if struck by a meteorite. Zahil looked outside, moving now from foot to foot. It's collapsing. The huge blocks could be heard falling continuously now and beneath their feet, the vibrations made the stones jump. Khaled knew that with any stone roof architecture, there were keystones, locking stones, and once these were removed, then the entire arching skin over their heads would crumble in all at once. We go now! They sprinted down the stone steps, and Khaled paused in confusion. He was sure they had come this way. There was the road and the table-sized stone plinth, but now it was vacant. He spun one way, then the other. Where was the giant gargoyle? The rocks began to fall faster now, so there was no time for wondering about details. The men began to run as if the devil himself were after them. They headed for the column of light and the thread of rope hanging down from above. As they danced over the broken stones, they could just make out the heads of their two team members, waving them on from the rim. Zahil, you first, and then you help Rizwan and Saib pull us all up, fast. Khaled turned to Yasha. You and Abed next, then Hisham and myself. Yasha looked nervous, but he bit it down and waited. He helped Zahil tie himself off and then yelled up to his colleagues, who immediately started the jerking tug to lift the man off his feet, and then start to ascend. Khaled spun, looking for our bed. The man had stopped moving, and was standing among the debris, a beatific expression on his face. He held out a hand. We should stay. Khaled waved at him. Get over here and get ready to climb immediately. No. Abed shook his head. There's nothing to fear. I'm staying. We should all stay. He turned back to the monastery. 
They need us, you know. They've been so lonely, so hungry. He smiled sadly. They won't let you leave anyway. What? Khaled frowned back at his colleague. What are you talking about? He turned to Hisham. Bring him here. From out of the darkness of the cave, there came again the moan he had heard when inside the monastery. Its mournful echoes bounced around them until the sound of falling rocks drowned it out. What was that? Yasha hissed next to him. Hisham froze on his way to Abed, and Khaled turned slowly. They stood under the column of light from above that diffused outward to form a circle around them of about a few dozen feet. But beyond that, it was as dark as the vacuum of space itself. I don't know, Khaled said, turning slowly. Yasha moved a little closer to the light, and only Hisham and Abed stood a little further back. From the gloom there came the sound of movement, heavy but fast, as if something were circling them. Khaled pulled his weapon, a browning semi-automatic pistol, and then laid his flashlight across the wrist of his gun hand. Yasha and Hisham did the same. Only Abed stood still, his expression almost dreamlike. I told you. What is it? What's out there? Khaled screamed the words, but kept watch on the dark, trying to track the movement with his gun. Abed smiled. You'll soon see. The attack came fast. One second, Hisham was standing at the periphery of the column of light, and the next, something hit him, took him, and he vanished with only a single cry of surprise. Khaled went to charge after him, but Yasha yelled back, Stay here! You'll be lost in the dark! As if in response, the remains of their comrade came bouncing back into the light. The man had been torn in half and his facial features were still screwed up in a mix of agony and horror. Khaled looked back to the ceiling. Hurry up! Abed giggled and turned to head back to the small building. Get back here! Khaled yelled, trying to keep his own panic in check as the man ignored him. Khaled lifted his face to the hole in the ceiling again, just as more boulders dropped from the sky. They landed hard, some shattering into a thousand small, sharp projectiles, and others bouncing heavily like monstrous medicine balls capable of killing instantly. Zahil was just being pulled up to the rim, and Khaled cupped his hands around his mouth. Hurry! The man scrabbled now at the edge, nearly over. Khaled turned to Yasha. We need to get a bed. No. Yasha now had his flashlight pointed at the man disappearing in the darkness. There's something wrong with him. He's different. Khaled was torn, but glanced up to see Zahil finally disappear over the rim. Merciful God, he muttered. But then his breath caught, as almost directly above them, an entire section of the ceiling bent downward, hung momentarily, and then wrenched free. On the way down it separated into multiple deadly missiles, each weighing thousands of pounds. Get down! But he knew there was no shelter where they waited. It was like being carpet-bombed, as the stones, some the size of a man's head and some as big as hay bales, thudded around them. The sound was near deafening, and the vibrations loosened even more blocks overhead. Out to his left there was a huge impact, and he felt something wet splash his cheek and stick there. He wiped at it as he spun and saw that where Abed had been moments before, now there was just the remains of crushed flesh and clothing. Khaled had been through commando training himself, had been in death-dealing situations many times as a Saudi warrior, and had nerves of steel. But right now he felt his own sanity slipping from naked fear. 
He tried to run across the rocks to reach his friend, but ever more stones thumped down, and the vicious assault forced him to retreat back under the halo of light, and the only section that didn't have a rock ceiling over the top of them. He felt the heaviness in his soul at seeing his childhood friend obliterated, but mercifully, the boulder hadn't bounced away, and after it had crushed him, it remained embedded in place and spared them from seeing his face. A single arm still stuck out, its fingers hooked into claws of agony. And as Khaled wiped his eyes, he was horrified to see the fingers unfurl and then curl. Even though Abed's face and chest was flattened to paste, his limbs refused to give up. Khaled felt lightheaded and turned away. More stones fell, larger and faster now. Eventually the entire was sleep. He raised his eyes. Hurry, he prayed. Dust rained down, and he flashed his beam around the cavern, looking for any other safe haven while they waited. He touched on the small monastery. He was about to pull his beam away when the light glinted back from something on the steps at its front. At first he thought it was water pouring forth, surging and lapping and constantly changing in the angle of his light beam. Then he saw it for what it was, a torrent, but not of liquid, instead of millions of the small thread-like worms that had been inside the body of Shem. They now surged toward him and Yasha. More boulders thumped down, making both men cringe with every impact. From above, the rope finally snaked back down. Khaled and Yasha got underneath it, their faces upturned to the light and their salvation. We go together, Khaled said. Yasha nodded, still looking up. He then turned his face to Khaled and grinned, but behind the bravado there was real fear in his eyes. Keep looking to the rope, brother, Khaled said, not wanting Yasha to see the horror creeping toward them. He knew the man's sanity was on a knife edge, as his was. He turned his flashlight back toward the monastery's steps. The carpet of worms was spreading out, but it was hard to follow now, as it was disappearing into the cracks and fissures between the boulders. He couldn't know whether the things were benign or not but there was not a chance in hell he was going to let even a single one of them touch his skin. Yes! Yasha clapped his hands once, as the rope finally came within reach. Lash yourself in, quickly now! Khaled bounded over rocks and joined his man, grabbing the end of the rope, and quickly throwing it around his waist, knotting it, and putting a loop around one wrist. Pull up! No! 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 They were yanked up a few feet. Khaled snuck a quick look back and saw the worms gathering together, forming a pool below them. They seemed to hurry now, as if sensing their targets were escaping. It was obvious what they wanted. Them. More worms poured forth from under the stone that had crushed Abed, against the jagged stone of the lip. They hung there for another few seconds. Come on, faster, he prayed, and chanced to look back down. Movement. But not the worms this time. Something else, huge and cumbersome, moved into the light. Khaled lifted his gun and fired quickly three times. He knew he hit it. He thought all three times. But the thing shrugged the bullets off like they were nothing but bee stings. Huge yellow eyes fixed on him with such malevolence. He knew that it wanted to grind them into nothingness. He held his gun up and pointed right between the huge fist-sized yellow orbs. He noticed his hand shook, and he struggled to keep it steady. Below, just where they had been standing a few moments ago, the worms had coagulated into a single large mass. The hair on Khaled's head and neck rose as the worms climbed up on each other, creating a finger-like extension that stretched up toward them. 
Hurry! What is it? Yasha looked down and saw the glistening, now wrist-thick limb rising up toward them. Yah! He jerked his legs up beneath him, making the rope swing dangerously. Be still, brother. Keep looking up. Just keep looking up. Khaled tried to keep his voice calm, but felt the fear squeezing his throat. He saw the gargoyle begin to approach, and he pointed his gun again, calming his breathing, and aimed at just one of the huge yellow orbs. He squeezed off a single shot, and was delighted to see one of the glowing orbs close. The immediate hellish noise that followed confirmed the things could be hurt. They rose a little higher and beside him Yasha crushed his eyes shut, and his lips moved in a silent, manic prayer. Khaled stared down as the tendril, now tree-trunk thick at its base, but tapering to only finger-width at the tip, reached ever higher. In the light thrown down from above, he saw that it shivered slightly, as if excited anticipation ran through every living fiber that made up the biological mass. It was within a few feet of his boot now, and he carefully raised his own legs to match Yasha's. It didn't matter. The tendril rose and they didn't. I should cut myself loose, sacrifice myself, he thought, so at least one of us can survive. Khaled's hand went down for his hunting knife, feeling the pommel. He unclipped the hilt strap. Just then they jerked. Firstly, back down a few inches, and then they were moving up fast. It was as if they were on an express train, and they zoomed up the remaining fifty feet, and were at the rim in only seconds more. The pair rolled free, and the first thing Khaled felt was the bite of snow on his face, and he quickly untied himself. He sat up and then noticed the second thing. The hole was enormous now and as they watched, another huge chunk sank into the void below. Massive cracks appeared in the surface around it. Rizwan grabbed at his shoulder. We need to get out of here. He jumped to his feet, remembering they were standing on something that was like a giant bad tooth, a rim around a huge crater that had been artificially sealed over with stone. Run! The five men sprinted for the edge of the mountaintop that had a rock formation like a pair of huge sentinels. It was the closest area that had solid base underneath it. There came a brittle cracking sound, followed by pops, then booms, as ground began to break apart, and then the entire top of the mountain fell in. The ancient monastery, the statues and stonework, and the hellish worms were buried beneath many million tons of rock and snow. If the mist had cleared, it would have seemed as if the mountain was erupting, as huge clouds mushroomed into the air from its cone. The group fell to the ground, some lying flat and all gasping for breath. After a moment, Rizwan started to laugh. We're alive! Not all of us. Khaled snapped back at his man. Rizwan held up a hand and touched his lips and forehead. Peace be to our brothers, Abed and Hisham. Sorry. Khaled sighed. No, I'm sorry, brother. He tried to smile but still found it hard. It is our lucky day. It could have been all of us buried. Or worse. Yasha said. This is a place of abominations. Khaled nodded. And perhaps that is why it was sealed away all those centuries ago. Yasha leaned forward. And God be praised, sealed away for good this time. Rizwan pulled himself up to sit and rested his forearms on his knees. But we still have no ark and no wellspring of youth. But now we have a reference to the Garden of Eden. Khaled looked at his friend. Akebulan, in the kingdom of Bornu. Do you think that truly is a place? Rizwan drew in a cheek. 
Maybe there was something like it once. It is all a puzzle, and like I said, we need an expert now. He stood, stretched, and then groaned. Getting too old for this. Khaled dusted himself off. And I think it is time I met with our elusive Professor Matthew Kearns. Chapter 7 Fort Severn, Hudson Bay, Northern Ontario, Canada Matt stared out the window of the Twin Otter turboprop plane. Though the propellers spun at around 3,000 RPMs, they were invisible, and the sound muffled to a low whine by the reinforced skin of the fuselage. Normally, the Twin Otter could seat 19 passengers on board, but today there was only he and Rachel. He still thought they needed more support, especially following the grenade attack, but she had assured him that they could use local manpower. And in the case of indigenous communities, he guessed she was right in that sometimes less was more. Rachel had organized an initial meeting with the Fort Severn policeman, a Nishnobe Aski officer by the name of Oscar Ojibwe. Just don't expect the red carpet treatment, she had said. He felt a sudden squeeze on his knee, hard. Looking down, he saw her hand moving away. Still with me, she smiled. Sure, sure, wouldn't want to be anywhere else, he lied. Except surfing, she raised an eyebrow. Well, yeah, there is that, he returned her smile. She checked her watch and then leaned toward their window. We should be coming up on Fort Severn soon. He looked out. Below there was nothing but endless green with the occasional ribbon of water running through it. Even though it was relatively warm weather, the small salmon-filled streams would be icy cold, and their bleak silver surfaces looked about as inviting as a dip in one of the moons of Mercury. He gripped the armrests and felt his stomach tingle as the altitude fell away. Going down, he said softly. Fifteen minutes later, the plane bumped down onto the packed earth runway, and Matt leaned forward to catch his first glimpse of the far north Canadian town. There was a single flat building that could have been a scout hall, and a chain-link fence, probably to keep the local moose from wandering across the extremely short runway. He couldn't imagine what it must have been like trying to land a plane here in the depths of winter. The airplane came to the end of the runway, and then turned 180 degrees to slowly power back toward the property. It was only then that Matt spotted the solitary figure leaning against the corner of the building. Rachel began to unbuckle her belt. That's our ride. Matt squinted at the blocky figure. Chief Constable, she said, and flipped her seatbelt off. The Nishnobe Askiv Police Service has over a hundred constables who act as the police force up here. Matt was impressed. That sounds a lot, given how many people are up here. Are you serious? Rachel scoffed. Those hundred-odd guys are responsible for a jurisdiction the size of France. They might not get the number of drive-by shootings we see in the big smoke, but they're kept pretty busy and not to mention dealing with the odd FBI agent barging in on them, he raised his chin. And her trusty sidekick, she retorted. Matt cocked an eyebrow. I'm demoted to sidekick already? Yes, but I did say you were a trusty one. She got to her feet. Come on, let's meet Oscar. He'll be our guide, taxi, and font of local knowledge about all things local, so be nice. You know, you said the same thing before I met with Eleanor Van Helling, and guess which one of us walked away with a gift? Matt stood. Rachel laughed, but then turned to look him in the eye. Hey, did you bring it? Nah, he shrugged. The grenade attack destroyed it. It's a piece of junk now. 
I just hope Eleanor doesn't ever ask for it back. You'll certainly lose your teacher's pet status. Rachel gave him a sympathetic smile. She nodded to the pilot as he came back through the plane, unlocked the door, pushed it open, and then dropped the steps. Rachel was first one down, with Matt following. He inhaled a cool dryness that tickled his nose. There was also a hint of fragrance he couldn't place until he spotted the red dots of wild lingonberries clumped along the edge of the runway. Constable Ojibwe! Rachel waved. The man gave them an almost imperceptible nod, and then pushed off from the edge of the building. As they neared, they saw a battered blue pickup parked just around its corner. Rachel stuck out a hand and the man grasped it, pressed and released. Matt did the same. The skin on the man's palm felt like it was made from old canvas stretched over hardwood. There was real strength in the grip. Now this is a guy who actually works for a living, he could hear his father say. How's a flight? His eyes flicked from Matt to Rachel. The man looked like he sounded. He had broad, strong features, a slight Native American epicanthic fold over each eye, and a well-tanned face. His thick black hair was swept back, and Matt guessed they were about the same age. But then again, who knew? As the guy worked outdoors, he could have really been a weather-beaten twenty-year-old. The flight was good, easy, Rachel swatted at a fly. Do you need a place to rest up, grab a coffee or something? Ojibwe waited. Coffee's always good. Probably best if we grab one and talk for a while. Rachel waved away even more of the insect. There was a whine at Matt's ear, and it was only then that Matt noticed a small cloud gathering around his head. There was a stinging on his neck. Ow! He slapped a hand there, but there immediately came another sting on his cheek. What the fuck? Oscar grunted. Blackfly, pretty bad in summer. Come on. He turned to his pickup. Matt and Rachel followed, lugging their bags. Rachel turned momentarily to the plane and gave a thumbs up. In the small cockpit window, the pilot touched the brim of his cap, and then the props started up, quickly increasing their rotation in preparation for his return flight. Shit! Matt slapped his neck again at another bite, as the noise from the plane's propellers drowned out everything else. The only one of them that seemed untroubled by insects was Oscar. He unlocked the pickup, and they quickly clambered in. Jesus! Matt rubbed his ears and face. There were a few flies in the cabin that they quickly dispatched. Matt wiped his hands on his pants. Why did I have the impression there'd be nothing but pristine water, clear air, and no damned flies? especially ones that are determined to take big chunks out of you. He lifted a hand, still seeing smears of blood on the fingers. My blood or the flies, he wondered. You come at a bad time, Oscar shrugged. Or a good time if you're a black fly. They're only around for a few weeks, but in that time all they do is eat and mate. Bit like college kids, huh, Professor? Except I'm stuck with the college kids for years, not weeks. Matt smiled. Oscar did not share his grin. The truck smelled like tobacco, old paper, and perspiration. Oscar turned on the wipers to smear away some of the bugs. Any tips to avoid them? Matt asked. Oscar grunted. Don't wear perfumes. I know how you city guys like that stuff. But so do the flies. He turned back to the windscreen. Also wear light-colored clothing, as the flies are usually attracted to moose and bear, both dark animals. Luckily, they're only a problem during the day. Got it. Avoid dark clothes during the day. Rachel's lip curled down. Now if only someone had told me that before I left. One more thing. It's also mosquito season, 
and their worst at night. He grinned, and Matt could see he was obviously enjoying their discomfort. Matt nudged Rachel. Is it too late to call the plane back? The Fort Severn city center was made up of low buildings, none over two stories. It was warm now, but Matt tried to imagine the town in the depths of winter, snowbound and buried beneath blankets of white. Being housebound for days on end would have driven him insane. Ah, Officer Ojibwe. Oscar. Oscar, thanks, and it's Matt. So you busy round these parts? Sometimes. Oscar never took his eyes off the road. Matt waited, but guessed small talk wasn't going to be this guy's forte. Rachel continued to look out her side window, but Matt was determined to open the guy up. You must know everyone in the town, huh? Pretty much. Okay. Matt felt his frustration kick in, but guessed these guys weren't employed to be social guides. Many strangers come up, I mean other than us. Yep. This time of year we get a whole bunch. He nodded as he drove. Different time of year means different people. Around this time we get more fishermen, hunters, trekkers, and a few nature huggers. I try and meet every one of them, mostly good people. They pulled into the local council chambers, a long barn-like brick building with a red-tiled pitched roof. Oscar stopped the car and shouldered his door open. Come on in. They pushed through double glass doors and were greeted by a broad-faced womper <coughs> equipment and cold-weather jackets on pegs. Home away from home, Oscar muttered as he headed for a pot of coffee still steaming on the hot plate. He set about assembling three odd-sized mugs into a line. Hope you're not going to ask for one of those fancy-type coffees, he snorted and then turned. Up here it's coffee, black or black. Black is fine, Rachel said evenly. Matt raised his eyebrows. Sugar? Oscar froze and then turned. What do you call me? I meant, I said, Matt fumbled. Oscar slapped his hand on the desk, guffawing. Little joke. Sure, we got sugar. He turned back to filling the cups as Matt and Rachel exchanged glances. Rachel nudged Matt and nodded to the knife on Oscar's hip. She raised her eyebrows. Knew you should have brought the scabbard. That might have even fit. He turned to Oscar. That's some knife. Oscar's hand went to the hilt, and he pulled it free, holding the huge and gleaming bowie blade up for Matt to see. Hunting knife. Round these parts we all carry knives, damn bears and all. He winked at Matt. Nice one. Matt could not have felt any more like a city slicker if he tried. Rachel took her mug of steaming coffee and walked to the map wall. Matt joined her. Big territory. Yep. Oscar sat and leafed through some papers. Matt saw there were little red pins in the map out at some remote locations. Oscar, what are these, small villages or something? Oscar looked up. No, just some hunting cabins and supply huts. Pretty rough territory, more so in winter. So we have a few supply places tucked away on mountain slopes and way out. You get lost, hopefully you can make your way to one of those. They're all marked on maps and restocked annually. Rachel turned to look for a moment, before joining Oscar at his desk. She sat down, rested her forearms on his desktop, and smiled. We don't want to take up much of your time, Officer Ojibwe. Like I said, Oscar, he smiled flatly. Officer Ojibwe, Rachel repeated. Have there been any strangers in and around these parts lately? She opened a folder 
and slid forward a picture of the men in dark suits that had slain the family. He sighed, reached for it, and lifted it to his face. He shook his head. No one wears suits like that up here. This isn't New York. Rachel never flinched. Okay, well, are there any remote communities, houses, families, or religious orders that come and go without interacting with the rest of the community? Ojibwe examined something in his coffee cup for a second or two before sipping. Not really. Not really? Rachel's jaw jutted momentarily, and Mac could tell she was moving into interrogation mode. She tapped a finger on the image. Look again. Think again, officer. He sipped noisily. This is a waste of time. Rachel's gaze turned volcanic, but Ojibwe's remained bored. She pulled some more pictures from her folder and sorted through them. She slid one toward him. Do you know what that is? Ojibwe craned forward, frowned, and then shook his head slowly. That is the charred corpse of a five-year-old child. His name was Jamie. There are also four adults and even a dog. They were all shot and then incinerated by these guys. She pounded a fist down on the photo of the two men in suits. Who came out of the Canadian forests here? Ojibwe started to shake his head, and Rachel pushed back her chair, stood up, and lunged forward. Now look and think again, you fucking little backwater asswipe, before I get my boss to yell the eardrums off your boss. Matt froze, cup in hand, just watching the veins bulge in Rachel's neck as she leaned over Ojibwe. Her eyes were so intense, he was expecting rays to be emitted from each of her eyeballs and the Native American officer to be turned to dust. Ojibwe returned the gaze for a moment or two, before his eyes crinkled at the corners. Okay, okay, settle down, agent. He lifted the picture of the men in suits again. Like I said, no one up here that looks like this. He bit his lip. But there are a few families and individuals out in the sticks that don't come into the village. He snorted softly. There's even this old priest who's been up here for as long as anyone can remember. He's a priest. Matt sprang forward. Where? Oscar looked over his shoulder at the map and then got to his feet. He traced a blue line that was the vein of a river running out into an area that was nothing but green. He tapped it. About here. He turned. Matt was still half in his chair. Tell me about him. Oscar went and sat back down, allowing Matt to relax back into his seat. Rachel remained standing. Not much to tell. Oscar's shoulders hiked a fraction. I've been the local constable in these parts for eleven years, but never actually met him. Father Xavier Arvod Bernard is a recluse. He's got to be over ninety by now, I think. Arrived before the Second World War to run a small church for the locals. And now? Rachel's eyes were unblinking. And now no one goes up there any more as far as I know. Oscar toyed with his cup. And Father Xavier doesn't come down to us, neither. Retired, I guess, and the old guy has just fallen off the radar. How do you know he's even still alive? Rachel's brow furrowed. He might have been dead for years. He's alive, Oscar nodded. Pretty sure. Pretty sure is not good enough in a multiple murder investigation, Rachel shot back. Oscar sighed long and slow, and then lifted his phone, hitting a few numbers and turning away to mumble for a second or two. After a moment, he swung back and replaced it, and then got to his feet. Just give me a minute. 
Oscar left them in his office. Matt turned to the FBI agent. What do you think? It's got my attention. Rachel shoved a hand in her pocket. This case certainly has some religious aspects to it. A remote priest in an area that we know the killers came from and probably went back to? They've got to be holed up somewhere remote. Matt blew air through compressed lips. He's probably been dead for decades, and no one has even bothered checking. He looked over his shoulder to the door Oscar just went through. My money is on some monumental ass-covering about to take place any minute now. The door opened, and Oscar returned with a middle-aged woman. This is Susan Onatua. She delivers the mail as well as runs our computer systems, filing, and cooks a damn fine steak. He grinned at her, and she returned the same. Oscar then faced Rachel. Susan, please tell them what you just told me. Oscar sat down and steepled his fingers. Susan looked at Matt first, then Rachel. I deliver the mail to Father Xavier once a week. I'm Rachel. May I call you Susan? The woman nodded enthusiastically. Thank you, Susan. So I understand you've actually seen the father, then? Rachel coaxed the nervous-looking woman. Susan thought for a moment, and then finally shook her head. I think no, actually never. I deliver his mail to a postbox at the edge of town. The next time I put mail in, the previous delivery has been taken. Anyone could have taken it. Rachel raised her eyebrows. Given Father Xavier is ninety or more, perhaps someone is helping him out. Is that fair to say? Susan bobbed her head. Oh, yeah, sure. I think we need to head out there for a visit, Matt said. He turned. Oscar, can you show us the way? The chief constable looked pained. Rachel stared from under lowered brows. Would you like to look at the pictures of the murdered family again? Oscar's lips turned down momentarily, but he must have seen Rachel stiffen, and he seemed to deflate a little. Maybe a few of us could take a run out there, he shrugged. It's only a few hours, and this time of year the track is passable. Rachel looked at her watch. It was still only midday. No time like the present. Rachel and Matt sat up the front with the chief constable, but sharing the back seat of the SUV were officers Manny Tulemak and Gloria Anaya, two police Oscar had rounded up for their expedition. Both were young, friendly, and had a hundred questions about New York for Matt and Rachel as they drove out into the far north Canadian forest. Oscar pulled the SUV to the side of the dirt track as it had ended at an impenetrable-looking wall of tangled green. From here on foot, Matt went to push open the door. Wait. Oscar grabbed his arm, and Matt froze. He then opened the map box between the seats and tossed Matt a small red spray pump. Strongest we've got. Matt looked at the small container. D-E-E-T. Diethyl toluamide, one of the strongest insect killers on the market. Oh yeah, the black fly. Matt screwed his eyes shut and pointed it at his face. No, no, Oscar scoffed. Jesus, you want to go blind? Spray it on your hands and apply it like a lotion. Rachel looked from the windscreen. Hurry up, I'll want some of that when you're done. Matt sprayed some onto his hand and then smeared it on his forehead, cheeks, and neck. It tingled. This strength is safe, right? Sure, as long as you neither of you want kids. Oscar stared. Matt chuckled weakly and then handed the bottle to Rachel. She followed suit, lathering up, and Matt nudged her. Stop holding your breath, wimp. 
You mean like you did? She gave Matt a wink and a smile, and then handed it over her shoulder to Manny and Gloria when she was finished. They then pushed open the doors and jumped down. Matt inhaled the scents of the wilderness. It was warm, and down among the green it was moist and heavy. The black flies swarmed, but instead of alighting on their skin, the pests stayed a few feet back from their heads, like tiny satellites orbiting a planet. There was also the deeper zoom of insects, not the tiny whine of the irritating parasites, but more the heavy drone of cicadas and crickets. Manny walked out a few yards, looking at the forest ground. Nothing new been through here in a while. Is this the only way in and out? Rachel asked. No, Gloria said, as she zipped up her tan anorak. But it's the only track. You'd get lost pretty quick if you didn't know the way. Come on. Oscar headed toward a small opening in the brush. Rachel and Matt burrowed in behind him, followed by the two young police. The green tunnel only ran for about a hundred feet, and then opened out into a pine forest with the odd spruce thrown in. Oscar took them around some of the more densely packed areas, but even where they traveled it seemed it was more pushing through branches than following a trail. Matt felt trickles of perspiration on his chest and back and would have loved to unzip his jacket, but knew he'd be a human pincushion within moments. So he sighed and put his head down, ducking under another branch. Sweat dripped from his nose, and on cue the tiny cloud of black flies drew in a few inches closer, as if knowing that his chemical shield would soon be washed away. Fuck it. He hoped Oscar brought the repellent or he'd be as lumpy as a toad by the time he got back. This way. Oscar turned at another densely forested area that had an old post hammered into the ground. Maybe one day, long ago, it had held a sign, but now the directions were embedded in the locals' minds and nowhere else. The officer pushed aside some spindly bushes that hid an opening between tree trunks. Beyond there was a smaller track, darker, that looked to have split logs as planking embedded into the earth. It looked to Matt like a giant ladder that was being slowly consumed by the forest floor. From somewhere out in the gloom there was the sound of something heavy moving through the denser brush. Matt caught up beside Rachel. Hey, are you packing? Packing? What are you from, Chicago in the forties? She snorted softly. Yes, of course. She nodded toward the tree line. I hear it. Probably a bear or moose. Yeah, well, one that's keeping level with us. Matt let his eyes travel again over the odd shapes in the dark forested areas. It was so dense in some places it could have hit a Sherman tank. He could have sworn the sound stopped when they did. He turned to Manny, who was staring out to where the sound had come from. Hey, did that sound like a bear or moose to you? He just shrugged, but continued to scan the darker depths of the forest. They walked on in silence for another hour, sipping water as they went, before Oscar slowed and half turned to look over his shoulder at them. Just up ahead, he whispered. Matt could tell a hunter's stalk when he saw it, and immediately tried to do the same, treading carefully and hunching his shoulders. Matt also saw Rachel had lifted one side of her jacket, exposing the butt of a gun on her hip. Oscar held up a hand and then stopped. Matt and Rachel came to each of his shoulders and peered through a curtain of green. There was a church, vastly older than Matt had been expecting. Vines scaled its walls, and tree roots lumped up upon its foundations as the forest tried to reclaim it. The stones of the ancient church were blackened with age, and overgrown with skins of moss and lichen. The style of architecture looked Romanesque, 
with a single pointed spire and heavy ornate carvings on the stonework. Behind some of the vines, Matt could see that the windows looked to be lead paneled and might have had colored panes in them. It was impossible to tell, with nothing behind them but blackness. Father Xavier lives in there? Matt asked. Guess so, Oscar shrugged. That's the only building out here. You said you've never seen him. Has anyone seen him that you know of? Rachel kept her eyes on the church. Oscar seemed to think a moment before turning to Manny and Gloria. Both shook their heads. Maybe old Henry who owns the store, but I'd need to check. I'm betting he hasn't either, Rachel responded. Oscar looked back to the old building. The priest never bothers anyone, so no one bothers him. Live and let live, huh? Matt pulled in a cheek. Oscar turned. Up here, if people want to keep to themselves, we respect that. Until those people start beheading citizens, shooting entire families and burning their bodies. Rachel slid her gun free of its holster. Draw your weapons, officers, and take the left side of the building. Matt, you stay put for now. Oscar's expression tightened and his jaw clenched. Matt could tell he wanted to bite back, but to his credit, instead he drew a large service revolver. Gloria, Manny, with me. He began to edge out along the tree line, doing as Rachel suggested. Matt crouched, watching and waiting, and keeping a lookout for any potential ambushes, though he wasn't exactly sure what he could do other than yell a warning. He watched as the group circled the small building, disappeared around its back, and then met again at the front. The door was a solid timber structure, domed with metal hinges and wrought iron handles. Rachel put her hand to it, and then leaned closer to place an ear against it, before pulling back and gently pushing. Surprisingly, the stout-looking door opened without a sound. Someone had to have been tending to it. If it was as old as it looked, the hinges should have screamed like banshees. Matt squinted. The dark interior gave nothing away, and Rachel looked to Oscar momentarily before darting in fast. Oscar followed, his gun up. Manny and Gloria covered the outside, backs to the wall near the door, and watching the forest. Matt swallowed dryly, waiting as minutes ticked by. He looked over his shoulder at the dark forest behind him, now seeming to be holding its breath and waiting as well. He scanned the wall of tree trunks and bushes. His neck prickled. There's nothing there, he thought. Maybe just a moose or a bear. A little bear, just a cub, really. He turned back slowly and saw Rachel at the door waving him in. Yes! He jogged down to meet her. She vanished back in before he got there, followed by Manny and Gloria. Matt went straight in and then paused, waiting a few seconds for his eyes to adjust. Shapes began to materialize from the gloom. He presumed dust, debris, and maybe even cobwebs to add to the gothic feel the exterior of the church promised. But as the darkness receded, he saw that it was clean, sparse, and bigger than he expected, purely because there were no pews or any church furniture other than a small altar before a larger stained-glass window at the rear. In each of the walls there were tiny alcoves, with statues depicting the Stations of the Cross. I've never been in here before. Oscar's voice sounded almost reverent. Old but looks inhabited, Rachel said from his side. Both a church and home, Matt replied, as he looked around the walls at some of the script. Italian by the look of the language. Jesuits? Rachel asked. Haven't they been coming here for centuries? 
They have, Matt acknowledged. But the Jesuits' main focus was on South America and nowhere near this far north. I've been in old European structures before, and this looks to be easily that old, 1600s easily. Four hundred years? Oscar whistled. Matt stood staring up at the window. Though much was overgrown, many of the panels were still illuminated from the weak outside sunlight. There were hallowed saints and apostles, and magnificent calligraphic words. There's writing, but the panel segments look newer than the entire window, as if they were added in later. He peered at the writing. Benedice la casa di noi. He smiled and nodded. Of course. You want to share? Rachel asked. Matt stepped closer. It means blessed house of Noah. Noah? Rachel looked around. Then this must be the place. She pointed. Got a door here. Rachel was behind the altar. She looked back. Officer, please tell me you have a flashlight. Oscar held up a small black mag light. Never leave home without it. Good man. Rachel waved him over. On three, two, one. She then pulled open the small door in the back of the altar. It was more like a trap door leading to a cellar. The air that escaped was heavy with fungus and damp, and when Oscar shone his light into it, Matt could see there were albino tree roots like white wire springing from the walls. Is it too much to expect a light bulb down there? Matt crouched, looking into the steep hole. It was about as uninviting a place as he could imagine. Might be one down lower, but... Oscar shone his flashlight up and around inside the church. Do you see any lights up here? More likely to find candles. Matt stood and leaned over the altar, snatching at the nub of an old candlestick. This'll help you. Oscar held up a small cigarette lighter to the wick. It sputtered for a moment and then caught. He handed it back to Matt and nodded to the pit. Me? I don't think so. Matt shook his head and backed away. I can't go down there. Matt felt lightheaded at the thought of going into the dark in closed space. He shivered and crossed his arms. What's the matter with you? Rachel asked, reaching out for him. You're shaking. Yeah, I got this thing about going into caves. I've had some bad experiences before. Matt tried to push down memories of ice caves and things that hid in the dark. I'll wait here with Oscar. We'll go together, okay? Rachel pulled him closer. I need you. He stared down into the dark pit. He felt his breath quicken and his throat constrict. He couldn't do it. But then how could he let Rachel go down by herself? It's fine if you really don't want to. She held on to him. Neither do I. Their eyes met, and they held each other's gaze for a long moment. He drew strength from her, and Matt felt his breathing slow and come back under control. He exhaled and straightened. He took Rachel's hand and squeezed it. I can do it. Rachel smiled. I'll be with you. We'll be fine. With a final squeeze, she released Matt's hand, and then took the flashlight from Oscar. Matt, you follow me. Oscar, you and the officers stay here and cover our asses. Oscar grunted his assent, and then crouched beside the open door. Rachel moved the beam of light around in the hole before heading down fast. Matt took a deep breath and then followed her, carefully holding up the candle. They descended about ten feet below the floor of the church and found themselves in a single square room. Without their lights, it would have been as dark as hell. The walls were of the same stone as the walls of the church, but this was more than just foundation stone. 
It seemed carefully constructed as a special basement. Matt wrinkled his nose. It smelled like old earth. Graveyard earth, he thought morbidly. Matt held up the candle and turned slowly. There was a table with one lonely chair and a single cupboard. Rachel crossed to it and pulled the door open. Tools. There were chisels, hammers, and down on the table, and watched Rachel pace around the small room. She turned to Matt and hiked her shoulders. Gotta be something we missed. We did. He pointed at the candle on the table. The flame was bending away from one of the walls. He picked it up and carefully carried it to the solid-looking stonework. He waved it across the rough-hewn surface, and at one of the edges the flame danced back toward him. Something behind here. Rachel grabbed a long chisel and one of the metal hammers from the cupboard. Well then, lucky they left me the FBI house keys. She hefted the tools. Wait a second. Matt held out the candle to her. Just hold this for a moment and keep the light on me. She set the tools down on the table and held the flashlight and candle in each hand. You got five minutes and then I'm coming through. Matt turned back to the wall and started to press along the edges of the individual stones. There was no give, no cracks, edges, or seams that he could feel. He stood back. Hold the light up, will you? He stood back a step. Ha! In the corner there was one brick that was slightly lighter in color than its surrounding brothers and sisters, exactly as if it was the only one that was being rubbed by years of touch. He reached up and pushed it. There was a grinding noise and a click, and then the wall panel clanked open an inch. Not just a pretty face. Rachel grinned and held up a hand as he went to drag it open. Hold it. She handed him back his candle and pulled her revolver again, holding it and the flashlight up and aiming at the hidden door. She stood to the side and then nodded as Matt grabbed the edge of the stone door and eased it open. In the labyrinth of dark rooms, the stonework was vastly more ancient than that of the church. In many areas, the tunnels appeared to be carved out of the bare rock. The darkness was complete, and it was as still and silent as a tomb. Matt felt his heart rate pick up, and he took a few steadying breaths. Curiously, there was some basic furniture in some of the rooms. I think this is where Father Xavier lived, Matt said. No foundation stones. It's just caves down here. Rachel stood in the doorway of one of the rooms, moving her light around inside. I think these caves were here long before the church was built, Matt breathed. They built the church on top of them? She turned slowly. And I think more than just the priest lived here. She turned back to him. Looks like quite a few people have been coming and going. Do you think Officer Ojibwe knew? Nah. Matt sorted through some papers. I believe him when he said he'd never been out here. He opened a cupboard, and on a shelf inside was a heavy metal box about two feet by one. Hello? It wasn't a safe, more a strong box. It was wrapped in a chain and padlock as big as his fist. What have you got? Rachel asked. A locked box. He grabbed it and rattled it. But still strong. Let's see if we can find a key. He lifted the box to the ground and then crossed to an old chest of drawers. Hey, we... He was just in time to see Rachel swing a large hammer down on the lock. Once, twice, and the third time her teeth were bared, and the hammer came down from above her shoulder. The chain shattered and fell away. I'm guessing that's the way you solve all your problems? He grinned. She dropped the hammer. Why do you think I'm still single? You okay down there? 
Oscar's voice carried down the steps and along the dark passageways. Yeah, we got this, Rachel yelled back over her shoulder. She turned and nodded toward the box. After you. Matt crouched before the strongbox. If there was one thing about his work he loved, it was being the first to find some artifact, document, or object from the past. It was a window into another time that had been lost amid the centuries. He slowly lifted the lid, and it creaked satisfyingly. He recognized the smell immediately and loved it. Antique, ancient, old ink and paper. It was what someone who dealt in ancient languages lived for. He reached in and lifted one of the documents. Rachel knelt beside him and dived a hand in. She lifted rolls and folded papers, some wrapped with ribbon and others wax-sealed. Shit, it's all in different languages. Matt jiggled his eyebrows. Well then, lucky you brought a linguist. He lifted a sheaf of paper. Here we are. Father Xavier Arvod Bernard came here in 1945 following the death of his predecessor and former ward of this parish, Father Philip Durand Lurand, who, uh, came here in 1869. He read the details and then lifted another, this one even older. Father Gerard Francis Bartolone was here before him, presiding over the church for seventy-five years. And before that... Matt picked up several more documents, quickly looking at each. This is weird. Each priest comes for around three-quarters of a century and then dies in the job. No one ever goes home. Talk about a job for life, Rachel said. But that's just it. I know church rules, and they're supposed to go home before frailty takes them. And did none of them ever get sick? Miraculously, they all managed to hand the baton over on the day of their death. He looked at more of the documents. The previous priest dies, and then hallelujah, we got the new guy already standing at the door. Rachel took some of the papers from him, looking closely at each. She hummed, and then handed them back. I'm no expert, but I have worked in document forensics before, and in my opinion all those signatures look remarkably similar, the cursive loops, curls, and strokes of the letters. Could be fakes. She straightened. And you know, what else is missing? Matt looked up at her. What? If all those priests are dying out here, where are the graves? Where's the crypt or cemetery? Matt remembered the thick undergrowth. Could be lost in the brush. It's pretty dense out there. Yeah, maybe you're right. She waved it away. It's not important. The key thing is to find out where Father Xavier is right now. She pointed. Keep looking. Matt dove back in. He sifted through more documents with more signatures. He lifted several. Hold that light closer. Rachel stood over him as he brought the papers close together. Father Xavier Arvod Bernard, Philippe Durand Laurent, Gerard Francis Bartolone, and another for Father Claude Alain Picard, who took up residence in 1720. Matt stared. Rachel was right. The signatures did look the same. But where she had suggested they might be fake, his imagination took him in another direction. A hermit-like, uninterrupted line of priests, hidden away up here in the remote forest, with the same handwriting, same signature. But what if it wasn't a line of different priests, but the same priest, just pretending to die and become someone else, to avoid attracting attention? Father Xavier was Laurent, who was Bartolone, who was Picard, and on and on. His mind whirled. It was impossible, preposterous. 
But then there was Clarence Van Helling, who had wandered out of the forest looking not a day over thirty-five, when he was closer to one hundred and fifteen. Madness, he thought. You okay? Rachel watched him. Yeah, yeah, fine. He continued to pull material from the box. He could feel Rachel's eyes on him, and she reached out to place a hand on his shoulder. You think of something, you tell me. Her fingers gripped a little tighter for a moment before she released him. I'm going to take another look around. Keep at it. He nodded and dug in again, finding Bibles in various languages. In one there was an old black-and-white photograph of a serious-looking young man in a cassock. There was a large silver crucifix around his neck, with some sort of polished stone at its center. He turned it over, but there was no date or name. He flipped it back to study the face. There was something recognizable about the features. Strong jawline, thick dark eyebrows, overhanging the darkest eyes Matt had ever seen. The gaze was confident to the point of bordering on being imperious. Matt was sure he'd looked into there was a single flat stool used for kneeling before it. Matt jumped as he caught sight of something that definitely should not have been there. A pile of clothing and the sharp sticks of bones jumbled in among it. It all looked partially incinerated. Matt sniffed. I can still smell carbon. This happened recently. He knelt beside the pile. The skull had rolled to the side but was still scorched. He traced one of the arms to the end. Left hand is missing. Removed? Rachel also knelt. Matt shook his head as he lifted the blackened bones. Nope, the nub is rounded, so healed. He lost this long ago. He shrugged. Something to go on? It's a start. Rachel turned the darkened skull over and then lifted it. She stared into the empty sockets for a moment and flipped it over so she could finger the back. Matt saw there was still a portion of vertebrae dangling from its rear. She rubbed her thumb and finger together. This has been severed. She squinted down at the ground and then moved her light around on the stones. And what's all this shit? Matt lowered his candle, which was now just a nub in his fingers. Near the skull there were tracks in the dust, like where tiny snakes had squirmed away. They ended in dried, thread-like things. Some sort of worm, a carrion eater, I assume. Matt pulled back. Yuck! Rachel dropped the skull on the pile. They looked like they came out of the corpse and tried to make a run for it. Rachel fished in her pocket and retrieved a penknife and an evidence bag that she shook open. Using the knife, she scraped some of the dried worms into the bag and sealed it. Matt pulled at the dark cloth. Could be a priest's tunic, his cassock. There was the tinkle of metal and Matt lifted more of the burned cloth and found a silver crucifix on a heavy silver chain. The stone set at its center was the deepest red. Probably a ruby, not theft then. And look. He dug out the picture and showed it to her. The same crucifix. Her mouth turned down. Could be, but don't assume anything. Might also just be the order they came from. Yeah, true. He stood, hanging onto the crucifix. This is exactly like what happened to Clarence Van Helling. Rachel also got to her feet. But is this Father Xavier, or did Xavier do this? She stepped back a little from more of the thread-like trails on the ground. I bet there are no dental records, no DNA, and certainly no prints anywhere to identify old Boney here. We have no way to really find out who it is. Matt towed the bones. Do you know what taphonomy is? She gave him a bored look. 
No, Matthew, I do not know what taphonomy is. Please tell me, if it's relevant. It's the study of what happens to bodies over time, especially the bones. He sniffed again. The soil out here is quite acidic, and there's moisture in the air. Those two things alone should have meant over time the bones should have degraded down to nothing. But the sort of age darkening on the bones of this guy, excluding the incineration marks, only happens over the high hundreds or more like thousands of years. But the cut looks recent. Why cut the head off an already dead body? Rachel queried. Or were the... Matt stopped himself. Nah, that's dumb. It probably is, but tell me anyway. She held the light in his face. I was going to say, what if the guy was old? I mean, far older than we can imagine. And the bones were already like that, inside him. She stared for a moment and then rolled her eyes. Yeah, that doesn't really help. Matt looked back down at the bones. I've got a feeling we won't be meeting Father Xavier any time soon. He looked up into her face. Dead end. Rachel lowered her flashlight. There's nothing more we can do here. Let's go. As she left, he noticed she had reholstered her weapon, but had the holster unclipped and ready for fast draw. Matt followed her but paused at the door and looked back into the small, crypt-like room. In his work, he knew ancient rooms like this had seen magnificent things, secret things, and usually wanted to talk via the clues they left. Matt let his eyes wander over the tiny, cave-like room. Everything in here was brought in, and not as old as the room itself. He walked to each object, touching it and running his hands over the edges, looking for hinges, hidden drawers, or even levers. He stopped before the statue of Christ on the cross, and then reached up to let his hands move slowly over its edges. It was on a panel of dark, age-pocked wood, and he dug his fingers in beside it. It popped open. Bingo! He carefully eased it wider, immediately smelling an earthy, fish-like aroma. It was like a larder inside, but there looked to have been only one thing stored. Shelves of small clay bottles, now all smashed. Matt picked up one of the shards. It was an ancient design, no writing or markings at all. But he recognized the clay firing and handle shapes that were predominantly used in the Middle East and North Africa millennia ago. He sniffed the shard, thinking there might have been some sort of rare home brew stored in them. Phew! He jerked away. It smelled of dank water and rotting fish but he held on to it. Slowly, he looked back at the fragment and saw the spots of moisture. Matt stared, unable to take his eyes off it. His mouth tingled. Then his entire body started to crave the fluid. Before he knew what he was doing, he was bringing it to his lips. Hurry up! Rachel called from outside. Shit! He jumped at her voice, and it made him refocus. He tossed the shard back into the closet-sized space. He went to close the panel, but paused. He let his eyes run over the tiny room's interior. What was odd was that this hidden area held no food, no gold, weapons, or anything that might have been of value. Unless it had already been taken, he wondered. He pushed the door shut, and then headed out to join Rachel. They climbed back out into the main church to find Oscar leaning against one of the walls. Anything? Bones, some biological traces, and papers which we'll take back to the labs for analysis. Rachel exhaled through compressed lips. Hey, do you know if there's a cemetery around here? 
like where they would bury the old priests. Oscar shook his head. Nope. We got one on the outskirts of town, but no priests there I know of. Matt walked to the stained glass window again. The outside light had shifted, and now illuminated more of the different panels, giving it a 3D effect. From what he could see, the workmanship looked exquisite, but some parts were still lost in darkness. He read again the words he could make out. Benedice la casa di Noe, blessed house of Noah. He stared at the huge window. This is all connected, I'm sure of it. Rachel joined him. It's very detailed. They were meant to be, Matt said. The stained glass windows in churches were for more than just decoration. They were designed to tell a story. A picture's worth a thousand words, Rachel asked. Exactly. They became hugely popular during the Middle Ages. You imagine several hundred years ago, when there were no computers, television, or even electric light, and you're in a church with a window like this, the filtered light pouring through, creating a jewel-like effect. It'd be an almost mystical experience. Cartoons for the masses, Rachel half-smiled. You're more right than you know. Back then, most people couldn't read. But as religion was an important part of daily life, stories were told in the glass. All the way back in the 6th century, Pope Gregory strongly urged artists to paint biblical scenes on church walls to educate the public. Then in the 11th century, the Synod of Arras transferred the idea to glass. It basically enables illiterate people to learn what books cannot teach them. Oscar folded his arms. And what does this one say? Matt stepped back a few paces. It's not typical. He saw there were images of water, an ocean, and great cliffs or a mountain range. Animals of many varieties as well as thick forests but there were trees and ferns unlike he had seen in these parts. Oscar, those plants, do you recognize them? Nope, he said. Nothing like that around here. Looks more like a jungle to me. Matt nodded. You're right, but now imagine this place around the time of the window being created, say four centuries ago. Oscar pursed his lips. Nope again. This place has been unchanged for thousands, not hundreds of years. Matt sighed. Okay, it was just an idea. Maybe it was something the artist just made up. Rachel stepped forward. Fanciful design and all that. No, I don't buy that. These windows take years to create and were damned expensive. And though they are certainly stylized, it is all around some central theme or message. I'm just not seeing it. Matt sighed. But Oscar's right. It does kind of look more like a jungle. The answer is there somewhere. You mean a hidden message? Oscar grinned. Be better when the sun gets on it. Yeah, it probably would be. Matt spun, thunderstruck by an idea. Hey! Rachel's eyebrows went up. What? That's it. The sun is recognized by those needing to see it. He turned to Rachel. Hey, I don't suppose we can get this window back to a lab? Oscar snorted. No way, mister. You're not digging this out and flying off with it. Matt turned to Rachel, who shrugged. You'd need to give me some pretty compelling reasons to get an order for that. It's not happening, Oscar concluded. Matt stared back up at the glass. In that case, I need to get detailed pictures. It's heavily overgrown outside, and I can't make out all the panels. Oscar, can you please go and clear away some of the brush from the exterior? Oscar looked hard at him, his lips turned down. Please, Matt implored. Rachel turned to Oscar and shrugged noncommittally. 
humor him. The officer groaned and headed for the door, muttering as he went. He turned to Manny. Stop grinning. You can help. Come on. Manny also groaned and followed. Gloria waved at her colleague as she watched the pair vanish around the corner. Rachel came and took Matt's arm. You know, if there's one thing that small-town police guys live for, it's being ordered around by big city folk. Matt scoffed. I didn't order him around. And besides, as soon as we're done, the sooner we're out of his hair. In a few moments, he saw the outline of some vines being roughly yanked away from the window. More light shone through. He cupped his mouth. And a boy, Oscar! More branches came away, allowing extra light to shine through. Matt stepped back, pulling out his phone. There were now glowing purples, greens, the deepest reds, and sea blue. The work was magnificent. Wow! So beautiful, Gloria said, as she stared up at the glass. There, more writing. What does it say? Rachel turned to him. Not Italian this time, but Chaldaic again, the language of Adam and Eve and Noah. Matt concentrated. Weird. It talks of a place, a Kebulan. It's a very ancient name for the Garden of Eden that far predates the Bible. Rachel shrugged. Well, what better place to talk about Adam and Eve than in a church? No, no, you don't understand. Talking about it here is fine. But talking about it in Chaldaic doesn't make sense. It's like using code. No one has written or spoken it for thousands of years. Matt had a thought, remembering the broken bottles downstairs. They were like supplies. This place, the message designed for a select few, and the stores. It reminded me of what Oscar told us of the supply huts in the wilderness. You came here for directions or supplies. He pointed up at the window. But this makes no sense. This panel was designed not to be read or even understood by normal people coming in here. Rachel folded her arms. I've heard in ancient Greek paintings, the artists sometimes inserted hidden jokes and even insults about their wealthy patrons. Is this like that? Well done, Matt grinned at her. And maybe it's just like that. Matt stared up at the magnificent window, hiding a coded reference to the Garden of Eden. Why? To keep it secret? And why in this remote place? I don't get it. Matt looked from Rachel to Gloria. Never seen it before, the officer said evenly. Few have, I... She shook her head. I can't imagine it. Matt took more photographs of the window. Yep, the climate has been changing ever since we had an atmosphere. One day, Egypt and the entire Middle East might be green again. We tiny mammalian specks just need to get used to the climate changing one way and then back the other. Another huge branch came away from the window, displaying a new section of colored glass panels, or very crude statue of something, and close to it, a giant yellow-eyed figure pointing. What are you trying to tell us? Matt whispered. In the opposite corner and along the bottom were hues of green, brown, and blue, all intersected by lines. It seemed more for design, and Matt went back to marveling at the ark. Gloria gaped. I can't believe this has been hidden here the whole time. Rachel frowned. The animals are coming off, but that doesn't look like any sort of mountaintop to me. Matt walked slowly forward. Genesis 8, 1 to 19. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. He turned. 
But the thing is, the Bible was not written in one specific year or in a single location. In fact, the first Bible entries were set down around 3,000 years ago, with some parts even attributed to Moses, that are commonly called the Pentateuch, the Five Scrolls. But Noah lived long before this. And believe me, as a language historian, I know time has a way of vastly changing stories and history. Rachel looked up at the window. So the ark landing site may be wrong. The light moved again across its panels, making the image dance and move. An idea began to form in his mind. He looked from the picture on his phone to the window and then back again. He focused on the area that he at first thought was just artistic design. That section in the corner, you know what it reminds me of? The part image on the phone from the murdered families. The lines and contours make me think this might be a map. He grimaced, impatience gnawing at him, as Oscar still had some window panels to clear. Matt pointed. And are they knights? Dressed in black tunics, standing before the jungle, and swords in hands, stood a group of tall men. Some sort of guard? And what's with the yellow-eyed giant? Rachel asked. Maybe they're pilgrims, Gloria suggested. Who knows? Hard to make it out, clearly. It's still too dark, Rachel observed. Matt squinted up at the scene. I don't know. The light is there, but I think it's more that the glass itself is black. He tilted his head. What do you see? She folded her arms. The boat, an ark, sitting in water, I think, but surrounded by a forest or jungle. She pulled in a cheek, and her forehead furrowed. I can see beams of light but it seems to be nighttime. Could the beams mean a holy light, the radiance of God, maybe? Matt sighed. Sometimes you have to try and get inside the head of the author or artist and try and... Two rapid gunshots, loud and close by, followed by several more. Shit! Matt ducked. Get down! Gloria yelled as she crouched. Stay here! She was up and sprinting for the door. Wait! Rachel yelled after her. Gloria went through the door, flinging it shut behind her. Almost immediately there was gunfire, lots of it. Bullet holes appeared in the door and could be heard striking the sandstone facade of the church. Then, like they had all been dropped into the vacuum of space, there was a moment of total silence. Hey! Rachel raised her head, just as a long and haunting moan seemed to emanate from all around them. What the hell was that? Matt asked. It sounded like... His words froze in his mouth. The scream was long and sounded excruciatingly painful. It was cut off completely, just as something enormously heavy thumped into the side of the church, making dust rain down on them. The scream came again, this time in agony, and this time from a different throat. But Matt still couldn't tell whether it was torn from a man or woman, such was its inhuman quality. Rachel spun, teeth bared and already holding her weapon. She held up a hand in front of his face. You stay here! She turned for the door. Not a chance! Matt started to follow when there was a sound like a trumpet blast. Time seemed to slow, and Matt somehow knew what was coming next. He leapt at Rachel, grabbing her and covering her with his body, as the entire stained-glass window exploded inwards, showering the room with millions of razor-sharp projectiles. He shuddered from the pain, and could feel the hot blood running from the back of his head and where his neck was exposed. Rachel rolled over and knelt, holding her gun out and scanning the area before looking back down at him. She immediately saw the blood running down over his face. 
Jesus, Matt, stay still. She pulled a handkerchief from her pocket and held it to his neck. Matt also knelt. The pain was exquisite. Are you okay? he asked. Stay still, Rachel said urgently. Yeah, me, I'm fine, thanks to you. She gently wiped his face. I owe you one. From behind, more of the window frame fell in, and Matt spun back to see something that made his stomach sink. There was a shape in the now open frame. It was huge, misshapen, and given that the window was twelve feet up from the ground, gigantic. Yellow, softball-sized eyes set in a grotesque head fixed on him. Matt felt his heart begin to smash in his chest. We gotta get the hell out of here. Rachel's voice was high as she grabbed him and started to wrench him up. The thing moaned, long and low, and the sound conjured images of an ancient world that was inhabited by beings that were far older than mankind. Horrifyingly, it then started to come through, tearing out bricks and lifting itself up. Matt scrambled backwards on his heels and palms. Look, look! Rachel screamed at him. Out, now! The thing had heaved its body up, monstrous shoulders pushed in through the frame. A sudden thought came to him. He screamed the words in the oldest of languages, Chaldaic. He invoked the one name that he could think of, an ancient one, for God. In the name of Yahweh, I command you to stop. The figure paused. The yellow orbs remained staring, and a huge maw opened, uttering a low moan that spoke of pain and sorrow, and an eternity of suffering and servitude. It tilted its head, and seemed to be sniffing, sniffing Matt. In the name of Yahweh, I command you to be gone. Matt felt the waves of confusion coming off the thing, as it seemed frozen in indecision, either by what it heard or what it smelled. Rachel lunged at him, dragging him, and he flipped over. His legs began to move at double speed. Rachel still had him by the shoulder, and together they dove for the doorway, flying through it and rolling onto the grass and dirt outside. Shut the door! Shut the door! Matt rolled over and did it himself, kicking back hard to slam the heavy wooden slab. He scrambled backwards, keeping his eyes on the closed door. Rachel was up on her feet, gun up, and pointed at the corner of the building where Oscar had disappeared. Matt also leapt to his feet and wiped his head. Glass came free, and he then felt his neck and scalp. They were still wet, but didn't sting anymore. In fact, tracing them with his fingertips, he couldn't feel any cuts either. Maybe it was the shock more than anything else, he thought. We've got to find the others. Rachel was crouching and scanning the undergrowth. Oh, shit. Matt followed her gaze. No, no, no! He ran to the sprawled figure. Gloria lay on the grass, arms wide and a neat black hole in the center of her forehead. Rachel knelt beside her and placed fingers lightly on the policewoman's neck. It was a useless gesture, as even Matt could see from where he stood, the spreading pool of thick red soaking into the damp grass beneath her skull. Rachel looked up over the clearing, and her mouth set in a hard line. The small expanse they had crossed to get to the church's front door was now littered with bodies. Matt briefly marveled at the shooting prowess of the Fort Severn officer, until he took a few steps closer. They were bodies of men, probably. They wore black clothing that immediately took Matt back to the figure racing toward his car just before the grenade attack. But any other distinguishing features had been obliterated. It looked like they had either fallen from an airplane or been run over by a steamroller. What the hell happened here? he whispered. Rachel stood slowly. Something bad. She held her gun in both hands. Leave them. 
Let's find Oscar and Manny. Yeah, yeah. Matt backed away. He looked down one last time at Gloria in her tan anorak. Her face was calm, as if she was just sleeping. Whatever had happened out here, she had seemed to have gotten off lightly. Rachel scuttled to the side corner of the church and slammed her back to the stones, peeking around. She half turned back to him. Get over here. Matt followed, all his senses keen to any sight, sound, or sensation. But there was nothing but silence. Even the insects and few birds they had previously heard now seemed to have given the place a wide berth. He eased up beside her. Rachel peeked around again, and then turned to him, her face pale and eyes wide. What the hell was that thing? I'm not sure, he grimaced. This is bullshit. She shook her head as if to clear it. Must have been a trick of the light. He pursed his lips. Sure, that must have been what it was. The same trick of the light thing that killed all those people out front. Rachel went around the back of the church, and Matt followed close by. Behind the building there were trees right up to the brickwork, spruce, some pine, and a few other rambling bushes covered in dark berries. Oscar and Manny had been doing a fine job of pulling branches away to let the light in, with piles of shrubbery stacked to the side. But the men were gone, and all Matt could find was Oscar's large knife lying in among the grass. Oscar! He called, and then waited. Manny! Matt was about to do it again when Rachel grabbed his shoulder and jerked him back, and then put a finger to her lips. She mouthed, Wait here! And then began to crab walk along the side of the building for a while, choosing her steps to avoid any noise. She froze and then straightened. Ah. Matt rushed over. What is it? Did you find them? She grimaced. I think so. She had her gun in a two-handed grip pointed down as she scanned the undergrowth. Matt looked down at the bodies of the police officers. Oh, God. He remembered seeing a dog hit by a truck once. The big wheels went over it, all of them. The dog's body was mangled and crushed flat. Just like the men out front, Matt breathed. Worse, Rachel added, scanning the brush. He frowned. She was right. The two men were somehow intertwined, pulverized together so completely that it was hard to tell where one started and the other ended. Oscar and Manny were pressed back into the wall and just under the broken window. Their skulls looked like flattened plates, and their torsos were a red mess of conjoined flesh with shreds of uniform material running through it. Pools of blood and other bodily fluids had drained from them into the soil and also stained the old brickwork. Oscar's gun. Matt saw that his arm lay out to the side. The revolver was still in his hand, but the barrel bent. Rachel turned to look at him. You think that creature did this? You mean that trick of the light we both saw? He immediately regretted it, as he could see the FBI woman was scared witless. So was he. Sorry. That moan, the noise that thing made, it occurred just as the windows exploded in on us. Rachel crouched beside the body. You're a scientist. What could it have been? Hey, I'm a paleolinguist. I specialize in old languages, so I'm guessing here. It could be some kind of guardian. It might have been guarding Father Xavier. He pointed. These guys look like they were run over by an eighteen-wheeler several times. You're the cop. You tell me what you think happened. Calm the hell down. She looked from the forest line back to the bodies. 
and keep a lookout. Matt nodded jerkingly and also scanned the wall of green surrounding them. The trees were too close together and threw too many shadows for him to see any more than ten feet past the brush line. There could have been a herd of elephants hidden behind them for all he knew. Rachel began to feel the ruined skin of the face and neck of one of the men. Matt couldn't tell which anymore. A waste of time, he thought, given the entire head was now like a gruesome pancake. That thought made bile jump to his throat. That and what she was now doing. Please tell me you're not feeling for a pulse again. Of course not. She pressed some more. It takes around 520 pounds of force to crush a human skull. Whatever did this was not done by human hands. She winced, wiping her fingers on the grass. But there's no real impact abrasions on either of them, and I can't see any weapon marks. It's like they were... She brought her fingers together into a tight fist, grabbed and mashed together. We need to look around. What? The hell we do? Matt looked back at the bodies at their feet. Rachel, remember when I said we needed backup? Now more than ever. He pointed at Oscar and Manny. Come on, be sensible. Look. Her eyes flicked down for a second. They were police officers and gave their lives for their job, for us. I owe it to them to find out what happened. If we leave now, we may never know. Rachel stood and wandered around the flattened area. She crouched and put her fingers into some tracks, sunk into the soil. Look. The impressions were big, deep, two-toed, and the ends sunk down like it had massive claws. She looked up at him. Maybe a bear, a big one. I'm no hunter. But that was no freaking bear, Matt said softly. From somewhere out in the tangle of forest, there came a low moan, and then a deep thump like a tree was being pushed over, or maybe something heavy taking a step. Rachel got slowly to her feet, her eyes on the tree line. Matt could see doubt forming in her eyes. You got everything you need? Matt scanned the trees. Rachel continued to stare, her eyes wide. Three officers down, and we're not sure whether we found Father Xavier or not. We got dead guys scattered all over out front, and we just got attacked by some giant thing. She turned, her eyes burning. So all up, no, in fact, we've got fuck all. No, we have more information than that, Matt straightened. We just need to decipher it. The past always leaves us clues, calls to us. We just need to understand what it's saying. Rachel licked her lips and refused to turn away from the trees. I got a bad feeling, Rachel. Things could get a lot worse. Come on, let's go home. Matt reached a hand out and grabbed her sleeve. Large drops of icy rain started to blink down around them. Rachel looked up at the low, iron-gray clouds as the few drops turned into many. Well, that's just perfect. She let him turn her away from the trees and then followed him. Chapter 8 Washington Airspace Rachel sat up front with the pilot, having left Matt to himself in the cabin of the noisy aircraft. She knew they were lucky to be leaving at all. At this point in time, the local rangers were still scouring the area for more clues. She and Matt had had to give their depositions in separate rooms to see if they married up. Luckily, they had, even though it made no sense. And that was after she got Matt to leave out the bit about the thing that had tried to force its way into the church. 
It had taken significant pressure from her boss's boss to get them out, as the local guys refused to believe they knew nothing about the killing of Oscar, Manny, and Gloria, the destruction of the church, the battered strangers all in black, or the beheaded skeleton in the basement. Rachel snorted softly. Why the hell would they believe them? She certainly wouldn't have when they swore they saw and knew nothing, which as far as she was concerned was basically true. While they had waited for more backup, Rachel had examined a few of the black-clad men who had attacked the church. Even though they were crushed beyond use for any mugshot or driver's license ID, or even to make use of dental records anymore, she had seen telltale signs of a professional unit. Their clothing looked identical to the pictures of the men who had attacked Clarence Van Helling. She had attempted to take fingerprints, but they came up blank. The physical lines, squirrels, and whorls had all been removed, most probably using acid peel, she bet. When she had ripped the shirt of one open, she had seen an image of crossed keys had been seared into the skin. It was the same on all of them. She had used her phone to take a few pictures. Rachel exhaled long and slow. She'd already talked to her area chief, and now she needed to make one more call to Eleanor Van Helling. Dear Eleanor had been pressuring everyone short of the President of the United States about getting updates. The pushy old woman was determined to get answers and she was damn well going to make sure she got them from Rachel, or else. When you worked in the FBI, one thing you found out very early on, downward pressure worked, and it was working on Rachel. She made the connection and got the weird maid, Greta, on the second ring. Field agent Rachel Bromelow for Mrs. Van Helling. Yes. Rachel ground her teeth. Yes, well, get her. Personality of a dead fish, she thought, as she waited for another few moments. The phone sounded like it was being juggled momentarily. Agent Bromelow, Rachel, so nice to hear from you, and so happy to hear you're safe after all that unpleasantness. Normally, Rachel might have assumed Eleanor was talking about the grenade attack outside of her building. But Rachel could tell Eleanor was somehow already aware of the brutal deaths in the Fort Severn wilderness. She looked at her watch. It had been four hours since they had departed, but only twenty minutes since she had spoken to her superiors. This was one seriously tuned-in woman. Thank you, Mrs. Van Helling. We're still about three hours out from landing. We'll be heading directly into the office for a formal debrief, and then after that hopefully we can— No! Rachel recoiled. The old woman's voice came like a slap. Do not make me wait for all that bureaucratic piffle. Tell me what you've found now. Rachel sighed. What did it matter, she thought. Her boss would tell her anyway. Very well. But this is all very confidential. There was a derisive snort over the line. Rachel continued. We can't be sure, but I believe we might have found evidence linking a group who attacked us at the church and the men who killed your husband. What evidence? The old woman's voice took on a sharp edge. Well, they were dressed similarly to the men who attacked and killed Clare, your husband. There was a groan over the line. That is what the FBI classes as evidence now, similar dress sense. Eleanor sighed theatrically. No, Mrs. Van Helling. Rachel's jaw clenched momentarily. We also think they might have killed the priest who was living there, we found some remains, and though there's no positive ID yet, I'm confident it was him. Was he like? Yes, he, the body, had been decapitated and then burned up, just like your husband, but... 
But what? The voice cut across her. We found some anomalies, other specimens that we've collected. We need to get back to the office and have the labs analyze what we've found. We don't have much, I'm afraid. Rachel sat back in her seat. You certainly don't, Agent Bromelow. And it seems someone is removing all your clues and witnesses faster than you can get to them. One step ahead of you all the way. This is very disappointing. The old woman sighed impatiently. Anything else interesting, hmm? Rachel thought about telling her of the huge apparition that tried to break into the church and probably obliterated the police officers, but knew that would be impossible to explain. Nothing else for now, Rachel said quickly. Nothing else for now? Eleanor waited. Rachel stared out through the window. We're on it, Mrs. Van Helling. On it? But you seem to be disappointingly late every time. I think you need help. The voice was steel hard. No, we got this. Rachel checked her watch again. But I disagree, my dear. In fact, I don't think you've got it at all. This is far too important for bureaucratic protocol, rules, or people's egos to get in the way. Consider it more resources for you. We'll speak again soon, field agent. The line went dead, and Rachel held up the phone, squeezing it for a few seconds, wishing it were the old woman's neck. Beside her, the pilot briefly looked across at her, before facing front again. Chapter 9 FBI Headquarters, 935 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C. Matt dozed in the rear seat of the dark sedan, and his mind drifted in a beautiful dream. Once again he saw the long pool of shimmering sapphire blue water. But this time there was an angel rising from the water. She was naked and long-limbed, with golden hair swept back over her bronzed shoulders. Her breasts were perked, her eyes were on him, and they were as luminously blue as the water surrounding her. Her smile widened, and then widened some more, until her lips pulled so far back she exposed all of her teeth and gums, and still the flesh pulled back further until the skin of her face ripped away, and there was just a screaming skull that dried and flaked and turned to dust. Yah! Matt jolted forward, wide awake. He chuckled softly. Dream. He exhaled, rubbed his face, and leaned toward the window. They were nearly at their destination, the massive, slate-gray FBI building. It reminded him of something a child would build from their Lego set, with a slab of all their extra Lego bricks on top. A building with a hat on, he thought, and eased back into the seat. Beside him, Rachel seemed preoccupied. Penny for your thoughts? he asked. She stared out of her windows for a few moments more, and then inhaled deeply through her nose and let it out slowly. She turned, her face drawn. It's nothing. She seemed to slump. It's all complicated. Samuel. Matt guessed she was still upset about her colleague, and being back made her think about him all over again. She nodded. Yes, yeah, Samuel, and Oscar, and the dozens of others who fall every goddamn day, she said, her tone melancholy. And then there's all the other shit that swirls around. She turned back to the window. And never stop swirling. Why don't you quit? Woman like you could get a job anywhere, he said, meaning it. She snorted. What, and give up show business? She pulled in a cheek. Forget it, I'm just on a downer, to grab his hand. 
I know I'm a hard-assed bitch sometimes, but I also wanted to thank you for probably saving my life. She smiled. There's a lot more to you than I first thought. Thanks. And Rachel, if it helps, I don't think you're a bitch all the time. He grinned. She returned the smile. I'm glad you're here, Matt. She squeezed his hand. They navigated the building's crash and bomb barriers and passed through multiple checkpoints before pulling into its vast underground car park. Now we meet the boss, huh? Matt asked. That's right. First up, we meet with Assistant Director Dominic Wybrow, my supervisor. Mrs. Van Helbag is breathing down his neck as well. Mrs. Helbag? Matt chuckled. I see you two are getting along famously. Rachel grinned. Yeah, well, in groups. Smaller, box-like offices held a single occupant. And toward the end of the large room were the larger senior management suites with names written on doors. She half turned to him as she strode down the corridor between cubicles. Be nice. You keep saying that, he winked. She knocked on one of the doors, and a large, bald man looked up. His eyes slid past Rachel to Matt, and they seemed to analyze and assess him in a matter of seconds. There was a tiny movement of his head, giving approval to enter. Rachel pushed the door inwards. Sir. She then stood aside. Professor Matthew Kearns. The man came to his feet. He was big, six four at least, and had hands like shovels. One shot forward to totally enclose Matt's hand, but it didn't compress as hard as he expected. Perhaps Wybra thought that as Matt was an academic, he was used to doing little more than writing on whiteboards and sipping exotic coffee blends with his students. Professor Kearns. He sat and motioned to two seats in front of his desk, his club-like fingers meshed in front of him. Thank you for working with us. Matt nodded, but didn't want to say it was a pleasure, as frankly he didn't like the idea of becoming embedded in FBI processes or politics. Suddenly he had the feeling of water rising up to his neck, and he swallowed hard. Once he'd written up his report, he would ease himself out of the relationship. He'd been to Canada as he'd promised Eleanor, and now he hoped he could wind up his involvement in this bizarre case. He didn't need any more nightmares. Matt glanced at Rachel, looking at her profile for a moment. He liked her, a lot. But then he shook his head as if to clear it. In his mind, a sensible voice whispered, Don't get entangled in this, even if there's a nice girl involved. It just isn't worth it. He'd ask a few questions he had, and then say goodbye. Any clues on the bombing? Wybrow didn't flinch. None. The bomber was picked up on CCTV coming down the street. Tossing the package into your car and then disappearing around the corner. And I really mean vanishing around the corner, as on one feed the guy was there, and then once he rounds the building, he wasn't. Wybrow shrugged. Seems this guy knew the layout before the attack. I see. Matt frowned. Hey, haven't you guys got facial recognition software now? Yes, we do. Wybrow replied. As long as people are on a database somewhere, we can cross-check for a visual match. But first we need a clear shot, and our guy didn't give us that. We've got nothing yet, Professor Kearns. His voice took on an edge. Don't forget, one of my agents was killed, so be aware that we have no intention of letting this go. Wybrow breathed in and out for a few moments his nostrils flaring like a bull about to paw the ground. He turned to Rachel. We got bodies piling up, and a killer or killers unknown, background unknown, profile unknown, designation or demands unknown, who seem to be one step ahead of us. 
We still seem to have a lot of work to do, Agent. Rachel, sitting upright, just nodded. Wybrow sat back. And they even followed you to Canada. Or were already there, Matt added. Maybe. His eyes went to Rachel again. Agent Bromelow, I've read your preliminary report. Not much in it. But you have a few things to follow up on, is that right? Yes, sir. I've now read the full coronial report on those hitters that turned up to attack us at the church in Fort Severn. No fingerprints, none of them carrying ID, and as I expected, dental records and facial identification impossible to use, as their heads were obliterated. But my gut feeling is that these guys were the same group that attacked Clarence Van Helling. And I think the bomber was from the same cult, Matt put in. It's a cult now? Wybrow sat back. Rachel shrugged. Profile fits. The men all had religious-looking iconography seared into their skin. Pretty extreme. So do a lot of teenagers these days. Wybrow waved it away. Still, it all sort of ties together if you squint real hard and think of you two as the eye of the cyclone. His eyes narrowed. Because if it is the same group, then frankly they seem to be dogging you, Agent. His eyes shifted to Matt. Or maybe you, Professor. Terrific. Matt slumped in his chair. Professor Kearns needs some lab time to process the glass window images. Also, I have some biological specimens that need to be analyzed, Rachel said. About that, Matt held up a hand. I think I've done all I can, and you probably don't need me anymore. I'm expensive, and since we know the language used is Chaldaic, there are several paleolinguists who can be— Rachel's head whipped around and she glared at Matt, brows drawn tightly together. Don't worry about your fees. They'll all be taken care of for as long as we need you. Wybrow's flat stare pinned Matt for a moment, before sliding back to Rachel. Labs are ready for you. This is a priority, and I don't need to tell you the political pressure this is drawing, from both our guys and the Canadian government. He turned to Matt. Harvard has okayed your consulting. I have to tell you that they're very proud of you, Professor. Matt grimaced as he watched Wybrow press his phone com. Janine, can you get Agent Modell up here? He sat back, smiling benignly at Matt. Agent Modell heads up our scientific imaging department. You tell him what you need and he'll source it pronto. Just a ride home, Matt said, feeling trapped. Rachel threw him a thunderous look, and he couldn't meet her eye. Any time you like, Professor, Wybrow leaned forward. But remember, agents like Samuel Anderson died for you. Let's find out who killed him and bring them to justice. Giving us a few more days is nowhere near the price he paid. I just... Matt felt like an asshole. Yeah, sure. Rachel pressed her lips together and looked away. A slim man peered in through the glass door before knocking. Wybrow held up a hand flat and then turned back to Rachel. Move quickly. If we're going to run these guys down, we need to do it while the trail is hot. Yes, sir. She got to her feet. Matt guessed they'd just been dismissed and stood. Go with Agent Modell. Tell him what you need. He'll help. Wybrow held out his huge plank of a hand again. And thank you for choosing to work with us. Yeah, no problem. Matt walked to the door, moving stiffly like a jerky robot. He could feel the assistant director's eyes on him the entire way. Outside, it seemed several degrees cooler, and Modell grinned at him. Intense, huh? Matt blew air through his pressed lips and then grinned back. Nah, 
I deal with the military all the time. This is grade school stuff. Yeah, right. Modell led him to the elevators. Matt went to say goodbye to Rachel, but she just nodded coolly and continued down the hallway. Matt paused, watching her go, and then shrugged. Modell also watched her shapely form depart. Forget it, she's way out of your league. Come on. Matt sighed and followed the scientist. Once inside the elevator, Modell turned to Matt. I've read some of your papers. Matt raised his eyebrows, waiting. Modell simply turned to face the elevator numbers as they rose. Well, okay then, Matt said, now wondering whether the guy was a fan or critic. The lift doors slid open, and Modell strode off, talking as he walked. You've got some images you want processed. Yes, and a sample, Matt said, fishing in his pocket for the plastic bag containing the glass shards. Modell held out his hand, took the bag and held it up. What do you need to know? Composition, spectral analysis, dating, basically everything. And if you have predictive analysis, I'd also like you to reassemble it and show me what it looked like. Modell bobbed. Maybe, but we'll have no way of knowing what the entire piece looked like. What about the images you mentioned? Ah, uh, they're for my own analysis. I need to try and work out what it says and what it means. You can use the pictures for reassembly. Translation? Modell snorted. We have programs for that now. We've obtained a translation app from Harvard. I can run the language fragment through it, and then we'll see what it comes up with. Nope, you won't find this language, or its nuance. I bet we will. It's top of the line. I bet you won't. Matt's lips curled into a smile. If you got that from Harvard, then it's the language app I wrote. Believe me, this language and dialect isn't in there. Modell nodded, looking impressed. Besides, Matt said, it's usually never about a straight translation. You need to determine two things, what the writer was saying and what they were actually meaning. They can vary greatly. Okay. Modell pushed open a door. Here we are. Welcome to my bat cave. Here. Rachel handed Howard Howie Bilson, a bureau scientist the small bottle containing the dried worms. He held them up, squinting in at the remains. Tell me about them. The geographical location was northeast Canada. I doubt they were indigenous. They were in the basement of a church, and I think they might have exited some human remains while it was being burned up. Bilson's eyebrows went up. An internal parasite? He turned to his workbench and opened the bottle and emptied the remains into a petri dish. He lifted a large magnifying glass and scrutinized the thread-like things. Could be some sort of nematode, pretty desiccated now. Like I said, they were escaping a fire, Rachel said slowly. But not charred. Howie slid along his bench to a large microscope taking the dish with him. He used a pair of long tweezers to remove one of the worms, placing it in another small glass dish. This time he added a few drops of sterile water and then carefully slid it into the staging area of his scope. Howie bent over the eyepiece and using one hand began to adjust the focus and changed it up to fifty times magnification. He hmm-hmmed, and pursed his lips for a few moments before pulling back. No discernible mouthparts, and given its state, I'm not sure what type it is. He took a picture and relayed it to a screen on the wall. There was a dark, glistening worm that seemed to have hydrated a little from the sterile water. It was glossy, tapered at both ends with no eyes or external sensory organs at all. 
Strangely, it seemed a little lighter in color than when it had first entered the sterile water. The scientist shrugged. I can get a parasitologist or perhaps an entomologist to look at the specimens to give us an exact identification. I need the information now, Rachel said. I don't want to wait weeks while some other nerd, sorry, specialist, looks them over. Besides, I don't really care about naming it, just finding out what it was doing and why it was there. Nerd? Howie grinned. I've been called worse. Okay, we can find out an awful lot right here and now. Let's see what these guys were doing in that cadaver. Might give us some more clues. He selected another of the dried worms, and using the tweezers, dropped it onto another dish. He then used a scalpel to carefully chop it up. He then added a few drops of water, and continued to mash the remains a little more before scraping the mush into a test tube. In his chair, Howie rolled along the floor again, making Rachel step back quickly to avoid flattened toes. No wonder they had linoleum floors, she thought. Means these guys never had to get to their feet. He capped the lid of the small tube and placed it in a centrifuge. He set it to spin and pressed a timer for twenty minutes. That'll separate the materials, the serum, proteins, any matrix from the stomach. We'll then be able to use the mass spectrometer to determine what chemical residues are inside. Of course, finding human protein fragments will tell us it was feeding on the body. He spun in his chair toward her and folded his arms. Why the hurry? These guys aren't going anywhere. Priorities. Murder investigation. Rachel paced away. Hey, I'm busy too, you know. I've got several murder investigations that need evidence analyzed, the scientist retorted. My murder was one of our own, plus two entire families. She turned. If you'd like to speak to Assistant Director Wybrow, let me know. Her jaws tightened, and she went to turn away, but froze. She squinted at the screen. Hey, and as for these little guys not going anywhere, I think you'd better have a look at this. Howie turned in his chair, looking up at the microscope's screen feed. The image of the worm under the scope showed a glassine worm, now fully plumped and whipping back and forth. Holy shit! Natural rehydration! He scooted over, peering down the eyepiece, and adjusted the lens. Not that uncommon, really. There's a sea snake called Hydrophis platurus that can totally dry out and stay that way for months. Add water, and in an hour or two it rehydrates and off it goes. Well, this took about two minutes. Rachel's lips curled at the revolting image. Beautiful. Howie grinned as he peered down the lens. Maybe I should have expected it. Dehydration is a form of hibernation for creatures at the smaller end of the scale. They convert sugars in their system to something like glass that surrounds their organs to protect them from collapse. You just add water and... And we're good to go, Rachel said, turning to look at the writhing worm. She stood transfixed as the tiny thrashing thing continued to inflate. Beside her, Howie mumbled keeping up a steady stream of biology facts and figures mixed with the wonders of the natural world. Time moved on, and she paced, fidgeted, and sighed long and loud. Behind them, the centrifuge timer finally pinged. Thank God, Rachel thought. Now we can see what our little friends have been up to, or at least what makes them tick. Howie crossed to the centrifuge, lit just fine. He sat down on a chair and pressed two buttons on the face of the device, causing two trays to slide out, like a CD player awaiting its disc. He carefully placed the slides in each and then nudged the trays closed. 
He moved along the control panel to a keyboard and immediately started entering data. I am now telling Gertrude what I'm feeding her today and what I want back. He lifted a hand, single figure hovering over the enter key. And voila! He hit the key with a flourish and sat back with arms folded. Gertrude seemed to purr. How long? Rachel asked. Howie smiled for a second or two. The small screen showed graphs of different colors, rising and falling, in spiked peaks and troughs. The screen beeped and then displayed a green banner. Analysis complete. He pressed print times two and immediately two sheets of paper were ejected into a tray. He snatched them up and handed one to Rachel. She glanced at it and sighed. Well? Howie looked at the information. His lips pursed, and he nodded now and then. He stopped and his brows came together. Hello? That's weird. What's weird? Rachel looked over his shoulder at his paper, even though she was holding a duplicate in her hands. These elements, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, basic chemicals, but their proportion are way too familiar. He spun in his chair so fast Rachel had to leap out of his way. Howie then grabbed up a computer tablet and started to type furiously, opening multiple pages in a flurry. He snorted as he read the results. Yep, knew it. Amino acids. He showed her the results, but the chains and connectors meant nothing to her. Amino acids? She leaned over him. So? Human. But you expected that. You already said if you found human protein fragments, that had just confirmed the parasite might have been ingesting the body. Yeah, I did. He grinned. But think about what I said. I was talking about protein fragments, and that's not what we've got here. What we've got here is so much more. He whizzed back over to the mass spectrometer. I think, no, I know, we've got indicators for hormones. Howie practically bounced in his chair. It's basically 75% hormone, 75% freaking human hormone. She grimaced. Hm. So you're telling me they were feeding on this guy's hormones? No, no, no. He looked exasperated. For them to be at this concentration in the parasite, these things weren't taking them from the host, but were so loaded they were excreting them back into the host system. He started to type again. But which one? It's a specific one? She asked, leaning over his shoulder. I think so. He hummed as he typed. Let's see if we can isolate it. He clapped once. Yes, FGF-21, good old fibroblast growth factor 21. How he continued to nod and read figures and Rachel's impatience swelled. Well, what the hell is that? Oh, it's what we call a growth and repair hormone. The thymus gland produces it, and it's very prevalent in our bodies, but only when we're young. We stop producing it as we age. He turned. It's actually why we age. As some specialists say, it protects the immune system against the ravages of age by giving us super defenses against disease and cell destruction, and it also supercharges our repair system. He straightened. You know what? I think this thing might not be a parasite at all, maybe more a symbiote. He rubbed at his chin. Or perhaps it was just a super-efficient parasite, just taking what it needed to keep itself and its host alive. His brows knitted. If you had this much FGF-21 in your system, you could live for... His eyes flicked up at her. This guy that the worms came from, 
How old was he? What did he look like? What did he look like? She snorted sourly. The remains of a fucking bonfire. From Fort Severn, way up in Canada, you say, Professor? The science agent, David Modell, hmmed, as he looked from the glass fragments up at the image. And from within, an old Christian church. Yep, Matt replied. From that stained glass window. He nodded up at the conglomerate image assembled from all the pictures he had taken from his phone camera that was now projected up on the wall. Modell looked again at the enlarged image. Magnificent. It was, right before it was shattered into a million pieces. Matt sighed. A damned crime. Modell cursed softly. This glass sample. He looked skeptical. Matt, do you know how long stained glass has been around? Matt nodded. Yeah, I know. A long time. Colored glass was produced by both the early Egyptians and the Romans. He grinned. So yeah, a damn, damn, damn long time. And these pieces? Matt nodded toward the fragments of glass on the bench top. Modell leaned over the shards, smiling down on them for a moment, before picking up a metal probe and moving them around, fitting them back together. You know, I wish we had all the shards, no matter how tiny. We could have put this back together like a giant jigsaw. He looked from the fragments to the screen again using it as a guide to push another piece into place. Yeah, well, we were kind of rushed there at the end. We've got to work with what we've got. So, how old? Matt pressed. It's around fifteen hundred years old. He looked up. Makes it one of the earliest specimens of the craft in existence. Now you know why I would have liked more of it. Modell's brow creased. So why would someone place a stained-glass window that is absolutely priceless way out in the sticks? Good question. Matt stared at the fragments, his mind working. Why was it there? A very good question. But the real burner for him was why, after all those centuries, was it destroyed just as they got there? Modell joined some pieces together into what looked like a single large yellow orb. Matt recognized it immediately, one eye of the thing that tried to come into the church and totally destroyed the window. He saw it. It had meant to destroy it. Matt felt a tingle of fear race up his spine, and he began pacing. And why would they black some of the panels out? Even back then they knew about the night sky and other stained-glass windows have images of the moon and stars. They wouldn't have it pure black. It doesn't make sense. Not a very clear picture you took. Modell folded his arms and looked up at the image. But it was beautiful. He sighed. And someone robbed future generations of its magnificence. Because someone didn't want us to see it. Matt stared. Modell looked from the image to Matt. The medieval windows usually contained a message, and this one was very detailed. He looked back to the full window. There was writing in many languages, but there was one that was the most ancient form of Hebrew in existence, called Chaldaic, supposedly the language actually spoken by Noah and his sons. The thing is, no one speaks this language, no one writes it, and no one has for thousands of years. What did it say? Modell straightened. It referred to a place, the mother of mankind, a Kebulan. It's an old name for the Garden of Eden. The scientist shrugged. Intriguing, but still not exactly earth-shattering, or window-shattering. He jiggled his eyebrows. Maybe. Matt tilted his head. Hey, can you rotate that image? 
Roll ninety degrees right. Sure. Modell fiddled with the projection controls, and the image rolled on the screen. Matt folded his arms and walked closer to the image. He tilted his head. The shades of green, brown, and blue, with the line running through them, started to make sense. The line seemed to be following a contour. You know what this looks like to me? A map. He pointed. The blue is water. I can see a coastline. And that could be a trail of sorts. Yeah, you're right. It could be a map. Modell studied it a little more. But there are no names or points of reference. Could be anywhere. Could be, but it isn't. Matt started for the door. Can you send this to Assistant Director Wybrow? He waved. And thanks, buddy. That was very helpful. Matt and Rachel met back in Wybrow's office. She was still acting cold toward him, but seemed to warm up as they began to make sense of what they had learned. To Matt's pleasant surprise, Wybrow was very good at drawing out the details and asking questions that acted as springboards to answers, or even better questions. So you've got a piece of a map that might correspond to somewhere in the world. That's a pretty big playing field. Wybrow shrugged. But if the window is fifteen hundred years old, then the map has got to be about the same vintage. Maps then weren't the same as today, were they? No, that's right, Matt agreed. Some European countries were fairly well mapped, but not all. Same as the Far East, but as for the far-flung countries, many weren't even discovered back then. They were still in the great unknown areas, the ones with dragons drawn on them. Then there'll be no help, Rachel said. If only it had a single point of reference, anything. It already does. Wybrow's mouth curved into a smile. The ocean. Matt began to grin. He's right, you know. Though the mapping of interiors was pretty superficial at best, the seafarers were mapping coastlines for centuries longer than that. And the coastlines nearly always had a point of reference. Their shape alone can be recognizable. What's the closest coastline to Mount Ararat? Rachel asked. Might as well start with somewhere that was the last known place for Noah. Good as any place to start. Let's side-by-side -side it, Matt said. Bring up a map of Ararat and see if we can identify anything that matches close by. The nearest large-scale body of water is 150 miles to the Caspian Sea in Azerbaijan, then about 150 miles to the Black Sea, but still in Turkey. Rachel took control of the computer and split the screen. She brought up the Turkish landmass and began to drill down. She sat back. And about 600 miles to the Mediterranean. Matt let his eyes flick from one to the other. I can't see any coastal similarities. He leaned forward and cupped his chin for a moment. Hey. He clicked his fingers. Try for any maps from fifteen hundred years ago. Anything you can find. Wybrow pulled in a cheek. Reaching a bit now, aren't you, Professor? From fifteen hundred years ago? How many of those are lying around? Alexander the Great made plenty of maps, and he was last around in 323 BCE. Also, there's Claudius Ptolemy's 150 AD regional map. Plus, the Roman Empire ruled that entire part of the world a few hundred years before that, and they were diligent map makers. Sure, there'll be plenty of gaps, but we might find useful examples that correspond to the shoreline we're interested in. Wybrow nodded. Over to you. Matt squeezed in next to Rachel. Let me. He started to type, accessing several libraries he knew that had antiquarian maps online. He looked at the candidates and rejected them over and over. Bummer. He sat back. 
No dice. The older they are, the rarer they are. He shrugged. And the rarer they are, the more valuable and less likely they are to be shared online. All I'm getting is references, but no images. Wybrow's mouth twitched in readiness. Matt held a hand up flat to him. I know. Don't say it. He sat back in his chair. The high-value maps are either in the hands of private dealers or locked in government vaults. Matt had good contacts, but anything sold on the black market was unrecorded and probably gone for good. Added to that, even the recorded stuff, if held by overprotective governments, was off-limits to anyone, any time. He used both hands to push his hair back off his face. This is where we need to tap into someone's network, someone who has access to all the private map dealers, people not on the formal radar. Someone who is known to have their own collection, wealth, status, and credibility, the only criteria that matters for these guys. He spun in his seat, grinning. And who do we know like that? Please don't say Eleanor Van Helen. Rachel sighed. Matt pointed at her chest. Bingo. You think she can help? Wybrow's brow creased. I have a list of exclusive antiquarian libraries in Europe that we can try. But they wouldn't even sniff at me, or the American FBI for that matter. But they might open the doors for Mrs. Van Helling. And I'm sure she knows a few other private map dealers who don't exactly advertise what they have in their collections. Matt shrugged. Yeah, I think she can open doors for us. For you, Rachel added her lip curled. For us, Wybrow stared hard at Rachel. She looked pained. Assistant Director, I really don't think— But I do think, Agent Bromelow. Wybrow clasped large fingers on his desk. The professor is a subject matter expert, but you are our agency expert. Both skills are vital here. He looked at her from under lowered brows. That's final. Yes, sir. Her gaze was flat. Anything else? Wybrow asked. Yes, sir. Rachel slid the lab results to him. These were the things that we found next to the body from the church basement that may or may not have been Father Xavier. Wybrow turned the folder around and flipped it open. His brows came together as he read. Says here they're still alive? Yes, sir. Worms. Seems they were in hibernation, just waiting for rehydration. That's weird. Wybrow's nose wrinkled, and he turned another page. And pretty damned revolting. Agent Bilson thinks they might be some sort of nematode. Rachel seemed to enjoy Wybrow's disgust. The worms probably exited his body after death. They seem to be excreting a particular human hormone, FGF-21, responsible for bolstering the human system to fight aging. Anti-aging worms? Matt grinned. The cosmetic industry will go wild. The cosmetic industry, the military, politicians, just about anyone would go wild for it but first they'd have to know about it. Wybrow looked up at her, his eyes narrowed. Clarence Van Helling. Exactly what I was thinking, sir, she responded. That's why they burned him up, to destroy everything. So where did they come from? Wybrow opened his hands, his fingers spread over the notes. I doubt they're from around here. They're not. Agent Bilson has never seen anything like them. They've never been documented before, anywhere, Rachel said. Wybrow turned in his seat to stare out through the window. You're right. An obvious attempt to destroy evidence and leave us nothing to go on. Matt and Rachel waited, and Wybrow put a hand up to rub his jaw, the rough surface making a chaffing sound. 
He turned back. This case is getting more confusing the more we know. Wybrow's jaws worked behind his cheeks for a moment, and he turned to Rachel. Time for some answers, Agent Bromelo. She nodded. I agree, sir. We have a few leads we can run down. Matt looked again at the split screen showing the map fragment. Someone went to a lot of trouble to place that map there, but then also to obscure it so it was hidden from anyone other than those who knew what they were looking for. After all, finding a 1,500-year-old stained-glass window in Canada is like uncovering a Roman sword in the hands of a Neanderthal skeleton. Wybrow stared, and Matt leaned forward. That map was showing the way to somewhere important. He nodded at the map fragment. Whatever it is that lies at the end of that map's trail will give us the answers we seek. He turned back to Wybrow. But to find its destination, we first need to find where to start. Eleanor Van Helling, here we come. Rachel sat back. Chapter 10 Central Park South, New York, New York Why not? Matt raised his chin. Rachel rolled her eyes. Matt, come on, really. You can't possibly believe that map is going to lead you to Noah's Ark, or the mysterious Fountain of Youth, or even some sort of mystical Garden of Eden, do you? It's all make-believe. He glanced at her, incredulous. You did see that thing that tried to break into the church, right? I don't know what I saw, now. She looked away. Things like that can't exist. Maybe they do, but we just aren't supposed to see them. He turned to face her. I have a theory about it. There's these immortal creatures, angels, that had fallen to earth. Fallen angels? She rolled her eyes. Exactly. They're called Nephilim. Their name actually means fallen from God's light. He bobbed his head. It also means the violent ones. The thing was, the Nephilim were said to be banished to earth to act as sentinels and servants, violently if necessary. They would perform these tasks until the world ends, or until they managed to return to God's light through their good deeds and actions. She turned to him. Sentinels or servants to who? He held up both hands. That I don't know, but just keep an open mind, okay? It wasn't that long ago that the city of Troy was just thought to be a fable, and rumors of pyramids in America were laughed at. He raised an eyebrow. Hell, we even discovered a real-life lost world atop a plateau in Venezuela. He shrugged. All I'm saying is, I've seen things that would stretch a normal person's imagination or sanity. I found that myths and legends always have a grain of truth. Well, I want it on record as saying I think you're well off beam on this one. She sighed. He scoffed. Well, what do you think is happening? Rachel sighed. I don't know. That we're all going insane, maybe. He chuckled. Yeah, probably. But the important thing is that someone sure thinks there's something at the end of that map. Something important enough to kill for. She groaned as they pulled up in front of the Ritz-Carlton. Do I really need to go upstairs? Your old girlfriend is hard work. Matt grinned and nudged her. Just remember what your boss said. This is a team effort or something like that. This time it was him that reached across to squeeze her leg. After all, you wouldn't leave me alone with just Frank and Greta and my snippy old girlfriend, would you? Just snippy, huh? Rachel scoffed. The car stopped, and this time another FBI support vehicle pulled in about fifty yards behind them. There'd be no bombers getting close this time, 
or so Matt hoped. Matt was first out. He held the door for Rachel and looked up at the towering edifice. I've got a good feeling about this. Rachel looked up as well. You do know she's probably pulling the strings on all of us. I bet even the assistant director is dancing to her tune. Meh, so what? As long as we're all pulling in the same direction. He shut the car door. My curiosity is piqued now. If this woman can help us and keep the authorities all on side, then who are we to argue? Once again, Matt and Rachel found themselves traveling up in the immaculate elevator. This time, as the doors opened, the enormous Greta was waiting for them. She stepped aside to reveal a beaming Eleanor Van Helling. The old woman clasped her hands together. You have some news. Her eyes sparkled. Matt crossed to her and went to gently shake her hand, but she pulled him closer for an air kiss on his cheek. He miscalculated, and his lips touched her flesh. It was powdery dry and smelled of way too much perfume. She pulled back a little. Careful you don't lick all my makeup off, Matthew. Matt felt his face go hot. Sorry. He stepped back and rubbed the powder off his cheek and lips. Eleanor waved a hand behind her, and Greta maneuvered her chair around into the living room. There was a table set for tea and coffee, with cakes and small sandwiches already waiting. It was set for four, but only two chairs were pulled out for Matt and Rachel, and another vacant spot on one side for the wheelchair. They both sat, and Matt immediately began to pile sandwiches and cake onto a plate. Greta tucked Eleanor into the space. She smiled, showing a row of neat little brown teeth. So, tell me everything, and leave nothing out. Rachel and Matt glanced at each other, but Rachel offered her hand to Matt. Over to you, Prof. Okay. He put down half a sandwich. We found something in Canada. Eleanor's eyes slid to him. Clues to the people who killed my Clarence, I hope. I think so, and it's certainly looking like there's a big connection between events now. Matt then told her about the death of Officer Oscar Ojibwe and his deputies, finding the old church and also the dead priest in the basement. He rushed over the beheading and burning of the body, and completely left out the detail of the worms that had seemed to come from inside him. As he spoke, he shifted his eyes to Rachel, who nodded, so he guessed he wasn't betraying any FBI classified information. He cleared his throat. In the footage retrieved from Clarence's, uh, death, we saw the appearance of the two men who were dressed in black. They were never identified from their remains. Matt sat forward. I'm also pretty sure now it was one of their group that threw the grenade into our car. He glanced briefly at Rachel again, and saw her eyes narrow slightly as she listened. He continued. And then again, all the way up at Fort Severn, they were waiting for us. They would have killed us if not for— Matt stopped himself not wanting to even try to describe the ogreish being they had seen to the old woman. If not for what, Matthew? Eleanor tilted her head. We think it might be some sort of cult or secret order, Rachel added. They either killed Father Xavier or got there too late to protect him. She shrugged. Maybe they thought we killed him. Maybe they were also trying to find the secret of the wellspring, hmm? The red tip of Eleanor's tongue peeped out to lick her lips. She craned forward. Well, there's no way to test that theory now. They're all dead. Rachel raised an eyebrow. I checked one of the bodies, and they had scarred themselves with a weird cross. It must be some sort of ancient religious order. 
She pulled her phone out and scrolled to a picture showing a flattened chest with the seared cross. She handed it to Matt. There could have been one on their foreheads as well, but it was too hard to make out due to the trauma. Interesting. Eleanor's eyes narrowed. What sort of order would be prepared to kill so ruthlessly? She eased her tiny frame back into her chair. There are many ancient orders still in existence. Clarence used to deal with some of them in his pursuit of his strange and unique artifacts all around the globe. Freemasons? Rachel asked. Aren't they religious? Nah, they have their own belief system, but it's not really a religion. Matt stared at the image of the cross and rubbed his stubbled chin. And I think they're far older than the Freemasons. And besides, these guys were like professional soldiers, warriors. He tapped the phone. I've seen something like this before. The Knights Templar, Eleanor smiled. They date back to 1129, and even though they were disbanded by the Pope in 1312, they are thought to still exist, and fighting was all they did. That'd make sense, Rachel said, and it would tie in with the crucifix scars on their chests. Matt stared at the picture on Rachel's phone. This is not a crucifix. The cross symbol has been around for thousands of years, and it was first used to signify a crossroad between life and death. And between life and death is eternal existence, Eleanor's eyes blazed. Matt shrugged. In the group of wise magi who visited baby Jesus, it was said that one of them had a tunic bearing the cross symbol. That was well before the crucifix was associated with Christ. Matt looked down at the image. It's hard to make out because the flesh is so severely damaged, but I think it's a pair of keys crossed over each other. Eleanor sighed. I wish Clarence was here. He would know what it all meant. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Matt snorted, and then tapped the small screen. I know this. There is, or was, an ancient order who had a similar crest. Two crossed keys, one representing the power to bind us here on earth, and the other to unlock heaven. Keys? That probably means it can't be that old, then, Rachel said. Matt looked up at her. Are you kidding? Keys and locks are older than you think. The first locks appeared in ancient Babylon over six thousand years ago. Okay, that's old. She sat back. So, who then? The Vatican, Matt said. The Vatican? Rachel looked heavenward. I thought you said it wasn't a crucifix. Matt sat staring at the image for several moments, letting his mind work. But they were just one face of something that was far older. He held up a finger. Hear me out here. The Borgias were the last large and powerful group to bear the crossed keys. But you can trace it all the way back to an ancient warrior race called the Brutians. He opened his hands. Like the Borgian soldiers, they were aggressive, loyal, and fiercely independent, and fought against the Romans defeating them many times. Matt rubbed his chin. The biggest historical anomaly was when they joined forces with Hannibal. Hannibal? Elephants crossing the Alps, Hannibal? Rachel's eyebrows went up. The one and only. Matt nodded to her. When Hannibal invaded Italy, they rose up in support of him. Many couldn't understand why but some theorized that it was only because they wanted to help Hannibal when he was warring with the Romans in defense of Carthage. When Hannibal returned to Africa, the Brutians went with him. Together they kept Rome out of Africa for a hundred years. Matt shrugged. And just like the Borgias, 
After a time, Brutian customs and language just disappeared. It was like they thrived for a while, did the task required of them, and then vanished back to where they came. Or wherever they're hiding now, Eleanor's eyes narrowed. Pieces of a puzzle. There's more. Matt then described the magnificent stained-glass window, and he recounted its age and the clues hidden within the geography and the absence of any landmarks. And that's where we hit a snag, he said glumly. Without knowing the place to start on the map, we have no way of finding where we need to go. Bottom line, we need to get access to some old maps, some very old maps. Old maps? Eleanor's eyes lit up. My dear, I can walk you into the Library of Congress Geography and Map Reading Room today. Not good enough, Matt responded. The maps we're interested in usually inhabit museum libraries and private collections. I just don't have the contacts, and even the FBI has little chance of muscling their way in to get a peek at them, let alone being allowed to examine them. And you think I can? Eleanor smiled, one pencil-lined eyebrow raised. Matt smiled back. No, I know someone as persuasive and charming as you can. He tilted his head and widened his smile. Beside him, Rachel looked away. Your investigations are proceeding. Eleanor folded her bird-like hands in her lap. But I think it may end up taking you offshore now, perhaps even to somewhere on the other side of the world. Her eyes gleamed. Perhaps the maps you seek are there. Her mouth turned down slightly. But just like Clarence found out, our influence does not extend much beyond our borders. That world, even today, is an exotic, dangerous, and very mysterious place. The old woman's eyes widened as she sat straighter in her wheelchair. But where my influence ends, someone else's begins. Matt leaned toward her. You've got something to share with us, haven't you, Eleanor? She reached out one bony hand to place it over Matt's. Never underestimate the power of influence, my dear boy. She turned to look up at Greta, who soundlessly left the room. She returned seconds later escorting a man. Rachel immediately shot to her feet. He was tall, swarthy, and had eyes as dark as coal that moved from Matt to Rachel and then to Eleanor. He came and stood at the edge of the table and bowed slightly. Eleanor waved him to sit down. Now Matt understood why there was another setting at the table. The man's lips just hinted at a smile, and Matt saw that he was not intimidated by Eleanor, and certainly not by himself or Rachel. Eleanor held out a hand to him. Professor Matthew Kearns, Agent Rachel Bromelow. She looked up at Rachel, who was still on her feet. Oh, do sit down, young lady. You look foolish standing there like a clothes rack. She turned back to Matt. I present Mr. Khaled Ibn... He raised a single dark eyebrow. Out of this world. Also top secret, so I'm guessing you heard that one from one of those other places you mentioned. Matt's smile faded. He nodded subtly, and then turned to Rachel. And Agent Bromelow, also nice to meet you. He held out his hand. She gripped it and held on. You wouldn't happen to be Khaled ibn al-Sudairi, nephew of Prince Najif al-Ibn Saud of the House of Saud, would you? One and the same, tenth nephew, he replied smoothly. The House of Saud? Matt straightened in his chair. It was no wonder the guy wasn't overawed by Eleanor Van Helling. He probably could have bought her a hundred times over. 
The Saud family was worth billions. Many, many billions. Holy cow! Matt stuck out his hand again. Khaled laughed and gripped it hard. So you have a map, I hear. He released Matt's hand and then poured himself a small cup of thick, dark coffee. He sipped and waited. Um, hmm. <clears throat> Matt bobbed his head and looked to Rachel. Well, that's classified. Rachel's gaze was direct and professional, as she seemed to slip back into FBI mode. Khaled looked at her apologetically. I already overheard everything. He sipped again. I suggest we join forces, share what we have found. And what have you found? Rachel folded her arms. Would you like to know where I've just come from? Khaled didn't wait for her to even bother guessing. Turkey, where we scaled six mountains looking for the relics of Noah, following some credible information we received. We had found nothing and were due to leave until we scaled an obscure peak called Mount Kardu in the south. He sipped his coffee, his eyes on Rachel. It was there we found something quite startling. Matt leaned forward, feeling like the air had been sucked out of the room as he waited for the man to go on. But Khaled sipped again, in no hurry. Well? Rachel demanded. He replaced his cup on the tiny saucer. An old monastery, hidden and buried under a massive constructed ceiling within the mountain peak. No way. Matt edged forward another inch. Khaled nodded. Inside there was a perfectly preserved body. But there was more. Horrors. I lost some good men. Horrors? Matt asked softly. Khaled waited for a second or two, his lips curling at the corners. Your turn. Matt felt Khaled's gaze slicing right through him. Hmm, okay, well, hang on there, Matt. Rachel reached out and laid a hand on his arm. I'll need to clear this. Consider it cleared. Eleanor's chin jutted toward Rachel momentarily. As Assistant Director Wybrow has already told you, it is in your interest to collaborate, as your own investigations are now at a dead end. Eleanor paused as Rachel's cheeks reddened. Eleanor turned to Matt. Proceed, Matthew. Rachel's lips compressed into a thin line. Matt could tell she was fighting to keep a few hostile sentences behind her lips. He didn't want to land Rachel in any trouble, or for that matter piss her off, but he knew the old woman was right. He looked toward Rachel. It's okay. We need to give to get, right? Rachel's nod was barely perceptible, but it was enough. I guess you heard about the killings, the dead priest and the map hidden within the stained-glass window. Khaled nodded and waited. Then, just like you, there's more. Matt decided how to begin. We also found some weird biological remains. Biological remains? Khaled's brows came together. Go on. Worms, like parasitic nematodes, Possibly that had come from the body of the priest that was burned up and beheaded, Matt said. And according to our analysis, they might have been responsible for cell life extension and regeneration, maybe playing a symbiotic role within the body. He half shrugged. Interesting. Khaled's jaw tightened. In the old monastery, we encountered a similar thing. Worms and they too erupted from the cadaver, millions upon millions of them. They also infected one of our men. He died. Rachel gripped the edge of the table. Describe them. 
thread-like, clear and shining like tiny streaks of glass, Khaled said. They were filling the preserved body to the point that when they exited, the entire body collapsed to nothing. Eleanor's mouth turned down in disgust. Revolting. She shut her eyes and shuddered. Rachel's brows were knitted. We could find no obvious way the worms benefited from their host, other than being housed within them. We thought it was some sort of symbiotic relationship, and we did find that they excreted a human hormone, FGF-21, the one responsible for health and longevity. Longevity? Khaled's smile returned. Then that would be why the sarcophagus identified the body as being that of Shem, the son of Noah. Shem? Matt's eyes were wide. And you said he was identified. How? W was there pictoglyphs, writing? Matt was stunned and sat staring at the man for several seconds. Yes, there was writing, but I couldn't decipher much of it. It was a little like Hebrew but the inscriptions, the sarcophagus design, and its symbolism were lost to me. But I believe the monastery was built just for him. It was a crypt, but even though the historical legend stated the building was destroyed, it was actually hidden by the construction of the roof. Did you? That and something else, worse. Khaled's vision seemed to turn inward. Like I said, I lost good men. Matt leaned forward on his elbows. What did you see? What was it? There was... Khaled paled slightly. There was something in there, the cave. Alive. Huge. It attacked us. Matt felt his own heart begin to race. Something big. Yellow eyes like saucers. Fast. Strong. Khaled lunged forward. You've seen it too. I've seen something. I think it was a Nephilim, a sentinel, Matt said. Rachel shook her head. One of Matt's fallen angels. They're biblical guardians, Matt added. Khaled exhaled. Guarding Shem's body. Yes, it makes sense. The silence stretched for a few seconds before Rachel tilted her head. And I take it you saw the Ark as well? I never said anything about the Ark. Khaled lifted his chin. In fact, I don't think the Ark ever made it to the Ararat or any of the surrounding mountains. That was a story that gained currency when the Bible was written, thousands of years after the actual event. I knew it. Matt wiped some crumbs from his mouth. And I believe sometimes some things are not meant to be discovered. Khaled tilted his head toward Matt. I put it to you, Professor Kearns, that the Ark is not and never was on Mount Ararat. Instead, what lay there was the remains of one of Noah's sons, still looking like he could sit up and talk. Then why didn't he? Matt looked at Rachel. If these worm things are so good at longevity, why wasn't he still alive? After all, the Bible mentions that Noah was fathering children at the age of five hundred and lived to be over nine hundred. Maybe they do somehow consume their host eventually, Khaled said. Maybe after so long Shem had just given up. He sat back. I don't know. The FBI scientists suggested they could possibly be a super-efficient parasite, Rachel said. Maybe they don't even know they're benefiting us, and are just keeping us up and running as a mobile house and food source. The longer we're alive, the longer they have a Meals on Wheels. Yuck, Matt grimaced. Yes, both fascinating and revolting. But the mystery is, why haven't we known about these creatures before? Khaled asked. I bet someone does, and that someone isn't too keen for anyone else to find out. Remember the beheaded and burned bodies and the murdered families. Matt looked back to Rachel. 
and I'm betting they'll do anything to protect their secrets. Well then, Khaled slapped the table. Then we need to know their secrets. Once we find the answers, then they have nothing to protect anymore. And that brings us to our problem. Matt put a few more sandwiches on his plate. We now believe we have a map, or at least a fragment of one. But no points of reference. It could be anywhere in the Middle East, and that's an area you don't exactly go about doing too many exploratories. Khaled snorted. I wouldn't exactly recommend doing too many meanderings in some of your cities after dark either, Professor. Khaled grinned. We're close now. You see, clues are like stepping stones. Our next one is probably right before us. We just need to find it. Rachel sat back. Golly, why didn't we think of that? Jesus, Rachel. Matt scowled at her and turned to Khaled. Go on, what are you thinking? If what we seek is in the past, then that's where we must look. Firstly, let's think about our problem logically and not just biblically. Khaled lifted a glass of water and looked into it. Let's begin with the flood. Logically, huh? Matt rubbed his face. Okay, did it ever really occur? Khaled smiled. Do you really think that a flood submerged the entire world around 5,000 to 4,500 years ago? No, I don't. That period coincided with one of the last interglacial epochs, but computer extrapolations have shown that even if all of the world's ice melted today, it still wouldn't submerge the planetary landmass. Matt sat back. So no, I don't believe there was ever a worldwide deluge. But there probably was something, yes? Khaled's dark eyes gleamed. The story's Genesis. I like your thinking, Matt grinned. There was a flood, an unprecedented one, but maybe it was more localized. Yes, this is what I think. Khaled's grin widened. And I also think I know where that might have been. Matt nudged a stony-faced Rachel. That's it, I'm hooked. Khaled sat forward. Unexpectedly finding Shem's body made me wonder what we really knew about the great man himself, what was real, what was fable, and what was nothing more than historical distortion. So I did some research. He turned to Rachel. What do you know about Noah, Agent Bromelow? I mean, really, no. She shook her head slowly. Matt's told me a little but really just the Sunday school stuff. The guy lived somewhere in the Middle East with some sort of farmer, built the ark, animals two by two, and final resting place was Mount Ararat. She gave him a lopsided grin. Eleanor had Greta wheel her chair closer to them. The Saudi man nodded to her, and then turned back to Rachel. Even in that summary there is so much wrong. You see, Noah was never a poor man, and further, many people immediately place all biblical references in the Middle East, which is not the case for Noah. Africa, Matt pointed gun-like. I mean, the Bible says that Abraham's ancestors came out of Africa. Noah is one of those ancestors, right? Exactly. Between 5,000 and 4,500 years ago, it was the time of the great ancient kingdoms. Noah was a descendant of a proto-Saharan ruler, and these kings of the wetlands controlled the major water systems of Lake Chad, the Nile, the Tigris, and Euphrates. The interconnected waterways were their highways and trade routes. In other words, Noah would have been extremely wealthy, familiar with boats, and likely had a large fleet. Rachel scoffed. So he was already a boat builder, and I suppose he also had herds of animals hanging around. It's history that is speaking now, Agent. Let us listen to it. 
He waited a few seconds until she sighed and nodded before he went on. In answer to your question, the Proto-Saharan rulers such as Noah kept menageries with male and female specimens for breeding purposes. There are your animals. Shit, Rachel muttered. I think Africa is a good place to start, but where? Matt asked. All I know is it's somewhere referred to as Bornu, the land of Noah. And I believe that's Lake Chad. Khaled sat back. Lake Chad? In Chad? Rachel's jaw dropped. Jesus, could you pick a more inhospitable country? Stop being a little princess, Eleanor snorted in derision. I know that area and toured there in the sixties. Lake Chad is shallow and only about five hundred square miles. It's little more than a marsh in some areas. That's right, today it is. But hear me out. Khaled grinned. Remember what I said. Let history guide us. Travel back five thousand years, and what do we now see? Africa was much wetter, greener, Matt said eagerly. Exactly. Africa was a paradise, and yes, much wetter than today, due to the African geological rifts that generated watersheds and rain-shadowed troughs over the continent. Your own American satellite photographs reveal striations in the geology that tell us that Lake Chad was more than just a huge body of water then, but instead it was a magnificent inland sea. At its peak, it was the largest of four Saharan Paleo lakes and would have covered an area of nearly 400,000 square miles. He leaned forward. That's larger than the Caspian Sea is today. And the land in that area is very flat, Matt nodded, perfect for flooding. Even thousands of years later, during the time of Noah, the lake still had a surface area greater than that of your Lake Superior, and with a depth of around six hundred feet. And remember, Noah controlled the waterways of the entire Lake Chad Basin. He would have been like a king, Matt whispered. And if there was a surge in rainfall and significant flooding, the inland sea would have become an ocean again, turned back into its prehistoric version of itself. It would have seemed big enough to flood the world, or at least their world. Yes, Professor Kearns, yes, indeed. Khaled eased back into his seat. There's a reason no one has ever found Noah, his great ark, or his wellspring of life. It's because we have all been looking in the wrong place. Khaled looked at the faces of the trio. As he expected, the FBI agent's expression held suspicion. Professor Kearns's was open, interested, and bursting with curiosity, just as he'd hoped from a field-working academic. But the older woman was harder to read. Her eyes were half-lidded, and sometimes when he thought she had dozed off, he realized she had only closed her eyes to slits and was watching them all closely. Sounds like you're well on top of all this, so why do you need us? Rachel waved away a sandwich Matt held out to her. Khaled shrugged. My expertise is more that of an enthusiastic amateur, whereas Professor Kearns is at the top of expert level. When we were down in the monastery, I saw ancient writing on the sarcophagus lid and sides. I could read next to none of it. I expect that there will be more clues, and we cannot afford to miss or misunderstand a single one. He held his arms wide. I'm smart enough to know when I need help, and humble enough to ask for it. He shared his most charming smile. I need your help. It is supposed to. He shrugged. Then please do not blame an old man for wanting to live a little longer.
Eleanor Van Helling's eyes had shifted to Matt and seemed to glow with excitement. And now we are back where we started, still needing a goddamn map. Like Calad said, we need to let history guide us. Matt hiked his shoulders. We need a world map, old but with high detail. They're very rare, but I do have one in mind. Go on. Khaled raised his chin. It's Roman, the Poitinger map, or Tabula Poitingeriana. It's one of the earliest road maps of what was called the Cursus Publicus, the road network of the Roman Empire. I'm no expert, but the Romans weren't even around at the time of Noah, Rachel said. The Poitinger map, I know it well, Khaled chuckled. It is kept at the Austrian National Library in Vienna. The original map upon which it is based probably dates to the 4th or 5th century, and was itself based on a map prepared by Agrippa during the reign of the Emperor Augustus. The very one. Matt nodded enthusiastically. We need to examine it and try and line it up with the fragment of map from the Fort Severn window. Good. Eleanor smacked her lips. I think I might be able to get you in there. I have contacts. Yes. Matt clapped his hands together. That version is worthless. Khaled's gaze was direct. What? Matt's eyes widened. It covers most of Europe, much of the Middle East, and even down to North Africa. Yes, it does, but just the tip of Africa which was a Roman province established after they finally defeated the mighty Carthage nation in the Third Punic War. Rachel tilted her head back. Close but no cigar. What's the next option? No, we're on the right track. Khaled stabbed a finger onto the table. Over the millennia, the Poitinger map has been copied and changed hands many times. In fact, the map presently held in the museum is a 13th century copy and covers Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, Persia, and India. But when the original was purchased by Prince Eugene of Savoy in the early 1700s for a significant sum, there was another bidder who offered just as much. Khaled lifted his small coffee cup and sipped, and then carefully replaced it on its saucer. There was breathless silence, and he knew he had them. The anonymous seller found out something interesting about both the potential buyers. Prince Eugene had never seen the map, and so had no idea what it really contained or what he was potentially buying. And the other buyer was only interested in certain portions. He smiled. Matt tilted his head back to laugh out loud. Of course. He made both sales. He split it up. Yes. Khaled slapped the table. This crafty seller decided to maximize his profit, and so he removed a portion and sold it separately. The Greater Africa portion, Matt grinned, that contained the Chad Lake Basin. Khaled nodded. And I'm betting you know where it is, Rachel added. And I'm also betting you've known about it all along. She scoffed. Why were we even playing this game? Khaled lowered his eyes, but the corners of his mouth turned up. Yes, forgive me. I hoped the information might be of assistance. Now I know it will. I've never heard of this African portion. Eleanor's tiny brown teeth were clamped. And where is it now? The current owner might be persuaded to allow us to take a peek. Khaled watched their faces. Matt was perched on the edge of his seat, but Rachel looked wary. Who and where? she asked. Khaled sat back, his palms up. My home. Saudi Arabia? Rachel's nose wrinkled. Of course. My uncle is also a collector of antiquities, 
and bought the Afric Fragmenta Tabulae Antiquae on the black market decades ago. I've seen it and believe it might bring us closer to what we seek. Ship it here under my protection, Eleanor said softly. Khaled pulled in a cheek. I'm afraid his goodwill would not extend to that type of risk. Matt folded his arms. I'm not up for a trip to the Middle East. Agent Bromelo glared at him. Not exactly a place where... Ah, yes, I'd heard. Your recent time in Syria. Khaled scrutinized Matt. I know that has colored your perception of our region. But, Professor, I assure you, where we will be heading is an oasis of calm, modernity, and luxury. Matt didn't look convinced, so Khaled pressed him harder. You have my word that you will be protected by a small army and never have to set foot outside the city. Khaled held his hands out, palms up. It'll be little more than a lavish holiday. Rachel glared at him. In a place where women aren't even allowed to drive cars. Khaled spun at her. And you had over 13,000 gun-related murders last year, Agent Bromelow. We had 28. He shared his most sympathetic smile. We are slowly moving our population to being more tolerant of sexual equality. But we must be patient and pragmatic with our people. All I ask is you be tolerant of our faults and patient as well. She sighed. Will I need to cover my head? It might be wise. He gave her a half-smile, but Rachel's nostrils flared in return. Matt sat back, and his vision seemed to have turned inward. Khaled could see he was struggling with the decision. He reached out to grip his wrist and was surprised to find the professor trembling. Professor, a few days, and you get to see the oldest map fragment in the world. Saudi royalty will protect you, and I might add you will be safer there than you would here. I know about the attack downstairs. Gah! Matt threw his head back and grimaced as though in pain. Khaled noticed the FBI woman blanch. Okay, okay, Matt said finally, and damn my professional curiosity. Excellent, Khaled clapped once. I can be ready, Eleanor said. You'll be ready? Matt squinted at the old woman. Khaled held his arms wide. You see, Agent Bromelow, Professor, it seems the older generation are made of sterner stuff, both physically and mentally, than we fragile persons today. Greta returned and laid a hand on Eleanor's shoulder. Matt noticed that the fingers were long and strong and gently rubbed her blouse. Eleanor looked up and nodded. And Greta will be accompanying me, of course. Greta? Matt straightened in his seat. Eleanor looked at Matt from under lowered brows. My Greta has been with me since she was a little girl. I rescued her from an East German orphanage in the sixties, and in a way she is like my daughter. She looked up at the hulking woman. And so much more. Her eyes narrowed. Greta is coming. When? Matt asked the Saudi. Tomorrow morning, first thing, Khaled said. I'll have a private jet waiting for us at Teterboro. Private jet? Matt looked at Rachel and raised his eyebrows. Nice. What sort of jet? Greta asked. Mrs. Van Helling has special needs. Her eyes on Khaled were like pale lasers. Khaled smiled. A Gulfstream G550. It has four living areas and seating for eighteen people. Also full medical facilities and ramps for your chair, Mrs. Van Helling. The G550 will be just fine, Matt grinned. 
Then we're done. Six a.m. will be on the runway. Khaled stood up and bowed to Eleanor Van Helling, and then to Rachel. He shook Matt's hand, and then leant in close to his ear, and spoke softly in Arabic. Trust no one. What did he say? Rachel asked, as soon as they were in the back of their car. Matt saw the creases between her eyes deepen as she waited for his answer. Khaled couldn't possibly have meant her, and more likely referred to the people who were tossing grenades into their windows, or maybe even Eleanor, or that frightful female bodyguard of hers. And yet he didn't say be careful, he said trust no one. There was a difference. Matt shrugged it off. Nothing important, he just wanted to know if we needed extra security, the bomb blast and all. Rachel studied him for a moment, before settling back into her seat. You have all the protection you need. Me. Yeah, I can't thank you enough, Matt said sarcastically. I mean, if it wasn't for you, I'd be frittering my life away on some sandy beach right now. My biggest worry would be sunburn. Matt sighed, looking away. You know, I shouldn't even be involved in this anymore. He turned back to her. I think I should sit this one out, so... Rachel looked like she'd been slapped. Seriously, Matt, she said, raising her voice. We both nearly died. You saved my life, and it's not over yet. Now you want to kick us, me, into the long grass. Matt was silent a moment, not knowing what to say. Okay, he said quietly. It's just... He trailed off. Why do you keep trying to leave? she asked, her blue eyes pinning him. Matt looked away first. He rubbed his hand across his face. I want to help, Rachel. I do. But some of the things I've been through, they never leave you, you know? Rachel put her hand to his cheek and turned him back to face her. When I went to you, after the bomb went off, I thought you were dead. Dead. He stared into her face. Her blue eyes seemed to pulse. And then, when you saved me at the church... She bit her lip. I'm not as tough as you think. I can't do this without you. Forget I said what I did. Matt put his hand on hers. I'm not going anywhere. She pulled him into her room, left the lights off and grabbed his shirt front, dragging him toward the living room chair, and then pushed him back into it. Matt smiled in the dark. She kicked off her shoes and rose up, her hands on the armrests of the chair and leaning forward. He smelled her perfume and was intoxicated by it. Rachel kept coming, and her lips just brushed his ear. Matt felt the tiniest flick of her tongue on his lobe. Her voice was just a whispered breath in his ear. Rachel moved her face to his and ran the tip of her tongue along his lips, top and bottom. It was the most sensual thing he'd felt in a long while. He reached up to encircle the back of her head and pulled her closer. She came fully onto his lap and their mouths locked. His tongue now fought with hers in their mouths, and she tasted like cinnamon and soda. She pulled open his shirt as she moved back and forth on his lap for a moment, before it became an urgent race to pull clothing free and fling it to the side. Matt crept from Rachel's hotel room around 4 a.m. He was tired and now sore, but in a good way. He smiled. For all her brusque toughness, she had her heart in the right place. He couldn't help it. He liked her a lot. He had plenty of time now to shower and shave, grab his stuff and meet Rachel in the car downstairs at 5.15. He wasn't sure exactly what he needed to bring, but Khaled had told him not to worry so much, as he had to only ask for something 
and it would be obtained within the hour for him. He threw a few items of clothing, a shaver, and toothbrush into his case, and then went to stuff the folder containing his pictures of the Fort Severn stained-glass window in on top. He couldn't resist one last look, and dragged out the main image. To the untrained eye, it was a few contours, different colors, a few dots and squiggly lines. But he knew there was a small piece of coastline, and the geography was distinctive enough that it could be recognized if they just found the broader context. And most importantly, he knew those squiggly lines had to be a trail. I know you're in there, he thought, and then jammed it all into his case. Matt sucked in a breath and then let it out slowly. The longevity, the worms, the people in the shadows, the giant thing looming in through the window. It all gave him a knotted feeling in his gut. He'd been here before, and it never turned out well. He sat on the edge of his bed and stared off into the dark corners of his room. Matt shuddered, feeling his nerves run away on him at the thought of going back to the Middle East. He knew he was damaged goods, and even getting involved in something that was turning out to have an element of the mysterious, not to mention deadly dangerous, was insanity. Then, as if dropping from the sky, the mysterious Khaled arrives to help them advance their investigation. It was 5.10 a.m. when he exited the revolving doors to find Rachel already waiting by the car. She looked fresh, alert, and professional as always, and not at all like someone who had been vigorously shagging only a few hours ago. Sleep well? she asked, and opened the car door. No, but had some great dreams. He jumped in and slid across. Rachel took a last look up and down the street, and then ducked in behind him, slamming the door. That was no dream. She smiled at him, and Matt grinned back. Rachel cleared her throat and smoothed a hair behind her ear. Matt had the impression she was putting her professional game face back on. What do you think about Khaled? Seems too good to be true, him turning up just when we needed him. He watched her nose wrinkle. I don't trust him. She turned to the window. Or, for that matter, Eleanor or Greta. She turned, one corner of her mouth quirking up. Still not one hundred percent sure about you yet, either. He remembered Khaled's whispered warning. This was turning out to be one fine working relationship, he thought. We've got to work as a team, he shrugged. No choice. We're not a team, Matt. Rachel stared into his face. We're just a group all riding on the same train. When we get to our destination, and then we'll see who gets off where. Chapter 11 Eleanor and Greta met them at the airport, and Matt watched with amazement as the big woman lifted Eleanor like a child and carried her up the stairs. He was going to offer to help, but he had the feeling Greta could have carried him as well if he'd asked. The flight was long, fifteen hours, and after crossing the Atlantic and then refueling at Heathrow, London, they were back in the air without disembarking. Matt hadn't felt claustrophobic at all. The entire cabin was theirs, and the seats were in a pod-type arrangement, facing each other and with a small coffee table before them. He and Rachel were left to themselves, as for most of the flight Eleanor dozed and Greta read a book, not even interested in looking in their direction. Khaled was up in the pilot's cabin, doing some of the flying. The life of the rich, Matt thought, and sighed with envy. The G-550 jet climbed higher as they crossed Israel and Jordan before entering Saudi Arabia. Looking down from a cloudless sky, Matt saw that the land was much greener than he expected. 
The cabin door opened. Khaled smiled widely and came and joined them on one of the vacant chairs. Everything all right? Everything's great. Matt pointed to the window. So much green. Khaled looked out past him. Yes, the al Kanafa, a natural wildlife sanctuary. It's several hundred miles wide. But it'll be behind us soon, and then we enter the deserts. How much further to go? Rachel asked. Another few hundred miles, maybe an hour. We'll pass over the cities of Buryada, and then Az-Zulfi, and then on to Riyadh. He grinned as he stood. You'll love it. He looked down the cabin to Eleanor and Greta, but seeing the old lady asleep, he nodded and left them for the front of the plane again. Matt turned to the window. As Khaled had told them, the green was now behind them as they entered the deserts, and now there was nothing but yellows and browns, ancient and parched, for mile upon mile. Matt put a hand on the glass window. Even in the scrubbed and chilled atmosphere of the luxurious jet, he could almost feel the dry heat emanating from the landscape. In another half hour, rising up in the distance like an Atlantean city from an ocean of sandhills, was the Saudi Arabian capital, Riyadh. It was large but not sprawling, and home to nearly six million people. The city reminded Matt of crystals that had been grown in a petri dish, lifting higher and higher as you approached its center. There, thrusting upwards like a large sea creature, breaching the water's surface to snatch something from the air, was the kingdom center skyscraper that rose up forty-one stories. The sun glinted off its polished windows like the million faceted faces of a jewel. Khaled rejoined them. Coming up on Riyadh International Airport. Rachel turned her head. I would have thought being a member of the royal family you'd have your own airport. He shrugged. The king and many of the princes have their own airports, but their security would not let us come anywhere near them. If we tried without authorization, well... He grinned. They have Israeli-designed surface-to-air missiles. They never miss. Khaled peered down at the main airport that looked like a band of interlocking silver scales. But we do get our own runway. He got to his feet. Buckle up. I'm going to take her in. He looked down the cabin at the sleeping Eleanor. She had a photograph of Clarence held tight to her chest. Maybe we should wake her soon, yes? Or you should. Khaled grinned and gave them a small salute before heading back to the cockpit. The plane glided in, and its wheels touched the tarmac with a feather-like kiss. Khaled obviously knew what he was doing. The brakes engaged and woke Eleanor Van Helling, and like a magician, Greta produced a small glass of orange juice with a bent straw and held it to the woman's lips. Matt wondered how long the old woman had left in her, as she seemed little more than a bundle of sticks swaddled in Prada and Chanel. He turned to place his face closer to the window edge to see forward along the tarmac, and spotted that they were being directed toward a smaller, shell-shaped building, and half a dozen cars were driving out to meet them. Here comes the welcoming committee, he said to the glass. Khaled brought the plane in to a gentle stop and handed over the post-flight check downwork to the pilot. He came through the cabin to unlock the door and pushed it open, lowering the steps. A single man in a suit bounded up, bowed slightly to Khaled, and the pair spoke rapidly in Arabic. Khaled turned. Customs and immigration. The man efficiently checked their passports, entered the information into a tablet, stamped their paperwork, and then bowed again to Khaled before vanishing back down the steps. You see? Matt grinned. That's the way to do it. No cues and they come to us. 
Rachel peered out the window at the man scurrying away. He'd probably be beaten if he insulted a Saudi royal. What about an American FBI agent? Matt watched as their bags were taken toward a line of waiting diamond black, tank-like Mercedes SUVs, each with two bulky men in dark sunglasses standing by their side, bodyguards or small army. Just how safe is it? he wondered. Khaled waved to them from the door. Let's go. Matt got to his feet, followed by Rachel. He first went to help Greta with Eleanor, but the tall woman waved him away like he was an annoying bug. It was midday, and the first thing Matt noticed was the difference in the atmosphere as he passed from the synthetic cool air of the jet to the hot dryness of the Saudi sunshine. He winced as it actually stung his exposed skin. He cursed his lack of foresight for not packing a baseball cap, and he'd put it top of his list for things to order. He inhaled the smells. Even though they were at the edge of an international airport, he smelled spices, heating sand and rock, and something sweet that he later found out was fermenting dates from the lines of palms outside. Matt had been in many deserts in his life, dozens, and they all smelled the same, especially the ones that had been dry for thousands of years. But the main difference here was that the other smell that floated in the air was intangible but obvious to the eye instead of olfactory nerves. It was of the filthy lucre. Money. The car parks and streets were full of Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Aston Martin, and too many Rolls Royce to count. This way, quickly. Khaled hurried them to the cars. The huge men opened the doors and then immediately looked left and right, turning their heads slowly to take in their surroundings. Matt could see in the back of one of the SUVs there was a rocket launcher, RPG, out of its case and ready. These guys played for keeps, he thought, and didn't know whether all the defenses made him feel safer or more nervous. More nervous, he decided, and swallowed with a dry throat. Khaled escorted Eleanor and Greta to one of the huge cars and spoke to them for a moment before their door was shut. Matt, Rachel, and Khaled then went into the other, with the last SUV seeming to be just for the RPG in their luggage. Matt could also see more people jammed inside, and guessed his thoughts on this being a small army ready to spring at any threat was pretty accurate. Rachel also noticed, Fine, as long as we follow the instructions of our security teams. Rachel turned to Matt. Remember how he said you'd be safe here? Matt groaned as the door was shut heavily, and the security guards also entered their vehicles. He wondered at the extra paneling, and he tapped the glass. Bulletproof? Khaled in the front seat turned and smiled. Yes, and an external layer of aluminum oxynitride, much lighter and tougher than traditional polymers can stop fifty-caliber armor-piercing rounds, he turned to Rachel. Courtesy of the U.S. military. We get your oil and you can have our tech, she smiled tightly. Good deal. In another few moments they were outside the airport and speeding down the wide, perfectly smooth road. The cars seemed to glide, strong, stable, and silent. But Matt still felt on edge, as the guards and the driver's eyes kept darting from side to side, never missing anything. Where to first? Matt asked. Prince Najif Ali bin Saud's northern residence, Khaled grinned. He might just be able to fit a few extra guests in. They were soon outside of the main hub of the city, and then entered another small built-up area. How far to the prince's residence? Rachel had donned her dark glasses. 
We're within it now. Khaled pointed to the small city. All this land is the prince's Riyadh estate. The fleet of vehicles slowed as they came to a boom gate, and half a dozen men in uniform with automatic weapons fanned out. Matt could see that there were machine guns mounted atop two taller structures. Their guns weren't pointed at them, but the men were alert and ready. Khaled motioned to the desert out in front of the huge walls. There are motion sensors, thermal signature detectors, and a fleet of fast-attack helicopters, as well as a small army of ex-special forces. We'll be safe here. He wound down his window as a large, bald man approached. Khaled greeted him in Arabic, and it was clear the two knew each other. They shook hands, as the huge guard obviously welcomed him back. Khaled pointed to each of his guests, and then turned and requested their tinted windows be dropped so he could take a look at them. Matt and Rachel complied, and the big guy's eyes expertly passed over them, lingering for a few moments longer on Rachel. He slapped Khaled on the shoulder, and then waved them on, speaking rapidly into a walkie-talkie as the boom lifted and the procession moved into the main compound. Holy shit! Matt's jaw dropped. It was like another country. Sprinklers fanned the verdant grass with peacock tails of water that sparkled iridescent in the sunshine. There were palm trees, olive trees, and orange trees, all positioned carefully to create forest-like stands and rose-covered gazebos were tucked in and around secret spots for private prayer or just relaxing. The road continued on, and they had to travel another half-mile before they even reached the first of the buildings and yet another large gate. This time they were ready for the entourage, and the gate lifted for them as they approached. Khaled swung in his seat. For you lot, hmm. He rubbed his chin for a moment before snapping his fingers. Either Japanese garden, Tahiti theme, or perhaps an English forest. He grinned. Tahiti, I think. He swung back around, pointing his driver to one of the offshoot avenues. Matt raised his brows at Rachel. Tahiti? As they passed by different residence modules surrounding the main complex, Matt now saw what Khaled was referring to. Each of the modules was designed around a different theme. One had raked stone beds, weeping willows, and peach blossom trees. There was a small stream with a tiny wooden bridge running over it. It would have been right at home somewhere on the outskirts of Tokyo. The next module was theirs, and entering the grounds there was lush jungle, big pools of clear blue water, and huge blooming frangipani and hibiscus trees. Matt could even see a few parrots arguing in among the foliage. I don't believe it. Your uncle even has parrots in the trees. She turned. Why don't they fly away? Khaled shrugged. To where? There is hundreds of miles of sandy desert all around us. He showed her a line of perfect teeth. Some pretty birds grow to love their cage, yes? She groaned, and Khaled pointed at another peacock roaming the grounds. My uncle believes in authenticity. He has traveled many times to rainforests, to Japan and many other places in the world. If some part of the world takes his fancy, he will try and reproduce it here, so he can enjoy it over and over again. It's magnificent, Matt said. He wiped his brow, the outside heat now closing in on him. I hope you, Agent Bromelo, and Mrs. Van Helling will enjoy it here. He turned to watch one of his huge bodyguards open the door so Greta could lift the old woman from the SUV and lower her into her wheelchair. Will we get to meet the prince? Rachel asked. 
Of course. At dinner tonight, 8 p.m., a car will come for you. If you need anything at all, there are multilingual servants on hand. Matt nudged Rachel. We got servants. Khaled waved over his shoulder and slid back into the car. Matt watched him go as he slowly unbuttoned his now sticking shirt. Did you see the swimming pool? Rachel looked over her shoulder to where Eleanor and Greta were just disappearing into their part of the mansion. So my choice is, I can either go and make small talk with an angry old lady who probably thinks I'm a waste of space, or I can go for a cool swim in a Tahiti-style swimming pool. She turned, tapping her chin. Golly, what to do, what to do? Matt waited, grinning. Rachel started to unbutton her shirt. Matt and Rachel swam, and then fucked, and then swam some more. Matt could have happily spent a week here, weeks even, doing nothing but eating, swimming, and having great sex with the limber FBI agent. By 6.30 in the evening, Matt had stepped out of his shower and walked into his bedroom to find racks of clothing waiting for him. There were lightweight suits, sports jackets, and half a dozen pairs of shoes, all in his size. He guessed his chinos, t-shirt, and deck shoes just weren't going to cut it when he met the prince. He turned the collar back on one of the suits. Holy crap, Zegna. He whistled. Khaled was right about anything they wanted or needed would be made available to them. He was paid quite well as a Harvard professor but that never extended to buying Italian suits. He pulled a crisp white shirt from a hanger and slid it on. Cool, brand new, and it felt great. He grabbed a blue, single-breasted jacket and slipped it on. The fit was so good, he decided he looked sharper than he had in years, and that was before he even put pants on. I am so keeping this outfit he whispered to his reflection. He dressed quickly, socks then shoes so highly polished they reflected the overhead lights. He stood and practiced buttoning and unbuttoning the jacket, tried one hand in the pocket or not, and then checked left side and right side view. He swept his longish hair back and nodded. Oh, yeah. Matt looked at his watch. 7.45 p.m. Khaled was picking them up at 8, and he decided to wait out front, in among the lush tropical gardens. He grabbed his folder of information, and then stepped out of his apartment. It was still warm and light, but the sun was nearing the horizon. It would be twilight for a while. He expected sundown to be right on 8 p.m. He sat down on a wooden bench just under a palm frond and leaned back, throwing both arms out wide on the bench back. I've had worse field trips, he mused. He breathed in the warm, flower-perfumed air and let his mind wander. It was hard to reconcile the lush paradise setting with the knowledge that only a few miles away was the start of the desert. Hundreds of miles of sandy or rocky dryness, where temperatures could rise to well above a hundred degrees, day in, day out. Where's our taxi? His head snapped round. Rachel stood on the step, smiling and wearing a long, body-hugging black dress and killer heels. She slowly turned. You like? Yeah, I like a lot. Matt felt his heart jump. They even had a makeup artist come in to see me. She nodded, her lips turned up in a small smile. I think I could get used to this life. Matt was still admiring her shape. It'd spoil you, Agent Bromelow. Oh, I think I'd be able to suffer it with good humor. Rachel came and sat beside him. Matt checked his watch. 
Still five minutes to go. He turned to watch a couple of small peach-faced parrots bickering in a tree beside them. Do you know much about Prince Najif? Rachel asked. I did a little research, but don't know that much, really. He shrugged. Worth billions, part of the Saudi royal family, and fourth in line for the throne. The guy has a degree in engineering, studied in America, and is apparently ruthless in business. He's quite the local hero. Yeah. From our security perspective, we have a strong relationship with the Saudis. They're a supporter of U.S. policy, but paradoxically also fund many of the schools that turn out to be breeding grounds for anti-West extremists. Her smile faded. Best left up to the politicians to worry about. At exactly one minute to eight p.m., two long black cars glided up to the front of their building. As if by magic, Greta appeared, pushing Eleanor Van Helling's wheelchair. Where do you think she was hiding? Rachel whispered. Matt leaned closer to her. I think she's in her stealth chair tonight. Matt noticed that both women wore evening dresses to their ankles. Eleanor was heavily made up and looked like a sun-dried, overdressed child. But the outfit Greta wore did nothing to hide the woman's muscular shoulders. He also saw that both women wore shalas, a longish headscarf that went over the head and swept over the shoulders. Uh-oh. Matt turned to Rachel. Do you think you should be wearing one of those? Yeah, right. And maybe next time they're in Texas, I'll ask them to wear a ten-gallon hat. She folded her arms. Matt laughed, stood, and held out his hand to her. Let's go. Our carriage awaits. A driver got out and held the door. Matt and Rachel climbed in and slid across on the leather seats of the second car. The limousine was new, and there was a set of crystal decanters in holders waiting for them. Brandy? Matt poured himself one. Really? She curled her lip. You're going to drink that? Sure, why not? He sniffed the tumbler's contents. Single malt, and I'm betting very fine. We're going to meet a prince of Saudi Arabia a kingdom that's one of the biggest theocratic, patriarchal, conservative societies on earth. I'm pushing it by not covering my hair. She nodded to his glass. But you, sir, are asking for trouble meeting him with booze on your breath. I really want this. Matt looked at the glass and made his hand tremble theatrically. Is this where it's my turn to mention that ten-gallon hat thing? She looked at him deadpan. Okay, okay. He replaced the glass on the tray. Definitely on the way home, then. Foot patrols. Rachel pointed to several groups of armed men, with large dogs weaving through the small stands of trees. There were also camera poles everywhere that probably had thermal and infrared vision. She grunted in approval. I guess nothing's going to be creeping up on us here. They soon turned into a long, wide road that had a Californian feel with palm trees down its center, and at the end was a huge mansion with Roman columns rising three stories in the air. More security, she pointed. On top of the building, there were anti-aircraft batteries peeking out from underneath sandy-colored camouflage netting. Once again, the boat-sized car sailed to a stop, and the door was pulled open. This time, Khaled was waiting for them on the steps, leaning forward to talk to the diminutive Eleanor Van Helling. When Matt and Rachel pulled up, he waved and nodded appreciatively as they departed their car. He clapped his hands together. You both look magnificent. I think it's your taste in clothing that's magnificent. Matt opened the jacket. Fits perfectly. Khaled bobbed his head. 
Needs a bit of tailoring for you, but the size was right. He clasped his hands together, but still made no move to lead them in. He looked quickly at Rachel's hair, his smile dropping a little. Just a few quick protocol things that I also mentioned to Mrs. Van Helling. The prince is a traditionalist. Ms. Bromelow, as a single woman, you must not expect him to shake your hand. It's best if neither of you make any attempt to lay your hands on him at all. He shrugged. His guards may intervene if they think you are trying to invade his space. Right. A muscle in Rachel's jaw twitched. Fine with me, Matt said. Good, then this way. Khaled bowed and then took them through. They all passed through a metal detector. Matt was patted down by a huge man wearing gloves, and Rachel, Greta, and Eleanor by a scarf-wearing woman, who expertly ran her hands up and down Rachel's lithe figure and then quickly peeked in her clutch bag. Greta had to help Eleanor to her feet, so the wheelchair could be x-rayed, and Matt noticed that none of the security stages applied to Khaled, who passed by untouched. They walked down a hallway, with paintings of past royalty on the walls, many holding curved sabers or sitting on thrones, and then entered one of the many drawing rooms. Matt was pleasantly surprised, as he expected floor-to-ceiling gleaming metals and polished marble that displayed great wealth but no taste. Instead, it was a room with islands of plants, Chippendale furniture, and magnificent eighteenth-century antiques that blended perfectly with their surroundings. Against one wall, a line of waiters stood ready with small, interesting things on plates. There were dozens of other people in the room, many wearing the red-and-white checked kefia headdress and thob robes. Matt noticed there were no women at all. Khaled nodded to a few but made no move to introduce them. Stagnite? Rachel said, casting her eye around the room. Jesus! She whispered as the men stared hard at her. Who are they? Matt asked. Khaled shrugged dismissively. Some lesser relatives, administrators, or people needing approval from the prince for capital transfers, weddings, business ventures, or the like. Nothing related to what we are interested in. The huge double doors at the end of the room opened, and a group of men came through. At their center was a small, bearded old man. He was nearly eclipsed by a huge figure beside him who was stuffed into a black suit. The giant kept his arm jutted to the side, near the old man, and just as Matt wondered why, the old man teetered for a moment and then quickly reached out to grasp the arm beside him. The big guy obviously doubled as bodyguard and walking frame. The prince, Khaled whispered. The prince wore a white headdress with the black rope of an agel around his crown. His robes were a blinding white, and though the skin of his face had the gray hue of age now, it would have been coffee dark when he was younger. A large nose completed the image of a true prince of a desert kingdom. He stood atop the step, nodding to individuals who bowed, some deeply. The prince's eyes moved to Khaled, then Matt, and finally Rachel. He ignored Greta completely, but looked to Eleanor Van Helling and nodded briefly. Prince Najif came down the steps and walked slowly toward them, an arm held up, with some of his robe draped over it. He stopped about a dozen feet from them, and Khaled bowed deeply speaking an honorific in Arabic. Prince Najif held out his hand, and Khaled kissed its back, and then straightened. Khaled then half-turned to stand by the prince. He first motioned toward Matt. 
Professor Matthew Kearns of Harvard University. He then moved along to each of them. Eleanor Van Helling of the New York Van Hellings. Agent Rachel Bromelow, FBI. The prince spoke softly to Eleanor, and Matt was surprised to hear the old woman reply in perfect Arabic. The prince offered her a small smile, but didn't spare even half a glance for Rachel. He stepped closer to Matt. I understand you are a professor of languages and ancient writing. His dark eyes were steady. Matt felt the eyes of the room on him, and he nodded. It has been my passion and career for many years now, he bowed slightly. You've come a long way to see my map, or at least the portion of it that isn't locked away in a dusty old museum vault, he grinned. What value is there in beauty or knowledge if it isn't shared? Matt bowed again. Sharing it is a gift. It is both an honor and a pleasure, sir. There is a price. He shook a finger at Matt. A price. You will join me at dinner and sit at my side, and you will tell me everything you have learned about the prophet Noah's wellspring of life. My pleasure, your highness, Matt beamed. The prince turned away to speak to more of his guests, and Matt turned to Rachel and raised his eyebrows. Oh, please. Rachel looked pained. You did everything but kiss his ring. He grinned. I'm hoping to be adopted. They then followed the crowd into a large banquet hall with an enormous table that was curved like a horseshoe. The guests sat around its outside with the prince at the center, so everyone could see him. Waiter after waiter brought silver cloches to the table, whipping the lids away to reveal mouth-watering roasts of different birds, mutton, beef, and then plates of vegetables and fruit. There were also pitchers of water, juice, teas, and coffee, and some sort of warm honey drink that Matt had never tasted before, but was delicious. Matt was at the center, just to the right of the prince. Khaled immediately to the prince's left, and fanning out to each side of the royal were the other junior members of his family, some businessmen, and then Rachel and Eleanor right at the end, both of whom wore stormy expressions. Greta had obviously been asked to eat somewhere else. No servants allowed, Matt guessed. Matt tried to catch Rachel's eye but she seemed intent on looking carefully at all the faces at the table. The waiters offered their trays to the prince first, and he pointed at one or the other, selecting choice portions from many. Once done, everyone else tucked in. In no time, Matt's plate was piled high, with everything from duck to slow-roasted mutton and some sort of seasoned bread plus an enormous side plate of tropical fruits. He noticed the old man's plate was near empty, and he picked at small portions of meat and fruit, popping them into his mouth, chewing joylessly and wheezing as he ate. He wiped his lips and then leaned toward Matt. Is it real, Professor, this wellspring of life? Matt turned to the man, and up close, he could see the white of his eyes carried a tinge of yellow. Liver problems, he guessed. It confirmed to him why a frail old man, one who was wealthy beyond Croesus, would be interested in the idea of being able to claw back an extra few years. His eyes slid to Eleanor Van Helling, who was staring directly back at him. He nodded to her, but she never changed her gaze remaining snake-like in its intensity. Matt suddenly had a horrible thought. Was she trying to read their lips? Impossible, he hoped. But... He turned back to the prince and lifted one hand up beside his mouth to shield it. I've learned that there are things in this world that defy logical explanation, Prince Najif. 
I've seen beauty and horrors beyond heaven and hell. And I've come to believe that with all myths and legends, there is a hard kernel of truth buried within their center. He shrugged. So my answer is, at this point I don't know for sure. But my mind is open, and the clues are exciting. But you suspect. The prince played with his food a little more, rubbing the flatbread between his fingers and letting its crumbs fall back to his plate. Matt shrugged. The wellspring was purported to be the last remnants of the flood water that the ark rested in. I suspect that there will be something there, but whether or not it has anything to do with extending life or health is another matter. However, some other group certainly believes there is something there, as we have been dogged by assassins along our journey. Matt leaned forward on his elbows. This group of people are eradicating clues as fast as we can find them, sometimes before we even get to them. I'd have to say they're a step ahead of us most of the time. The prince grunted. They won't trouble you here. His head turned briefly to Khaled. My nephew tells me there were strange things living in the bodies that you believe may play a part in extending life. Matt was glad that Rachel was sitting many seats away, as he guessed that Khaled had already shared all the information they had told him about the chemical analysis and their suspicions about the tiny organisms they had found in the body of the priest. We are not sure about the link, but we think they may have something to do with immortality. The prince sat back, smiling. I don't know if it was that. Best if we don't get ahead of ourselves. But I do. The prince chortled and turned to Khaled. And he wonders why there are some who would kill to hide this secret. Its value is beyond calculation. He reached out and placed a hand on Matt's forearm. My nephew will accompany you on your immortality quest. And for protection, you will also take some of my most trusted people with you. Khaled smiled. Ex-Special Forces Commandos. All former Airborne Brigade. Matt knew of them, the Saudi equivalent of SEALs. That's very kind of you, but... The prince held up a finger, and then leaned closer to Khaled for a rapid, whispered conversation. The younger man listened and then nodded. The prince turned back. Khaled will also organize some scientific specialists to support you. Anything you need. You will now have. Thanks, but... Matt held up a hand, desperate to regain control. He knew Rachel would go crazy if she thought the Saudi was overwhelming them. The prince knocked once on the table. Then it settled. Matt sighed and slumped back in his chair. All that was left was to try and explain it to Rachel. Fuck that. He'd leave it to Khaled. From then on, Prince Najif largely ignored him. Perhaps having got what he wanted, information, and placing more of his men on their mission, he was satisfied. Dinner marched on. A pianist performed perfect Bach pieces that were followed by a well-rounded belly dancer that elicited a lot of admiration from the men around the table. Matt watched intently for a while and then glanced at Rachel, who looked bored. He just shrugged and smiled, hopefully imparting a when-in-Rome sort of vibe, but her expression told him she was having none of it. By the end of the night, Khaled helped the prince to his feet, and then the huge bodyguard took over to guide the old man from the room. The other guests then also got to their feet and began to break into smaller groups. Khaled and Matt then rejoined Rachel and Eleanor. Khaled walked them toward the door. It's late, and I think we'd all benefit from some sleep. 
Shall I call on you tomorrow, say nine a.m.? We can plan our next steps. Matt looked at his wristwatch. It was just on eleven p.m. Works for me. I can get a few laps in before breakfast. Khaled gave them both a small bow. Thank you for being so understanding. The ways of the kingdom are still old-fashioned, and your patience is very much appreciated. He flashed his most dashing smile. Rachel sighed. Yeah, it's fine. Everyone was charming, in a men's club kind of way. Khaled nodded once, and then turned toward his long black car. The driver immediately jumped out and came around to open his door. Until tomorrow, he allowed the driver to close the door on him. Matt watched him go, and then felt something land on the forearm of his jacket and cling there. He jumped. Jesus! He looked down, ready to vigorously brush the offending thing off. But instead of some sharp-legged beetle, he saw a bony hand. Greta had soundlessly pushed Eleanor out from the shadows. Damned Arabs, she hissed in the direction of the disappearing limousine. Matt winced and quickly looked around, hoping that they weren't in earshot of any of the locals. The old woman wasn't finished. If it wasn't for their oil, we wouldn't give a shit if they all blew themselves up or not. Um... Did you have a good night, Mrs. Van Helling? Matt patted her hand and then carefully levered it from his arm. No, the person I was sat next to spoke English like a bad New York cab driver. Incomprehensible. She looked up at him, suspicion in her eyes. What did he say? The prince? Matt shrugged. He just asked a lot of questions. He was interested in finding out a little more about the source of the wellspring, and whether it was true or not. He shrugged. Things we just don't know yet. I'll goddamn bet he was interested. Once we've seen the map, we should just all leave. I don't trust him. Matt smiled, and held a hand up to their driver, who nodded and came around to open the door for them. Khaled's okay, though and we need his help. He shrugged. Besides, we trust him. You trust him, Rachel said. Eleanor grunted. About time you said something agreeable. She looked toward her car. Greta? The big woman immediately eased Eleanor down a ramp toward the waiting car. What a horrible old witch, Rachel whispered. Matt smiled. I don't know. I kind of got the feeling you two sort of clicked there for a moment. Not in a million years, Rachel replied with conviction. The driver was a large man, and quickly came around and bent beside the wheelchair, as if preparing to lift the old woman into the back seat. Greta placed a hand on his shoulder firmly and levered him back a step. She then eased Eleanor into the car. Greta followed, and before she closed the door, she looked back at Matt and Rachel. The woman's expression was cold and hard, and it made Matt feel a tingle of unease run up his spine. Jesus, that's one scary woman. And here I was thinking you two sort of clicked there. She nudged him. Come on, it's late, and I'm tired. They slid into the car, and it soundlessly drove them back to their accommodation. Upon entering the foyer, Rachel turned and pinned Matt to the wall with a hard kiss. Hey, I thought you were tired. She grinned, kneading him to hardness. Helps me sleep. He grinned in the dark. Always glad to help. He floated on his back in the shimmering, bath-warm pool. It was just gone 5 a.m., and there was still a chill in the morning air. The sky was still a fathomless black, but the dry atmosphere promised another hot and cloudless day. The stars had been chased away by the approaching sunrise, 
and like the old saying went, the night was always darkest before the dawn. He wondered what it must be like to live like this, day in and day out, having so much wealth that nothing was beyond reach or forbidden to you. He spat a stream of water into the air. Nothing was forbidden, except something that could never be bought, he mused. And that was life, or simply more of it. He had the feeling that both Eleanor van Helling and the prince both believed strongly in the mythical wellspring, and were prepared to use their wealth and influence to find it. He came upright in the water. And what then? Perhaps they would sip from some golden goblet and magically become younger. He'd seen a lot of strange things, but even that stretched his beliefs. He breaststroked for a while, and then turned on his back again in the oasis-style pool. This thing, if real, this pool, spring, or fountain, would be the best-kept secret on earth. You were either allowed to know, or you were killed. But who was allowed to know? And how did Clarence become part of the secret group? And then why did he leave? Matt let himself float as he stared up at the blackness. It made him think of the glass window they'd seen in Fort Severn. Could that have been what the starless dark referred to, some sort of pre-dawn image? He closed his eyes, and using just his hands, glided slowly through the warm water. Inside his eyelids there was the darkness, but cluttered now by his imagination. He tried to assemble all the stained glass windows' images in his mind's eye. The massive ark, the images of great cliffs or a mountain range, animals of many varieties, as well as thick forests with lush trees and ferns. Perhaps this was the depiction of the Garden of Eden. The darkness striped by the beams of light, the glory of God's radiance, he wondered. He felt the tingle of fear as he remembered the huge creature smashing in at them. It had been in the glass as well. It was one of the Nephilim, he was sure of it, a guardian. But guarding what or whom? He concentrated, trying to tease out the small details locked away in his memory. In the glass, the thing had been pointing at a group of figures kneeling before a pile of stones. He tried to focus but it all scrambled into confusion, and he let it melt away. Matt floated in the warm pool, and it began to seep into his imagination. He saw again the magnificent sapphire-blue pond, the beautiful naked woman, who smiled at him with a mixture of confidence, seductiveness, and something else. Recognition. It almost made sense. But as he tried to focus on it and draw out more meaning, it escaped him, like chasing a dollar bill down the street on a windy day. The moment you went to grab at it, another gust would lift it to dance away from your fingertips. His imagination wove in his memories. Some were of good times like swimming in warm nighttime surf, or lush lagoons with shimmering waterfalls he had visited on exotic holidays. Others were much darker, and were of haunted places that were full of shadows, with ink-black water below and no light above, and rocky caves of dripping moss and secret stealthy noises. Matt's eyes flicked open. That's it, where he had seen the image before, vast bodies of water that existed in the darkness of a lightless cave. Could it be? he whispered. Underground? His head collided with the side of the pool. Ouch! He came upright and then lifted himself from the pool. On the far horizon there was a blush of blue as dawn approached. Okay, Noah, is that what you were trying to tell us? Matt grabbed his towel from a pool chair, sat down on it, and rubbed his face. Rachel stepped out in a one-piece swimming costume, 
The thin material hugged her body in all the right places. She skipped lightly down the steps and headed to the pool. She hadn't seen him yet, and she started to do stretches. Morning, beautiful. She flinched. Jesus! She threw her towel at him. You nearly gave me a heart attack, Professor. I see. Party is over. Back to Professor, is it? She grinned. We're not dating. Not yet. He smiled up at her. Hey, heads up. A pair of large guards dressed in black, combat-style uniforms came around the corner. Both had huge German Shepherd dogs on leashes that had furious eyes and straining necks. Rachel quickly threw the towel around herself. They nodded to Matt and let their eyes linger on Rachel. Hey, Pooch! Matt reached out to scratch one of the enormous dogs on the head as it went past. La! Matt recognized the Arabic word for no too late. The dog spun and sunk its teeth into his hand. Fuck! The dog hung on, making a furious noise. The guard yelled a command, and the dog released Matt, but still stood with its neck craned and gun-barrel eyes on him. It wanted another taste by the look of it. Son of a— Matt gripped his wrist and looked down at the deep puncture wounds in his hand. The guard apologized profusely, and by his pallid complexion, Matt guessed he would probably lose his job for allowing one of the dogs to bite a guest of the prince. Ofar has never, ever done this before, he shook his head. I am so sorry. I will call a doctor. Matt flexed his fingers and then wrapped his towel around his hand. It's okay. I guess I scared him. And don't worry, it's already stopped bleeding. The pain was excruciating, but he smiled anyway. Just scratched me, really. Matt knew that wasn't true, as his hand throbbed mercilessly, and the towel began to redden even more. You can continue your rounds. No harm done, and no one needs to know. The man nodded, almost bowing, and dragged the dog away. Ofar looked back over his furred shoulder and licked his lips. Never work with animals and children. Haven't you ever heard that before? Rachel said, and came to kneel beside him and unwrap his hand to check it. Did you see the look that dog gave me? He wanted more fingers. He sighed, flexing his throbbing hand. Come on, let's get some iodine on that before you turn into a werewolf. She turned back to the compound. Matt followed her, feeling his hand tingle strangely beneath the towel. The sand shifted and then slid away from the figures as they gently surfaced. One after the other they rose up, until they numbered over one hundred strong. Their black clothing was set aside for desert fatigues, and beneath their skullcap, full-face helmets, the emblem of the crossed keys was seared onto their foreheads. Their clothing was nothing like standard military attire, in that it had other features designed for covert infiltration. Cooling lines ran throughout the framework like spider veins that protected the wearer from the savage heat of the desert, but also masked them from any thermal readers in the area. Above the cooling lines was a Kevlar mesh, that could withstand a direct hit from anything up to an assault rifle round and also survive close proximity fragmentation blasts. It was a combination suit of armor and cloak of invisibility for the modern warrior or assassin. Two men at the front made hand signals, and the group flattened, melding into the soft sand again. But this time they began to worm forward like slow, stroking swimmers through shallow water. It had taken them hours to reach the wall of Prince Najif's estate, but the pace meant none of them had registered on the motion sensors they knew were feeling for them. Their destination was close now, and their objective was clear. 
destroyed the seekers of the wellspring. Matt and Rachel stood out front, and at exactly 9 a.m., a limousine pulled up and Khaled stepped out. He had rolls of stiff paper under his arm, and he waited and watched as another man exited the car with a wooden case that he held out flat in front of himself. Just inside their module, Greta and Eleanor waited as Khaled bounded up the steps and grinned widely. A magnificent day, he waved a hand theatrically. You got it? Rachel asked. Of course. He shook Matt's hand and bowed to Rachel. I said I'd bring the missing piece of the tabula Poitingeriana, and we keep our word here. He led them into their building, bowed to Eleanor, and then headed to one of the large side drawing rooms. He clicked his fingers and pointed to a large central oak table. The man carrying the wooden case went to it and lay down his load, bowed to Khaled, and then left. Khaled immediately began spreading his rolled papers out flat. He pointed at one. Lake Chad. The first image was of the current size of the lake. Khaled flattened it with his hands. Not a friendly area. The lake borders Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, and, of course, Chad. It's shared by all, and it's still shrinking. He traced the outline with a finger. About 520 square miles, and averages five feet deep. He flipped another sheet over on top of the first. It was made of a clear material that showed a much larger lake overlaying the current one. Lake Chad about 5,000 years ago. It had a surface of about 100,000 square miles and an area greater than that of your Lake Superior. Its depth averaged 400 feet and dropped down to 600 in some areas. Whoa! Matt traced it with his fingers. They'd talked about it, but seeing it graphically represented was astounding. The early lake was enormous and he could just imagine the surrounding wetlands teeming with life, and nothing like the dry desert now circling the shrunken body of water. And now, Khaled flipped it again, we see what the lake looked like 35,000 years ago, and perhaps what it might have become during the biblical flood. Holy shit! Matt shook his head. The map showed an area that was nearly all water. Yes, impressive, isn't it? Satellite photographs reveal striations that show that Lake Chad covered an area of over 400,000 square miles. It would have taken a year to sail across, and it connected to the Niger River and the Atlantic. Rachel blew air slowly through her lips. If a flood did that, it would really have seemed to cover their entire world. Yes, and if it happened quickly, then if you were without a boat, you were as good as dead. You couldn't climb a tree, and even most mountains were covered. Khaled straightened. And Noah had boats. Matt traced the rim of the prehistoric lake. So big, so much coastline, and so many places he could have ended up. How long was he on board? Rachel asked. After the forty days of rain, according to Genesis 7.24, the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days, so he may have drifted anywhere. Khaled ran a hand over the prehistoric mega lake. He looked into Matt's eyes from under lowered brows. And that's why we need a place to start our search. Khaled's eyes twinkled. Well then, let's see what you've got. Matt nodded eagerly to the still-closed wooden box. Khaled slid the box closer and clipped open the seals. Give thanks to the prince. This is a rare honor that has been refused for too many people to count. 
He lifted the lid and Matt crowded closer. Resting inside, in a padded slot, was a scroll on wooden rollers. Khaled then reached into his pocket and pulled free a pair of cotton gloves, which he quickly pulled on. Once done, he carefully lifted the scroll free. One minute. Matt raced back to his room to retrieve his laptop computer, which he flipped open and carried back to the group. He called up the images of the map image embedded in the stained glass. When he returned, he saw that Khaled had spread a damask cloth on the table and had carefully unrolled the scroll. The intricate colors were faded, but the designs, contours, and markings were all still strong. Oh, wow! Matt carefully slid his laptop onto the edge of the table. The missing segment. He leaned over the map, tracing its ancient lines. It's magnificent. Eleanor had Greta wheel her closer, and she gripped the table with one bony hand. Her fingers caught the edge of the scroll. Please, no touching, Khaled said gently. Eleanor clicked her tongue in disdain. He's right, Matt straightened. Even our exhalations will be slightly acidic, so we need to be quick. Yes, yes. Eleanor's lip curled. So, what does it tell us? Her eyes drilled into Matt's. Let's see. Matt switched to his computer and slowly shrunk down the image of the map from the glass so its size corresponded to that of the tabula Poitingeriana. Then he stood back, his gaze going from one to the other. We're looking for a piece of coastline to match our stained glass map that looks a little like a fish hook and with a small island in the curl. Maybe like. He let his eyes run down the tabula Poitingeriana's coastal contours. Ha! Huh. Maybe this. Khaled leaned closer, his eyes going from one image to the other. Mukawar Island in Sudan. His lips lifted on one side. If this is it, then no wonder we couldn't find it. The starting point is the Red Sea. Matt nodded. We suspected the map we found in the glass from the old church ended in Chad, but miles from where the lake is at today. He turned and grinned at Khaled. But of course, it would have had to be somewhere that was inundated during the Great Flood. Matt pointed along the contours. To the north, the Tibesti Mountains are the highest mountains in the Sahara, and rise to over ten thousand feet. Also, they're volcanic and riddled with caves that many have been found to contain cave art from as far back as twelve thousand years ago, and was still being added to about five thousand years ago, the period we're interested in. Matt closed his eyes for a moment, trying to remember information about the area. The details slowly leaked back. Straight after the flood, the land would have been immensely fertile, but then climate change conspired to kill it for good. The mega flood was the last of the great waters. It got drier, and all the people left. They went north to the Middle East, forced to leave their lands and move to the Nile Valley or other areas with more water. They left everything behind? Rachel shook her head. Would they leave the ark? If it is the true ark, then maybe it was too big to move. Khaled took a picture of the ancient map. Professor, I'm sending you the images. Great. Matt looked up at Rachel. The ark was supposed to have been mainly made from reeds and gopher wood. I think even a few hundred years after the flood, the ship would have been decaying. They probably left it behind. Never, Eleanor said. Something that valuable and that holy, unconscionable, it would never have been left to rot. Or they hid it, Rachel said. 
It wouldn't matter. It was made of organic material, and they didn't have any preservation techniques back then. I'm afraid the Ark is long gone, Matt said. It matters not. The real question is, exactly what exists there now that could hold the secret to eternal life? There's no such thing as eternal life. Matt felt slightly sorry for her. Eleanor, sure, there could be something that seems to be extending life, but from what we understand, it might only be some sort of parasitic or symbiotic temporary side effect. We're not even sure if the, uh, infected people are in pain because of the affliction. Like my Clarence, you mean? She shot back. I don't know, Matt sighed and looked back at the map as his computer pinged. Got the pictures. Gonna line them up now. Saved, he thought, and leaned into his screen. Matt edged the image from the tabula Putingeriana up against the map from the stained glass. He made the stained glass image transparent, adjusted its size, and then slid it across on top of the old map. Bingo! Ladies and gentlemen, we have our starting point. He fist-pumped once, and then went back to his screen. Looks like it starts at the coast of the Red Sea at Mukawar Island, and the marked trail travels across what is today Sudan, enters Chad, and then ends... and then ends here. Rachel smiled lopsidedly. Somewhere in Chad's jungle, something was hidden. It's no jungle anymore. There's nothing there, Matt said. There is, or was. It was the Garden of Eden, of course. Khaled had one eyebrow raised. Five thousand years ago it was Akebulan, in the kingdom of Bornu. Matt grinned. The fountain of youth in the Garden of Eden, he grinned. Makes perfect sense to me. He straightened. So what now? That's obvious, Matthew. Eleanor's eyes blazed. We go there. Chapter 12 The first explosion shook the building and made dust rain down on their heads. The second made the lights go out. What? Khaled snatched up the maps, shook off the debris, and quickly rolled them up. Explosions were occurring all over the compound, and sporadic gunfire could be heard coming from the western side, the walled side that was closest to nothing but hundreds of miles of featureless desert. Impossible! Rachel dragged Matt to his feet. Beside them, Greta had flung herself over Eleanor making herself both a comforter and shield. Rachel saw Khaled quickly stuff the precious maps back in their box, and she grabbed at his arm. What the hell is going on? He didn't look up. An attack, assault rifles, grenades, and by the sound of it, larger ordnance, probably RPGs. No shit. Rachel literally growled at the Arab. I know what it is, but from who? Matt shook dust from his hair. Right now doesn't matter. Seems our fortified oasis has been breached. We need to leave. We head to the prince's residence. He has a bomb shelter. We can wait it out. Khaled pulled a phone from his pocket and turned away. He spoke quickly in Arabic. Matt turned to Rachel and she immediately knew what he was thinking. Yeah, I know, it might be the Borgia. Matt nodded. And if it is, they're here for us. We won't make it halfway there. Khaled grunted as he listened for another moment and then turned. We are under attack by an unknown force. There are a significant number of them, and they have exceptional firepower. The roads leading to the prince's compound have also been destroyed, cutting off any help outside from arriving soon. The prince's forces are engaging them now, and he has invited us to join him in his... No, 
Rachel said. We can't stay. Think about it. If these guys have the intel to attack this fortified compound and breach it so easily, evading your lookouts, thermal and motion sensor security defenses, then my gut tells me they know all about the prince's personal panic room. We go in. We're not coming out. Khaled just stared. She's right, Matt added. They cut the road so they'd have plenty of time alone with us. We seal ourselves up in a steel box, and we're right where they want us. Matt gripped the Saudi's upper arm. You need to get us out of here. Khaled shut his eyes for a second and then nodded. Yes, I see it now. He jammed the phone back to his ear and pointed to them. I'm calling in a helicopter. Grab what you can. Eleanor peered out from under Greta's arm. I'll just need to... Khaled rounded on her first, but spoke to Greta. You need to get moving or you'll both be staying. He raised thick eyebrows. I'm sure the prince will accommodate you. He looked to Matt and Rachel. Two minutes out front. He headed for the door, maps beneath his arm. Rachel pushed Matt, jolting him into action. Let's go, go, go! Just grab what's closest! She looked over her shoulder at Eleanor, and for just a moment she hoped the old woman had decided to stay behind. Unfortunately, Greta was already speeding back to their room, the wheels of Eleanor's chair flicking debris into the air. In a few minutes, Matt and Rachel met at the front door, small bags under their arms. Guess I'll come back for that Zegna suit later, Matt grinned nervously. Rachel looked at her wristwatch. If that chopper doesn't arrive soon, they can bury you in it. Thank you. Matt went to push through the doors, but Rachel grabbed his shoulder. Wait. She peered around a column and seeing no one, waved him on. Come on. As soon as they exited through the glass doors, the muffled sounds became frighteningly real. It was like a war zone, the yelling, flames, smoke, explosions, and rattling gunfire. Rachel saw the bodies strewn over the lawn, and she crouched and ran to some bushes. Matt was beside her immediately. She checked her watch again. He's late. Then we wait, Matt said. It's not like we have other options. Down and quiet. Rachel uselessly checked her hip. No gun, so we'll have to throw stones. Matthew? Eleanor's voice floated down from the front of the building. Oh, Jesus Christ. Matt lifted his head. Shush! He whispered harshly back to her. Leave her. Rachel shot back. Can't do that. He began to stand. Sure we can. Rachel grabbed him and dragged him back down. At least for now. Six of Prince Najif's bodyguards jogged across the lawn, speaking rapidly in Arabic into microphones looped over their ears and along their jawlines. Rachel had the urge to yell to them as one of them suddenly threw his head back as if he saw something interesting up in the air, just before he fell backwards like a felled tree. She had seen it before, the bullet to the face punching the head back on his neck. The other five guards raised their automatic weapons, and one dropped to his knee, as two of the strangest-looking beings Rachel had seen in her life sprinted forward, firing as they came. What the hell? she breathed as she watched the strange robot-like men take hit after hit in the chest and head, and whatever armor they wore protected them from most strikes. But not all. She saw plumes of blood spray out behind them, but determination kept them coming until they had emptied their own magazines into all the Saudi guards. Only then did both of the attackers seem to wind down to death kneeling and lowering their chins onto deep chests. What the fuck are those guys? Matt snarled, his eyes wide. I'm betting our fanatical friends from the church, Rachel whispered, laying a hand on his shoulder and pulling him back down. 
the night black helicopter came in low and fast, and before it even touched down, two men leapt free. Blackhawk, Rachel said, and stood. Good, armored, we'll need it. Khaled spotted them and pointed to the chopper. He then sprinted off in search of Eleanor. Finding them quickly, he and the other man ran to collect them. But before they got there, Greta had the small woman from her chair and was sprinting hard to the open door of the large, muscular helicopter. She yelled back over her shoulder to grab the chair as she went. In another few seconds they were all on board, and Khaled pulled a set of headphones on and ordered them to take off. Almost immediately, the dull thunk of bullet strikes peppered the undercarriage. Hang on! Khaled yelled. The helicopter banked hard to the east and then accelerated. Rachel looked down and saw a bright flare from the ground that was followed by a wobbling tail of fire. The pilot tilted the helicopter almost ninety degrees in the air. RPG, Khaled said. Rachel nodded, but had already known what it was. RPGs were fast and deadly, but dumb. The real threat came from something a little smarter, something like a guided surface-to-air missile. Khaled's roar jolted Rachel into clinging on even tighter and leaning forward with her head down. She saw Greta wrap her arms around Eleanor, hugging the small old woman to her large frame. The helicopter first accelerated, and then she heard small popping explosions from the rear of its undercarriage and looking back she saw the spray of hot stars trailing behind, just before they banked hard. Thank God, she thought. They had countermeasures to deploy. The pyrotechnic flares burned hotter than their engines, and were irresistible to most heat-seeking ordnance. And it ain't over yet. She looked down and back. Behind them, Prince Najif's estate was a cauldron of fire.